Welcome to Audiobook Pro, where we bring you a world of knowledge and inspiration right into your ears. Headphone Books Today we are pleased to present The Psychology of Peoples and Masses, a fascinating journey into the world of mass psychology and social interactions. Discover the secrets of group dynamics, behavior, and influence on society. Don't miss this unique opportunity to deepen your knowledge and understand what shapes our thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes toward others. Subscribe to Audiobook Pro now to discover this and other fascinating works. Globe showing Europe Africa light bulb let knowledge become your best friend and companion in life. Enjoy your listening. Leb and G. Psychology of Peoples and Masses. Introduction. Modern Ideas of Equality and the Psychological Foundations of History. The Origin and Development of the Idea of Equality. The consequences produced by it. What its application has already cost. Its present influence upon the masses. Tasks outlined in the present work. A study of the main factors in the general evolution of peoples. Does this evolution arise out of institutions? Do not the elements of every civilization institutions, arts, beliefs, etc. the well-known psychological foundations peculiar to each people in isolation? The significance of chance in history and unchangeable laws. The difficulty of changing hereditary ideas in a given subject. The ideas which rule the institutions of peoples undergo a very long evolution. Being formed very slowly, they disappear very slowly at the same time. Having become for enlightened minds obvious delusions, they remain for a very long time unquestionable truths for the crowd and continue to have their effect on the dark masses of the people. If it is difficult to inculcate a new idea, it is no less difficult to destroy an old one. Mankind constantly clings in desperation to dead ideas and dead gods. It has been nearly a century and a half since poets and philosophers, extremely ignorant of the primitive history of man, the diversity of his mental structure and the laws of heredity, threw into the world the idea of the equality of men and races. Very seductive to the masses, this idea soon became firmly entrenched in their souls and was not slow to bear fruit. It shook the foundations of old societies, produced one of the worst revolutions, and threw the Western world into a series of violent convulsions, to which no end can be foreseen. No doubt some of the inequalities separating individuals and races were too obvious to be seriously challenged, but people were easily pacified by the idea that these inequalities were merely the effect of differences in education, that all men were born equally intelligent and good, and that institutions alone could corrupt them. The solution was very simple, to reorganize the institutions and give everybody an equal upbringing. Thus institutions and enlightenment became the great panaceas of modern democracies, the means to correct inequalities offensive to the great principles that are the only deities of modernity. The latest advances in science, however, have made clear all the sterility of egalitarian theories and prove that the mental abyss created by the past between men and races can only be filled by very slow hereditary accumulations. Modern psychology, together with the harsh lessons of experience, has shown that education and institutions adapted to known individuals and to known peoples can be very harmful to others. But it is not in the power of philosophers to remove from circulation the ideas they let into the world when they are convinced of their falsity. Like a river out of its banks, which no dam can hold, the idea continues its devastating, majestic and terrible stream. And look at the invincible power of the idea. There is not a single psychologist, not a single enlightened man of state, and especially not a single traveler, who does not know how false the chimerical notion of the equality of men which has turned the world upside down, has caused a gigantic revolution in Europe, and has thrown America into a bloody war for the separation of the southern states from the North American Union. No one has the moral authority to ignore how our institutions and education are ruining the lower peoples, and for all that there is not a single man at least in France at least not a single woman who has ever been a man. The application of the system derived from our ideas of equality is ruining the metropolis and gradually bringing all our colonies into a state of deplorable decay.
but the principles from which the system originates have not yet been shaken. Far from being in decline, however, the idea of equality continues to grow. In the name of this equality, socialism, which will soon enslave the majority of the peoples of the West, is soliciting for their happiness. In its name the modern woman demands for herself the same rights and the same upbringing as the man. Of the political and social upheavals produced by these principles of equality, and of those far more important ones which they are destined to produce, the masses do not care at all, and the political life of statesmen is too short for them to be more concerned about it. However, the supreme ruler of modernity is public opinion, and it would be impossible not to follow it. There is no truer measure of the social importance of an idea than the power it exerts over the mind. The degree of truth or falsity it contains may be of interest only from a philosophical point of view. What a true or false idea has passed into the feeling of the masses, all the consequences arising from it must gradually manifest themselves. So, through education and institutions we must begin to realize the modern dream of equality. With them we try, by correcting the unjust laws of nature, to mold into one form the brains of Negroes from Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Senegal, the brains of Arabs from Algeria, and finally the brains of Asians. Of course, this is a completely unfeasible chimera, but hasn't the constant pursuit of chimeras been the main occupation of mankind up to now? Modern man cannot evade the law to which his ancestors were subjected. I have elsewhere shown the deplorable results produced by European education and institutions on inferior peoples. Likewise, I have set forth the results of the modern education of women, and do not intend here to return to the old. The questions which we are to study in the present work will be of a more general nature. Leaving aside details, or touching them only insofar as they will be necessary to prove the principles outlined, I will examine the education and mental structure of historical races, that is, artificial races formed in historical times by accidents of conquest, immigration, and political change, and will try to prove that from this mental structure derives their history. I will ascertain the degree of durability and variability of the characters of races, and will also try to find out whether individuals and peoples are moving toward equality or, on the contrary, seek to differ as much as possible from one another. Having proved that the elements out of which civilization is formed, arts, institutions, beliefs, are the direct products of the racial soul, and therefore cannot pass from one people to another, I will determine the irresistible forces by the action of which civilizations begin to fade and then fade away. These are the questions I have had to discuss more than once in my writings on the civilizations of the East. This little volume should be looked at only as a brief synthesis of them. The most striking impression I have gained from my long travels in various countries is that every people has a mental structure as stable as its anatomical features, from which its feelings, its thoughts, its institutions, its beliefs, and its arts derive. Tocqueville and other famous thinkers thought to find in the institutions of the Nards the cause of their development. I am convinced otherwise, and hope to prove, taking examples from the very countries Tocqueville studied, that institutions have very little influence on the development of civilizations. They are most often consequences, but very rarely causes. There is no doubt that the history of nations is determined by very different factors. It is full of peculiar events, accidents that have been, but may or may not have been. But beside these accidents, these incidental circumstances, there are great unchangeable laws governing the general course of every civilization. These immutable, most general and most basic laws derive from the mental structure of races. A people's life, its institutions, its beliefs and its arts are only the visible products of its invisible soul. In order for any people to transform its institutions, its beliefs, and its arts, it must first remake its soul, in order that it may transmit its civilization to another, it must be able to transmit to them also its soul. No doubt this is not what history tells us, but we can easily prove that by recording contrary statements, it deceives itself with empty appearances. I once had to expound before a great congress some of the ideas developed in this work. The assembly was composed of all kinds of eminent men, ministers, 
governors of the colonies, admirals, professors, scientists, belonging to the color of different nations. I had expected to find in such an assembly a certain unanimity of opinion on the principal questions. But there was none at all. The opinions expressed turned out to be completely independent of the degree of culture of those who expressed them. The opinions conveyed were chiefly those that constituted the hereditary sentiments of the various races to which the members of said Congress belonged. It has never been so clear to me that people of every race possess, in spite of their different social positions, an indestructible stock of ideas, traditions, feelings, ways of thinking, constituting an unconscious inheritance from their ancestors, against which all arguments are utterly powerless. In reality, people's thought is not transformed by the influence of reason. Ideas begin to have their effect only when, after very slow processing, they have been transformed into feelings and have penetrated, therefore, into the dark area of the unconscious, where our thoughts are produced. For the indoctrination of ideas books have no more power than words. Likewise, it is not for the purpose of persuasion, but more often for the purpose of amusement, that philosophers spend their time writing. As soon as one leaves the usual circle of ideas of the environment in which he has to live, he must give up all influence in advance and be content with a narrow circle of readers who have independently arrived at ideas similar to those he defends. Only convinced apostles alone have the power to make themselves listen, to swim against the current, to change the ideal of a whole generation, but this is most often due to the narrowness of their thought and a certain dose of fanaticism, for which they cannot be envied. However, it is not by writing books that they give triumph to a belief. They are long asleep in the ground, before the literati, busy with fabricating legends about them, make them speak. First Section Psychological Properties of Races Chapter 1 The Soul of the Races How Naturalists Classify Species The Application to Man of Their Methods The Weakness of Modern Classifications of Human Races The Foundations of Psychological Classification Average Types of Races To What Extent Observation Allows Them to Be Established Psychological Factors Determining the Average Type of Race The Influence of Ancestors and Immediate Parents The Common Psychological Patrimony Possessed by All Individuals of a Known Race The Enormous Influence of Deceased Generations on Modern Ones The Mathematical Basis of This Influence How the Collective Soul Extends from Family to Village, City, Province the advantages and dangers arising from the formation of the city as a separate whole. Circumstances under which the formation of a collective soul is impossible. The example of Italy. How natural races have given way to historical races. Naturalists base their classification of species on the presence of known anatomical features reproduced by heredity with regularity and constancy. We now know that these features change by hereditary accumulation of imperceptible changes, but if we consider only a brief period of historical time, we can say that species are unchanging. When applied to man, the naturalist's methods of classification have made it possible to establish a certain number of quite distinct types. On the basis of purely anatomical signs, such as skin color, shape, and capacity of the skull, it has been possible to establish that the human species consists of many completely different species and probably of very different origins. To scholars with reverence for mythological traditions, these species are nothing more than races. But, as someone has soundly said, if the Negro and the Caucasian were snails, all zoologists would unanimously assert that they constitute different species, which could never have descended from the same pair, from which they gradually drifted apart. These anatomical features, at least those of relevance to our analysis, admit of only general, very crude, subdivisions. Their distinctions appear only in human species that are quite different from one another, such as whites, blacks, and yellows but peoples very similar in appearance may differ greatly in their ways of feeling and acting, and consequently in their civilizations, their beliefs, and their arts. 
Is it possible to combine a Spaniard, an Englishman, and an Arab into one group? Are not the mental differences between them conspicuous and read on every page of their history? For lack of anatomical features, one wanted to rely on various elements, such as languages, beliefs, and political institutions, to classify known peoples, but such classifications do not stand up to serious criticism. On occasion, we shall show that many peoples have succeeded in assimilating by transforming foreign languages, beliefs, and institutions to such an extent that they can be reconciled with their mental disposition. The basis for classification, which anatomy, languages, environments, and political groupings cannot provide, are given to us by psychology. The latter shows that behind the institutions, the arts, the beliefs, the political upheavals of each people there are certain moral and intellectual peculiarities from which their evolution flows. These features together form what may be called the soul of the race. Every race has as stable a mental organization as its anatomical organization. That the former is dependent on the structure of the brain is hard to doubt. But since science has not yet advanced enough to show us the details of its mechanism, we cannot take it as the basis. However, a close acquaintance with it can in no way change the description of the mental organization which derives from it and which observation reveals to us. The moral and intellectual characteristics, the totality of which expresses the soul of a people, constitute the synthesis of its entire past, the inheritance of all its ancestors, and the motivation for its behavior. In individual individuals of the same race they seem to be as variable as facial features, but observation shows that most individuals of that race always possess a certain number of common psychological traits as enduring as the anatomical traits by which species are classified. Like these latter, the psychological features are reproduced by heredity with regularity and constancy. This aggregate of common psychological traits constitutes what is justifiably called national character. Their aggregate forms the average type that makes it possible to define a nation. A thousand Frenchmen, a thousand Englishmen, a thousand Chinese, taken at random, of course, must differ from one another, but they possess, by virtue of the heredity of their race, common characteristics on the basis of which one can reconstruct the ideal type of a Frenchman, an Englishman, a Chinese, similar to the ideal type as the naturalist imagines when he describes a dog or a horse in general terms. When applied to the various varieties of dog or horse, such a description can only contain traits common to all, but by no means those by which it is possible to distinguish their numerous breeds. If only a race is ancient enough, and therefore homogeneous enough, then its average type is sufficiently clearly defined to quickly establish itself in the mind of the observer. When we visit a foreign nation, only the features that strike us can be recognized as common to all the inhabitants of the country we are touring, because these alone are constantly repeated. Individual differences are seldom repeated, and therefore elude us, and soon we are not only able to distinguish at a glance an Englishman, an Italian, a Spaniard, but we begin to notice in them certain moral and intellectual features which constitute precisely those basic traits of which we spoke above. The Englishman, the Gascon, the Norman, the Flemish correspond in our minds to quite a certain type, which we can easily describe. When applied to an individual the description may be very inadequate, and sometimes incorrect, but when applied to the majority of individuals of a known race it gives the most faithful representation. The unconscious brainwork by which the physical and mental types of any people are determined is quite identical in essence with the method which enables the naturalist to classify species. This identity of the mental organization of most individuals of a known race has very simple physiological grounds. Each individual is in fact the product not only of his immediate parents, but also of his race, i.e., of his entire lineage of ancestors. The scholar-economist Chison calculated that in France, if we count three generations per century, each of us has in our veins the blood of at least 20 million contemporaries of any given millennium. All the inhabitants of the same locality, of the same province, by necessity have common ancestors, are made of the same clay, bear the same imprint, and are constantly brought back to the middle type by that long and heavy chain, of which they are only the last links. 
we are simultaneously children of our parents and of our race. Not only feeling, but also physiology and heredity make our fatherland a second mother. If we translate into mechanistic terms the influences to which an individual is subjected and which guide his behavior, we can say that they are of three kinds. The first, and probably the most important, is the influence of ancestors, the second is the influence of immediate parents, the third, which is commonly thought to be the most powerful and yet the weakest, is the influence of the environment. This last, if by it we mean the various physical and moral influences to which a person is exposed during his lifetime and, of course, during his upbringing, produces only very slight changes. Environmental influences begin to have a real effect only when heredity has accumulated them in the same direction for a very long time. No matter what a man does, he is always and above all a member of his own race. That stock of ideas and feelings, which all individuals of the same race bring to the world at birth, forms the soul of the race. Invisible in its essence, this soul is very visible in its manifestations, for in reality it governs the entire evolution of a people. You can compare a race to the combination of cells that form a living being. These billions of cells have a very short existence whereas the existence of the being formed by their union is relatively very long, the cells consequently have at the same time a personal life and a collective life, the life of the being for which they serve as substance. Similarly, each individual of a race has a very short individual life and a very long collective life. This latter is the life of the race in which he was born, to whose continuation he contributes and on which he is always dependent. The race must therefore be regarded as a permanent being, not subject to the action of time. This permanent being consists not only of the living individuals who form it at the moment, but also of the long line of the dead who were their ancestors. To understand the true meaning of the race, one must continue it simultaneously into the past and into the future. They rule the immeasurable realm of the unconscious, that invisible realm which holds under its sway all manifestations of mind and character. The destiny of a people is guided to a far greater extent by the generations that have died than by those that are alive. They alone lay the foundation of the race. Century after century, they have created ideas and feelings, and, consequently, all the motives of our behavior. Deceased generations do not only pass on to us their physical organization, they also inspire us with their thoughts. The dead are the only undeniable masters of the living. We bear the weight of their mistakes, we are rewarded for their virtues. The formation of the mental constitution of a people does not require, like the creation of animal species, those geological periods, the vast duration of which is beyond our computation. It does, however, require quite a long time. In order to create in such a people as ours, and still in a rather weak degree, that community of feelings, which forms its soul, it was necessary more than ten centuries. This period, very long for our chronicles, is actually quite short. If such a relatively limited interval of time is sufficient to consolidate the known features, it is due to the fact that acting during a known time in one direction some cause quickly produces very large results. Mathematicians have proved to us that when this cause continues to produce the same consequence, the causes grow in arithmetic progression, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the consequences grow in geometric progression, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Causes are logarithms of consequences. In the well-known problem of doubling bread grains on a chessboard, the corresponding number of a chess cell is the logarithm of the number of bread grains. Similarly, for capital given at compound interest, the law of increase is that the number of years is the logarithm of the increased capital. These considerations explain the fact that most social phenomena can be expressed by rapidly increasing geometric curves. In another paper I had to prove that they can be expressed analytically by a parabola or hyperbola equation. Perhaps the most important work of the French Revolution was that it hastened this formation by the almost complete destruction of the minor nationalities, Picardians, Flemings, Burgundians, Gasconians, Bretons, Provencalians, etc., among which France was once divided. 
It is necessary, however, that the unification should be complete, and precisely because the French are composed of two different races, and have, therefore, two different ideas and feelings, they become victims of strife such as the more homogeneous peoples, such as the English, do not know. In these latter, the Anglo-Saxon, the Norman, the ancient Bretonian, in the end merge to form a very homogeneous type, so their mode of action is also the same. Thanks to this fusion, they eventually firmly acquired for themselves the following three main bases of the popular soul, common feelings, common interests, common beliefs. When a nation has achieved this unification, an instinctive agreement of all its members on all major issues is established, and serious disagreements can no longer arise in its depths. This community of feelings, ideas, beliefs, and interests, created by slow hereditary accumulations, gives to the mental constitution of the people great similarity and great durability, providing it at the same time with tremendous strength. It created the greatness of Rome in antiquity, the supremacy of the English in our day, from the time it disappears, nations disintegrate. Rome's role ended when it no longer possessed it. There has always existed, to a greater or lesser degree, in all peoples and in all ages, this intermingling of hereditary feelings, ideas, traditions and beliefs which forms the soul of some community of men, but its progressive expansion has been extremely slow. Limited in the beginning by the limits of the family and gradually spreading to the village, city and province, the collective soul embraced all the inhabitants of the country only in comparatively recent times. Only then did the concept of fatherland as we understand it today arise. It only became possible when the national soul was formed. The Greeks never rose above the concept of a city, and their cities were always at war with one another, because they were always very alien to one another. India for two thousand years knew no other form of unity than the village, and that is why for two thousand years it has always lived under the rule of foreign rulers, whose ephemeral monarchies were as easily destroyed as they were created. The very weak, in terms of military power, notion of the city as an exclusive fatherland was, on the contrary, always very strong in relation to the development of civilization. Less expansive than the soul of the fatherland, the soul of the city was sometimes more prolific. Athens in antiquity, Florence and Venice in the Middle Ages show us what degree of civilization small clusters of people can achieve. When small cities or small provinces live independent lives for a long time, they eventually acquire such a stable soul that its fusion with the souls of neighboring cities and provinces, striving to form a national soul, becomes impossible. Such a fusion, even when it can take place, that is, when the contiguous elements are not too dissimilar, is never the work of one day, but only the work of centuries. It takes Richelieu or Bismarck to complete such a thing but even such people complete it only when it has already been long in preparation. Of course, a country like Italy can, due to exceptional circumstances, immediately form a unified state, but it would be a mistake to believe that it immediately acquires a national soul at the same time. I see well in Italy the Piedmontese, the Sicilians, the Venetians, the Romans, etc., but I do not yet see Italians there. Whatever may be the race now under consideration, whether it be homogeneous or not, by the mere fact that it is civilized and has long since entered history, it must always be regarded as an artificial race, but not as a natural one. Natural races at the present time are to be found only in savages. Only in them can one observe peoples pure of all underbreeding. Most of the civilized races at present are only historical races. We do not intend now to deal with the origin of these races. Whether they were formed by nature or by history is not important. We are only interested in their characteristics, which a long past has developed in them. Preserved over the centuries by the same conditions of existence and accumulated by heredity, these peculiarities have finally acquired great stability and have determined the type of each people. Chapter 2 the limits of the variability of the character of races. The variability of the character of races, but not its constancy, constitutes the apparent rule. The grounds of this seeming. 
the immutability of the principal traits and the variability of the minor ones. Assimilation of psychological traits with unchangeable traits and changeable traits of animal species. Environment, circumstances, upbringing act on incidental psychological traits. Hidden possibilities of character. Examples presented by different eras. Men of terror. What they would have become in other eras. How, despite revolutions, national characters remain unchanged. Different examples. Conclusion. Only by a careful study of the development of civilizations can the constancy of the mental stock of races be ascertained. At first sight the general rule seems to be its variability rather than constancy. The history of nations may indeed sometimes suggest that their souls at times undergo very rapid and considerable changes. Do you not think, for example, that there is a considerable difference between the character of the Englishman at the time of Cromwell and that of the modern Englishman? Is not the modern Italian, for you, cautious and cunning, quite different from the impetuous and fierce man as Benvenuto Cellini describes him to us in his memoirs? Without going that far, let us confine ourselves to the borders of France. How many visible changes in the character of the French have taken place in a tiny number of centuries, sometimes even years? What historian has not noted differences in character between the 17th and 18th centuries? And nowadays, does it not seem to you that there is a gulf between the characters of the unyielding members of the convention and the obedient slaves of Napoleon? Yet they were the same people, and in a few years they seemed to have changed completely. In order to explain the reasons for these changes, we must first of all recall that the psychological species, like the anatomical species, consists of a very small number of major unchanging features, around which are grouped variable and impermanent secondary features. The cattleman who changes the visible structure of an animal, the gardener who modifies the appearance of a plant to such an extent that the untrained eye can hardly recognize it, have not touched the main features of the species at all, they have only acted on its secondary traits. In spite of all the efforts of art, the basic features always tend to come out in every new generation. And the mental organization has basic features, as immutable as the anatomical features of species, but it also has easily changeable secondary features, these latter can be easily changed by environment, circumstances, upbringing, and various factors. We should also remember, and this is the most important thing, that in our mental organization we have all sorts of character traits, which circumstances do not always give us a chance to discover. When they are used by chance, a more or less ephemeral new personality is formed. This explains why at the time of great religious and political crises one observes such instantaneous perturbations in character that everything seems to have changed, manners, ideas, behavior, etc. Indeed, everything is changed, like the surface of a calm lake being stirred by a storm, but very rarely is it for long. Because of these character assignments, which are set in motion by known exceptional events, the figures of great religious and political crises seem to us to be superior beings in comparison to us, a kind of colossus, in relation to whom we are like pitiful bastards. However, they were people like us, whose circumstances set in motion the character traits that everyone possesses. Take, for example, those giants of the convention who looked defiantly at an armed Europe and sent their opponents to the guillotine for a simple contradiction. They were essentially as respectable and peaceful citizens as we are, who in ordinary times would probably have led a very quiet and colorless existence within the walls of their offices. Exceptional events set in motion certain cells in their brains, left and used in their ordinary state, and they became those colossal figures whom posterity is no longer able to understand. A hundred years later Robespierre would have been, no doubt, an honest magistrate, very friendly with his priest. Fouquetainville a judicial investigator, possessing, perhaps, a little more severity than his colleagues in the arrogant treatment of men of his profession, but who would probably have been very highly regarded for his zeal in pursuing criminals, St. Just would have been an excellent schoolteacher, respected by his superiors and very proud of the academic palm branches he probably would have received. However, in order not to doubt the validity of our foresight, 
it is enough to look at what Napoleon made of the ferocious terrorists who had not yet had time to cut each other's heads off. Most of them have become desk officers, teachers, judges, or prefects. The waves raised by the storm of which we spoke above have calmed down, and the agitated lake has taken on its calm appearance again. Even in the most confused epochs, producing the strangest changes in personalities, it is easy to find under the new forms the basic features of race. Was the centralist, autocratic and despotic regime of the stern Jacobins really very different from the centralist, autocratic and despotic regime that fifteen centuries of monarchy had deeply ingrained in the souls of the French? After all the revolutions of the Latin peoples there always appears this harsh regime, this incurable need to be governed, because it represents a kind of synthesis of the instincts of their race. It was not through the halo of his victories alone that Bonaparte became ruler. When he transformed the republic into a dictatorship, the hereditary instincts of the race were revealed with greater and greater intensity every day, and for lack of an artillery officer, some adventurer would suffice. Fifty years later, it was enough for the heir to his name to appear to rally the voices of a whole people jaded by liberty and hungry for slavery. It was not the Brumaire that made Napoleon, but the soul of the people who almost willingly walked under his iron heel. At the first wave, writes Taine, the French are thrown into obedience and remain in it as in their natural position, the lower ones, the peasants and soldiers, with animal loyalty, the higher ones, the dignitaries and officials, with Byzantine servility. There was no opposition from the Republicans, on the contrary, it was among them that he found his best instruments of government, senators, deputies, members of the state council, judges, all kinds of administrators. Immediately, under the preaching of liberty and equality, he discerned their autocratic instincts, their thirst to command, to oppress, even if in a subordinate manner, and, above all, their appetites for money and pleasure. The difference between a delegate to the Committee for Public Salvation and some minister, prefect or superfect of the empire is negligible, it is the same person, but in different suits, first in a toga of a revolutionary, and then in the viscount's uniform of an official. If the influence of the environment on a person seems to be great, it is mainly because it acts on the collateral and temporary features or on the still hidden sets of character, of which we had to speak above. In reality the changes are not very profound. The most peaceful man under the influence of hunger can reach a degree of exasperation which leads him to all kinds of crimes, and sometimes even to devouring his neighbors. Can it be said on this basis that his ordinary character has changed definitively? From the fact that the conditions of civilization lead some to excessive luxuries and to all the vices which constitute their inevitable consequence, and in others create very great needs without giving them the means of satisfying them, general discontent and restlessness may follow, which will act upon conduct and cause all kinds of coups, but in these discontents, in these coups will always manifest the essential features of race. The English of the United States once contributed to their strife, during the Indonesian War, the same perseverance, the same indomitable energy, which they now put into the founding of cities, universities, and factories. The character has not changed. Only the subjects to which it was attached have changed. Examining one by one the various factors capable of acting on the mental constitution of peoples, we can always ascertain that they act on the incidental and impermanent aspects of character, but do not at all affect its basic features, or affect them only by very slow hereditary accumulation. It cannot be concluded from the preceding that the psychological features of races are not subject to change at all, but only that, like the anatomical features, they have a very great stability. Because of this stability the soul of races changes so slowly over the centuries. Chapter 3. Psychological Hierarchy of Races The psychological classification is based, like the anatomical classification, on the statement of a small number of invariable and essential features. The Psychological Classification of Human Races Primitive Races Inferior Races Middle Races Higher Races psychological elements whose grouping permits this classification. 
elements of the greatest importance. Character. Morality. Mental qualities may be changed by education. Character qualities are constant and constitute an immutable element of every people. Their role in history. Why different races cannot understand and influence each other. The reasons for the impossibility of forcing an inferior people to adopt a higher civilization. When in the field of natural science one has to establish the grounds for classifying species, the work is made easier by the fact that the immutable and therefore basic attributes by which each species is defined are very few. It always takes a few lines to list them. This is because, in reality, the naturalist deals only with unchangeable characteristics, without paying any attention to temporary ones. However, these basic attributes inevitably entail a number of others. It is the same with the psychological traits of races. If we go into details, there are innumerable and subtle differences between one people and another, between one individual and another, but if we pay attention only to the basic characteristics, we will have to admit that for each people they are few. Only by examples, we shall shortly present very typical ones, can the influence of this small number of basic traits on the life of peoples be clearly shown. The foundations of the psychological classification of races can be set forth only after a detailed study of the psychology of various peoples. This is a work that would require volumes, we shall confine ourselves to sketching their psychology in large strokes. Considering only the main psychological features of human races, we can divide them into the following four groups, primitive races, inferior, middle, and superior. The primitive races are those in which not the slightest trace of culture is found, and which have stopped at the epoch of primitive animalism as our ancestors experienced in the Stone Age, such are today's Fijians and Australians. Besides the primitive races there are still inferior races, of which the Negroes are the chief representatives. They are capable of the rudiments of civilization, but only the rudiments. Never have they been able to rise above absolutely barbaric forms of civilization, though the occasion has made them, for example, the Negroes of San Domingo, heirs of higher civilizations. To the middle races we include the Chinese, the Japanese, the Mongols, and the Semitic peoples. Through the Assyrians, Mongols, Chinese, and Arabs, they created high types of civilizations that could be surpassed by the European peoples alone. Among the higher races only the Indo-European peoples could occupy a place. Both in antiquity, in the age of the Greeks and Romans, and at the present time, they alone have proved capable of great discoveries in art, science, and industry. Only to them do we owe the high level that civilization has now reached. Steam and electricity came out of their hands. The least developed of these higher races, such as the Hindus, have risen in art, literature, and philosophy to a level which the Mongols, Chinese, and Semites could never attain. No fusion is possible between the four great groups we have just enumerated, the mental gulf separating them is obvious. The difficulty begins only when one wants to subdivide these groups. The Englishman, the Spaniard, and the Russian belong to the group of higher peoples, but we know very well that there are very great differences between them. In order to determine these differences, it is necessary to take each nation individually and describe its character. This we shall soon do for two of them, in order to give application to our method and to show the importance of its results. For the present we shall sketch only in the most general terms the nature of the chief psychological elements by which the races may be distinguished. Among the primitive and inferior races, there is no need to look for them among the true savages, as the lowest strata of European societies are like primitive creatures, we can always observe a greater or lesser inability to reason, that is, to associate ideas in the brain in order to compare them and notice their similarities and differences ideas caused by past sensations, or words serving as their signs, with the ideas produced by present sensations. From this inability to reason springs great credulity and a total lack of critical thought. In higher beings, on the contrary, the ability to associate ideas and make inferences from them is very great, critical thought and the ability to think precisely is highly developed. 
in people of the inferior races one can still state a very weak degree of attention and consideration, a very large imitative mind, a habit of drawing general inaccurate conclusions from particular cases, a weak ability to observe and derive useful results from their observations, an extreme changeability of character, and a very great inconsiderateness. The instinct of the moment is their only guide. Like Esau a type of primitive man they would gladly sell their future birthright for real lentil stew. When man is able to contrast the immediate with the future, to set himself a goal and pursue it with persistence, he has already made great progress. This inability to foresee the remote consequences of one's actions and the tendency to have no guide other than momentary impulses condemns the individual, just as it condemns the race, to remain constantly in a very low state. Only as peoples learn to master their instincts, that is, as they acquire the will, and hence the power over themselves, do they begin to understand the importance of order, the necessity of sacrificing oneself to an ideal, and of elevating oneself to civilization. If one were to measure by one yardstick the social level of peoples in history, I would willingly take as a scale the degree of ability to master one's instincts. The Romans in antiquity and the Anglo-Americans of the present day are peoples who possess this quality to the highest degree. It has contributed greatly to the preservation of their greatness. By the general grouping and relative development of the various psychological elements, types of mental organization are formed, by which a classification of individuals and races can be established. Of these psychological elements, some relate to character, others to mind. The higher races differ from the lower races in both character and mind, but the higher peoples differ among themselves chiefly in character. Since this point is of great social importance, it should be stated clearly. Character is formed by the combination in various proportions of the various elements which psychologists now designate by the name of the senses. Of those that play the most important role, we should mainly note, perseverance, energy, the ability to control oneself, abilities arising from the will. Morality is one of the essential elements of character, although it is a synthesis of fairly complex feelings. We take the latter word in the sense of an inherited respect for the rules upon which the existence of society rests. To have morals for the people means to have certain firm rules of conduct and not to deviate from them. As the morality seems to be very changeable, and indeed it is, but for a given nation, for a given time morality should be quite immutable. Daughter of character, but by no means of mind, it can be considered firmly established only when it has become hereditary and, therefore, unconscious. In general it may be said that the greatness of nations depends chiefly on the level of their morals. Mental qualities can be easily changed by education, qualities of character almost completely escape its action. If education acts on them, then it happens only in indifferent natures, having almost no will and, therefore, easily inclined in the direction in which they are pushed. These indifferent natures are found in individuals, but very rarely in an entire nation, and if they can be found in it, then only in moments of extreme decadence. Revelations of mind are easily transmitted from one people to another. Character qualities cannot be transmitted. These are the unchangeable basic elements that make it possible to distinguish the mental constitution of the higher peoples. The discoveries owed to the mind constitute the common property of mankind, the advantages or disadvantages of character constitute the exclusive property of each people. It is an unchanging cliff, into which the wave must beat day after day for centuries, to sharpen only its contours, it corresponds to the specific attribute of a species, the fin of a fish the beak of a bird, the tooth of a carnivore. The character of a people, but not its intelligence, determines its development in history. The influence of character can always be found in the apparent vagaries of a perfectly powerless chance and a very powerful fate, which, according to various doctrines, directs the actions of men. The influence of character is the most powerful factor in the life of peoples, while the influence of the mind is in fact very weak. The Romans of the times of decline had a more refined mind than that of their coarse ancestors, but they had lost the former qualities of their character, perseverance, energy, unconquerable tenacity, 
the ability to sacrifice for an ideal, an unbreakable respect for the laws which created the greatness of their ancestors. It is through character alone that the 60,000 Englishmen hold under their rule 250 million Hindus, of whom many are at least equal to them in intelligence, and some immeasurably superior to them in aesthetic taste and depth of philosophical insight. It is on character alone that they stand at the head of the greatest colonial empire history has ever known. Societies, religions, and empires are based on character, but not on intelligence. Character will enable nations to feel and act. They have never benefited much from wanting to reason too much and to think too much. The extreme weakness of the work of professional psychologists and their negligible practical interest depend chiefly on the fact that they devote themselves exclusively to the study of the mind and leave almost entirely aside the study of character. I know of only one Ribod, who in a few pages, unfortunately too brief, has shown the importance of character and recognized that it forms the true foundation of mental development. The mind, writes the learned professor of the College de France quite thoroughly, is only a collateral form of mental evolution. Its basic type is character. The mind, when overdeveloped, rather leads to its destruction. I will try here to prove that if one wishes to become acquainted with the comparative psychology of peoples, one must first begin with the study of character. The fact that such an important science, since history and politics are derived from it, has never been the subject of study would remain quite incomprehensible if we did not know that such a science is not acquired in laboratories or in books, but only by long journeys. Nothing, however, gives us any reason to predict that professional psychologists will soon embark on it. They are now leaving more and more of what was once their field to devote themselves to anatomical and physiological research. To anatomize brains, to examine cells under a microscope, to determine the laws connecting excitation and reaction, all this belongs to general physiology, touching equally frogs and humans, but remains without any close or distant application to the knowledge of the psychological stock of the different types of our species. It is therefore impossible not to encourage such essays as Pollock's interesting study, Less Characters, which has just been published. Although the size of our work is very limited, it will still enable us to show, by a few perfectly clear examples, the extent to which the character of peoples determines their destiny. I will also show by other examples that, contrary to all historical appearances, the mental constitution of races, when already formed, possesses almost as stable features as the anatomical features of species. From the mental constitution of races derives their conception of the world and of life, and consequently their behavior and, finally, their history. Perceiving in a certain way the impressions of external things, each individual feels, thinks, and acts quite differently from those who have a quite different mental constitution. Hence it follows that mental organizations, built according to completely different types, cannot achieve complete fusion. The age-old clashes of races have as their main reason the irreconcilability of their characters. Nothing can be understood in history unless it is constantly borne in mind that different races can neither feel, nor think, nor act in the same way, nor, therefore, understand each other. No doubt different peoples have in their languages common words which they consider synonymous, but these common words awaken in those who hear them quite dissimilar feelings, ideas, ways of thinking. It is necessary to live with peoples whose mental structure is sensitively different from ours, even choosing among them only those who speak our language and have received our education, in order to understand the depth of the gap that exists between the mental structure of different peoples. It is possible to get some idea of this without traveling far away by observing the profound mental difference that exists between a civilized man and a woman, even when the latter is very educated. They may have common interests, common feelings, but never the same associations of ideas. They have been talking to each other for centuries without understanding each other, because their spiritual organisms are built on two different types for them to perceive external things in the same way. The mere difference in their logic would be enough to create an impassable chasm between them. 
This gulf between the mental constitution of the different races explains to us why the superior peoples have never succeeded in making the inferior ones accept their civilization. The still widespread belief that education can accomplish such a thing is one of the saddest illusions ever created by theorists of pure reason. There is no doubt that education makes it possible, thanks to the memory possessed by the lowest creatures, which does not, however, constitute the exclusive privilege of man, to give an individual, standing rather low on the human ladder, a body of knowledge such as that possessed by the European. One can easily make a bachelor or a lawyer out of a Negro or a Japanese, but by this he is given a purely external gloss, without any influence on his mental nature, from which he can derive no benefit. What no education can give him, for heredity alone creates them, are the forms of thought, logic, and, chiefly, the character of Westerners. This Negro or this Japanese can get all the degrees they want, but they will never reach the level of a normal European. In ten years he can easily be educated as a very enlightened Englishman. But to make him a real Englishman, that is, a man who acts like an Englishman in the various circumstances of life in which he will be placed, a thousand years would hardly be enough for that. It is only on the surface that a nation abruptly changes its language, its polity, its beliefs, and its art. In order to bring about such a change in reality, it is necessary to change its soul. Chapter 4. Progressive Differentiation of Individuals and Races The inequality between the different individuals of a known race is the greater the higher that race is. The mental equality of all individuals of the lower races. Not the middle strata, but the higher ones must be compared to estimate the differences that divide races. The progress of civilization tends more and more to differentiate individuals and races. The results of this differentiation are Psychological grounds preventing it from becoming very significant How heredity continually brings individual superiority to the average type of race Anatomical observations confirming the progressive psychological differentiation of races, individuals, and sexes The superior races differ from the inferior races not only in their psychological and anatomical features but also in the diversity of the constituent elements within them. In the lower races, all individuals, even when they belong to different sexes, possess almost the same mental level. Being all alike, they are quite representative of the kind of equality that modern socialists dream of. In the higher races, by contrast, the inequality of individuals and sexes constitutes the law. And so, by comparing not the middle strata of peoples, but their higher ones, if only they have any, it is possible to measure the magnitude of the differences that separate them. Hindus, Chinese, and Europeans differ little in their middle strata and at the same time differ greatly in their higher ones. With the progress of civilization, not only the races, but also the individuals of each race, at least those of the higher races, tend to differentiate. Contrary to our dreams of equality, the result of modern civilization is not to make people more and more equal, but on the contrary more and more different. One of the main results of civilization is, on the one hand, the differentiation of races by the more and more daily mental labor it imposes on peoples who have reached a high stage of culture, and, on the other hand, the greater and greater differentiation of the various strata which make up every civilized people. The conditions of modern industrial development really condemn the lower classes of civilized peoples to very specialized labor, which, far from broadening their mental capacities, tends rather to narrow them. A hundred years ago, the worker was a true artist, capable of executing all the minutiae of some mechanism, such as a clock. Nowadays, a simple manipulation, which never produces more than one or another individual part, makes him spend his life drilling the same holes or polishing the same tool, in consequence of which his mind must soon reach the point of complete atrophy. The industrialist or the engineer who directs him, on the contrary, is forced to accumulate immeasurably more knowledge, spirit, initiative, and inventiveness than the same industrialist, the same engineer of a hundred years ago. Constantly exercised, his brain obeys the law to which, in such a case, all the organs are subject, it develops more and more. 
Tocqueville, in the following words, has shown very clearly this progressive differentiation of social strata, and moreover at a time when industry was still very far from the stage of development which it has reached at the present time. As the principle of the division of labor becomes more fully applied, the worker becomes weaker, more limited, and more dependent. Art makes progress, the artisan goes backwards. The master and the worker are becoming more and more different every day. At present the civilized nation, from the intellectual point of view, can be seen as a kind of pyramid with steps, the base of which is occupied by the dark masses of the population, the middle steps by the educated strata and the highest steps, that is, the top of the pyramid, by a small selection of scientists, inventors, artists and writers, a very small group in comparison with the rest of the population, but which alone determines the level of the country on the scale of civilization. It would be enough for them to disappear to see all that constitutes the greatness of a nation disappear at the same time. If France, writes St. Simon, suddenly lost its 51st scientists, its 51st artists, its 51st factory workers, its 51st agronomists, the nation would become a body without a soul, it would be decapitated. But if, on the contrary, it were to lose all its service personnel, this event would sadden the French, because they are good but it would do very little damage to the country. With the advances of civilization, the differentiation between the extreme strata of the population increases rapidly, it even tends to increase exponentially. Thus, if certain hereditary influences did not prevent it, in the course of time the higher strata of some people would be as far away intellectually from the lower ones as the Negro separates the white, or even the Negro from the monkey. But many reasons prevent this intellectual differentiation of social strata, becoming significant, from taking place with the rapidity that can be assumed theoretically. First, in reality the differentiation extends only to the mind, with little or no effect on character, and we know that character, not the mind, plays the chief part in the political life of peoples. Secondly, the masses seek nowadays by their organization and discipline to become all powerful. Besides the two reasons just stated, purely artificial because they derive from the conditions of civilization capable of diversity, there is a much more important one, because it is an irresistible law of nature, which will always prevent the select part of a nation from differentiating itself too rapidly intellectually from the lower strata. Next to the artificial conditions of civilization, which more and more tend to differentiate people of the same race, there are in reality stable laws of heredity which tend to destroy or bring to the middle individuals who are too obviously above it. Already the ancient observations cited by all the authors of works on heredity have proved that the descendants of families outstanding in intelligence sooner or later, most often early, undergo degenerations which tend to destroy them entirely. Great intellectual superiority is obtained only under the condition of leaving behind only the degenerates. In reality, the top of the social pyramid of which I spoke above can exist only under the condition of constantly borrowing its productive powers from the elements placed beneath it. If all the individuals of that color were to be gathered on a secluded island, a race could be formed by crossbreeding, afflicted with all possible forms of degeneration and therefore condemned to soon disappear. Great intellectual superiorities can be compared to the botanical ugliness created by the art of the gardener. Left to themselves, they die out or revert to the average type of species, which alone is omnipotent because it represents a long line of ancestors. Thus, more and more differentiated over the centuries, the individuals of a race constantly strive to revolve around the middle type of that race, not being able to depart from it for long. To this middle type, which rises very slowly, belongs the great majority of the members of a known nation. This basic frame is covered, at least in the higher peoples, by a very thin layer of distinguished minds, important from the standpoint of civilization, but of no importance from the standpoint of race. Constantly being destroyed, it is incessantly renewed by the middle layer, which alone changes, only very slowly, because the smallest changes, in order to become lasting, must accumulate hereditarily in the same direction over many centuries. In reality, it is only by the hereditary accumulation of improvements acquired by the middle strata and not by elevated minds, 
because genius is not transmitted, that those progressive differentiations were formed, which gradually elevated the level of some races and dug a chasm between those races and the peoples who failed to progress. Already some years ago, on the basis of purely anatomical studies, I arrived at the ideas I set forth above concerning the differentiation of individuals and races, and for the justification of which I have now referred only to psychological arguments. Since two kinds of studies lead to the same results, I will allow myself to recall some of the conclusions of my first work. They are based on measurements made on many thousands of ancient and modern skulls belonging to different races. These are the most essential of the conclusions. If we leave aside individual cases and pay attention only to a large number of them, the close relation between the volume of the skull and mental capacity becomes perfectly clear. But it is not these insignificant differences in the average capacity of the skull that constitute the trait by which we can distinguish the lower races from the higher ones, but the essential fact that the higher race has a certain number of persons with a very developed brain, while in the lower race there are none. Thus, it is not by the masses of people, but by the units prominent among them, that the races differ from one another. The average difference in the volume of the skull among the different peoples, except when considering the inferior races, is never very great. Comparing the skulls of the various human races in the present and past times, it can be seen that the races whose skull volumes present great individual differences stand at the highest level of civilization, that as a race civilizes, the skulls of its constituent individuals become more and more different from one another. The result of this is that civilization leads us not to mental equality, but to deeper and deeper inequalities. Anatomical and physiological equality is found only among members of races on the lowest stage of development. Between the members of some savage tribe, of whom all devote themselves to the same pursuits, the distinction is most negligible. On the contrary, between a peasant, who has not more than 300 words in his vocabulary, and a scientist, who has a hundred thousand of them with corresponding concepts, the difference is enormous. I must add to what I have said above that the differentiation between individuals produced by the development of civilization is also evident between the sexes. In the lowest peoples, or in the lowest strata of the highest peoples, man and woman are intellectually very close to each other. But as people civilize, the sexes tend to differ more and more from each other. The cranial volume of man and woman, even when comparing only subjects of the same age, equal height, and equal weight, presents very rapidly increasing differences as civilization increases. Very weak in the lower races, these differences become enormous in the higher ones. In the higher races, the female skulls are often only slightly more developed than those of the female skulls of the lower races. While the average volume of the skull of a Parisian puts him between the largest skulls known, the average volume of the skull of a Parisian woman is no different from that of the smallest skulls and reaches almost the volume of the skull of Chinese women or even that of the women of New Caledonia. Chapter 5 the formation of historical races. How the historical races were formed. Conditions allowing different races to merge to form one race. The influence of the number of individuals coming into collision with each other, the inequality of their traits, their environment, etc. The results of interbreeding. Causes of great type reduction in mestizos. Variability of new psychological traits created by crossbreeding. How these traits are reinforced. Critical epochs in history. Crossbreeding constitutes an essential factor in the formation of new races and at the same time a powerful factor in the decay of civilizations. The importance of the establishment of castes. The influence of the environment. The environment can influence only new races in the period of formation, whose interbreeding has decomposed the traits inherited from their ancestors. The environment has no effect on ancient races. Different examples Most of the historical races of Europe are still in the period of formation. Political and social conclusions Why the period of formation of historical races must soon come to an end. We have already pointed out above that it is no longer possible to meet among civilized people's real races, in the scientific sense of the word 
but only historical races, that is, races created by accidents of conquest, immigration, politics, etc., and formed, therefore, from a mixture of people of different origins. How do these heterogeneous races merge to form one historical race with common psychological features? This will constitute the subject of our closest consideration. First of all, let us note that the elements brought into collision by chance do not always merge. The Germans, the Hungarians, the Slavs living under Austrian rule form quite different races and have never shown any inclination to merge. The Irish living under the rule of the English have not mixed with them to any greater extent. As for peoples on the lowest stage of development, such as the Redskins, Australians, Tasmanians, etc., not only do they not merge with the higher peoples, but they quickly disappear from contact with them. Any inferior people who come into collision with a superior people are fatally condemned to soon disappear. Many conditions are necessary before races can merge to form a new, more or less homogeneous one. The first of these conditions is that the interbreeding races should not be too numerically unequal, the second is that they should not differ too much in their traits, the third is that for a long time they should be exposed to the same environmental influences. The first condition I have just mentioned is of prime importance. A small number of whites, when settled among a large Negro tribe, usually disappear after a few generations, leaving no trace of their blood in the offspring. Thus disappeared all the conquerors who conquered too many nationalities. They were able to leave behind their civilization, their art and their language, but they never left their blood there. The second of the preceding conditions is equally important. No doubt races which differ greatly from one another, such as the white and the black, may mingle, but the mestizos born of them form a much inferior race in comparison with those from which it derives, and are quite incapable of creating or even maintaining any civilization whatsoever. The influence of opposing heredity degrades their morals and character. When mestizos accidentally inherit, as in San Domingo, a superior civilization, that civilization quickly falls into a state of deplorable decline. Inbreeding can be an element of progress only among the superior races, close enough to each other, such are the English and Germans of America. But they constitute always an element of degeneration when these races, even as superior races, are too different from each other. All countries that contain too many mestizos are, for this reason alone, doomed to permanent anarchy, unless they are ruled by an iron hand. Such is the inevitable fate of Brazil. It is only a third of the white population. The rest of the population consists of Negroes and mulattoes. The famous Agassiz says, with good reason, that it is enough to visit Brazil to recognize the fact of degeneracy resulting from the interbreeding that has taken place in that country on a much larger scale than elsewhere. These crossbreedings have smoothed out he says the best racial qualities of the kinsmen, whether Negroes, Indians, or Europeans, and have produced an indescribable type in which physical and mental energy have weakened. To cross two peoples is to change both their physical and mental makeup at a time. Crossbreeding, however, is the only sure means we have of profoundly altering the character of a people, for heredity alone is strong enough to fight heredity. They allow us to create over time a new race with new physical and psychological traits. Thus created traits remain unstable and weak in the beginning. It always takes a prolonged hereditary accumulation to consolidate them. The first effect of interbreeding between different races is that it destroys the soul of those races, that is, that set of common ideas and feelings which constitute the strength of peoples and without which neither nation nor fatherland can exist. It is a critical period in the history of the races, a period of first experiences and wanderings, necessarily undergone by all races, because there is not a single European nation that has not been formed from the remains of other nations. It is a period full of internecine strife and all sorts of surprises, lasting as long as the new psychological traits have not yet taken hold. The proceeding shows us that interbreeding must be looked upon simultaneously as a basic element in the formation of new races and as a powerful factor in the decay of ancient races. 
all peoples who had reached a high stage of civilization carefully avoided interbreeding with foreigners and did so quite reasonably. Without the amazing caste system, the tiny handful of Aryans who conquered India 3,000 years ago would soon have drowned in the countless masses of black tribes that surrounded it on all sides, and no civilization would have emerged on the soil of the Great Peninsula. If in our day the English had not kept the same system in practice and agreed to interbreed with the natives, the vast empire of India would have long since been rid of them. A people can lose a great deal, undergo all sorts of catastrophes, and still be able to rise. But they have lost everything, and they will never rise again if they have lost their soul. When civilizations in a state of decline have fallen prey to conquerors, cross-breeding plays first a destructive role and then a creative one, as I just mentioned. They destroy ancient civilization because they destroy the soul of the people who possessed it. They allow the creation of a new civilization because the old psychological traits of the races that came into conflict are destroyed and because new traits may soon be formed under the influence of the new conditions of existence. Only on races in the period of formation, whose inherited traits are destroyed by the opposite action of heredity, is the influence of the last of the factors mentioned in this chapter, the environment, revealed. Very weak in its effect on ancient races, it has a very strong effect on new ones. Crossbreeding, destroying the psychological traits inherited from the ancestors, has created a kind of tabula rasa, on which the action of the environment, continuing over the centuries, finally creates and gradually strengthens new psychological traits. Then and only then can the formation of a new historical race be considered complete. This is how the French race was created. From this it is clear that the influence of the environment, both physical and moral, is either very great or, on the contrary, very weak, depending on the circumstances, and this can explain to itself why the most contradictory opinions are expressed concerning their influence. We have just seen that this influence is very great in races which are in the period of formation, but if we consider ancient races, firmly established since long ago by heredity, we can say that the influence of the environment, on the contrary, is almost reduced to zero. Concerning the moral environment, we have proof of the insignificance of its action in the utter impotence of our Western civilizations to influence the peoples of the East, even when they have been in contact with them for many generations, as is observed in the Chinese living in the United States. For the physical environment we can state the weakness of its power from the difficulties of acclimatization. Transferred to a new environment entirely different from the former, the ancient race whether human, animal, or plant is more likely to perish than to change. Consistently conquered by ten different peoples, Egypt was always their grave. None of them could acclimatize there. The Greeks, Romans, Persians, Arabs, Turks, etc., never left a trace of their blood there. The only type that can be found there is the same unchanged fellow with features faithfully reproducing those carved by Egyptian artists 7,000 years ago on the tombs and palaces of the pharaohs. Most of the historical peoples of Europe are still in a period of formation, and this fact is very important for understanding their history. The modern Englishman alone represents an almost perfectly defined race. And in the ancient Breton, the Anglo-Saxon, and the Norman have merged to form a new, very homogeneous type. In France, by contrast, the Provençal is quite distinct from the Breton, Auvergne, and Norman. However, if there is not yet a type of the average Frenchman, there are at least the average types of the known regions. These types, unfortunately, are still too different in ideas and character. It is therefore difficult to find institutions that could be equally suitable for them all. Their profound differences in feelings and beliefs and the consequent political upheavals are mainly based on differences in mental disposition, which the future may be able to erase. This has always been the case when circumstances have forced different races to live together on the same territory. The more different the races in contact with each other, the more intense the strife and internecine warfare have always been. When they are too dissimilar, it becomes quite impossible to make them live under the same institutions and the same laws. The history of great empires formed from different races has always been the same. 
they disappeared most often with their founder. Of the modern nations, only the Dutch and the English have succeeded in subjugating the Asiatic peoples, quite different from them, but this they succeeded only because they were able to respect the manners, customs, and laws of these peoples, leaving them in reality to govern themselves and limiting their role to taxation, trade relations, and the maintenance of peace. With these rare exceptions, all great empires uniting to similar peoples can only be created by force and condemned to perish by violence. In order that a nation may be formed and long exist, it must be formed slowly. By a gradual mingling of races, little different from one another, constantly interbreeding with one another, living in the same territory, subject to the same environment, having the same institutions and the same beliefs. These different races may then, after a few centuries, form a very homogeneous nation. As the world ages, the races become more and more stable, and their changes by intermingling are more and more rare. As mankind comes of age, the burden of heredity becomes heavier and change more and more difficult. As for Europe, we may say that the era of the formation of historical races will soon come to an end for her. Asterisk Section 2 how the psychological traits of races are found in the various elements of their civilizations. Chapter 1. The history of people as a consequence of their characters. The history of a people derives always from its character of mind. Various examples. How the political institutions of France flow from the soul of a race. Their actual immutability beneath their apparent mutability. Our very different political parties pursue under different names, the same political aims. Centralization and destruction of personal initiative in favor of the state. How the French Revolution only carried out the program of the ancient monarchy. The contrast between the Anglo-Saxon ideal and the Latin ideal. The initiative of the citizen replaced by the initiative of the state. Application of the principles set forth in this work to a comparative study of the development of the North American United States and the Spanish American Republics. The causes of the prosperity of some and the decline of others, notwithstanding the same political institutions. Forms of government and institutions have only a very slight influence upon the fortunes of nations. That destiny arises chiefly from their character. History, in its main features, may be regarded as a mere statement of the results produced by the psychological stock of races. It springs from this stock, as the respiratory organs of fish from their life in the water. Without prior knowledge of the psychological makeup of a people, its history seems like some chaos of events, governed by mere chance. On the contrary, when the soul of a people is known to us, its life appears as a correct and fatal consequence of its psychological traits. In all manifestations of the life of a nation we always find that the unchanging soul of the race itself weaves its own destiny. Especially in political institutions the supreme power of the racial soul is most evident. It will be easy for us to prove this by a few examples. Take first France, one of the world countries that has experienced the deepest upheavals, where in no time the institutions have changed in appearance most radically, where the parties seem not only different, but as if they were even incompatible with each other. But if we look psychologically at these apparently so dissimilar, these perpetually struggling parties, we have to state that they in fact possess exactly the same common foundation that accurately represents the ideal of their race. The irreconcilable, the radicals, the monarchists, the socialists, in a word, all the defenders of the most diverse doctrines pursue under different labels exactly the same goal the absorption of the individual by the state. What they equally ardently desire is the old centralist and Khazarist regime, the state controlling everything, regulating everything, absorbing everything, regulating the minutest detail in the life of the citizens and thus removing them from the need to show the slightest flicker of reflection and initiative. Let the power placed at the head of the state be called king, emperor, president, commune, workers' syndicate, etc., still this power, whatever it may be, will necessarily have one and the same ideal, and this ideal is the expression of the feelings of the racial soul. It will not tolerate any other. Such, writes the very profound observer Dupont White, is the peculiar genius of France, 
she is unable to succeed in some essential and desirable things which have to do with the adornment or even with the essence of civilization, if she is not supported and encouraged by her government. So, if our extreme nervousness, our great tendency to dissatisfaction with the existing, the idea that a new government will make our lot happier, lead us to change our institutions incessantly, then the great voice of our extinct ancestors that guides us condemns us to change only our words and appearances. The unconscious power of the soul of our race is such that we do not even notice the illusion of which we are victims. If we pay attention only to appearances, it is certainly difficult to imagine another regime more different from the old one than the one created by our great revolution. In reality, however, and this cannot be doubted, it only continued the royal tradition, completing the work of centralization begun by the monarchy several centuries before. If Louis XIII and Louis XIV had emerged from their coffins to judge the work of revolution, they would doubtless have had to condemn some of the violence that accompanied its realization, but they would have regarded it as strictly in accord with their traditions and with their program, and would have recognized that if any minister had been charged by them to carry out that program, he would not have executed it better. They would say that the least revolutionary government France has ever known is precisely that of the revolution. Moreover, they would state that for a century none of the various regimes which have followed one another in France have tried to touch the case, to that extent it is a product of proper development, an extension of the monarchical ideal and an expression of the genius of the race. No doubt these glorious descendants from that world, in view of their tremendous experience, would have presented some critical remarks and, perhaps, would have drawn attention to the fact that the new order, by replacing the governmental aristocratic caste with the bureaucratic caste, has created in the state an impersonal power more significant than that of the old aristocracy, because the bureaucracy alone, escaping the influence of political change, has tradition, a corporate spirit. Irresponsibility, constancy, i.e. i.e., a whole series of conditions that necessarily lead it to become the sole ruler of the state. I believe, however, that they would not insist on this objection, given that Latin peoples, caring little for liberty but much for equality, easily tolerate all kinds of despotism, so long as that despotism is impersonal. Maybe they would still find all those countless regulations, those thousands of fetters that now surround the smallest act of life completely superfluous and very tyrannical and would pay attention to the fact that if the state absorbs everything, frames everything with restrictions, deprives citizens of any initiative, then we would voluntarily find ourselves, without any new revolution, in full socialism. But then, the divine light illuminating the tops of the spheres, or, for lack of it, the mathematical knowledge teaching us that consequences grow in geometric progression as long as the same causes continue to operate, would enable them to understand that socialism is nothing other than the extreme expression of the monarchical idea, for which revolution was the accelerating phase. So, in the institutions of any nation we simultaneously find those accidental circumstances which we listed at the beginning of this work and the permanent laws which we have tried to define. The accidental circumstances create only names, appearances. The basic laws, on the other hand, derive from the character of the people and create the destiny of nations. We may contrast the above example with that of another race, the English, whose psychological makeup is entirely different from that of the French. Because of this fact alone, its institutions are fundamentally different from those of France. Whether the English have at their head a monarch, as in England, or a president, as in the United States, their mode of government will always have the same basic features, the activity of the state will be reduced to a minimum, the activity of private individuals to a maximum, which is the exact opposite of the Latin ideal. Ports, canals, railroads, and educational institutions would always be built and maintained by private initiative, never by the state. Neither revolutions, nor constitutions, nor despots can give to any people those qualities of character which they do not possess, or take away from them the existing qualities from which their institutions arise. More than once the idea has been repeated that every nation has the form of government that it deserves. It is difficult to admit that it could have another. The preceding brief considerations show that the institutions of a people are an expression of its soul 
and that if it is easy for it to change their appearance, it cannot change their foundation. We will now show with even clearer examples to what extent the soul of a people governs its destiny and what insignificant role the institutions play in that destiny. I take these examples from a country where two European races, equally civilized and developed, live side by side, under almost identical environmental conditions, but differing only in their character, I want to speak of America. It consists of two separate continents connected by an isthmus. The size of each of these continents is almost equal, their soils are very similar to each other. One was conquered and inhabited by the English race, the other by the Spanish. These two races live under the same republican constitutions, for all the republics of South America have copied their constitutions from those of the United States. And so, we have nothing by which we can explain to ourselves the different destinies of these peoples, except racial differences. Let us see what these differences have produced. Let us first summarize in a few words the traits of the Anglo-Saxon race that populated the United States. There may be no one in the world with a more homogeneous and more definite state of mind than the members of that race. The predominant features of this mental constitution, in terms of character, are, a stock of will, which, with the exception of the Romans, perhaps, very few nations have possessed, indomitable energy, very great initiative, absolute self-control, a sense of independence reduced to extreme unsociability, powerful activity, very tenacious religious feelings, very strong morals, and a very clear sense of duty. From the intellectual point of view, it is difficult to give a special characteristic, i.e. to indicate those special features which could not be found in other civilized nations. One can only note the common sense, which makes it possible to grasp the practical and positive side of things on the fly and not to wander in chimerical research, a very lively attitude to the facts and moderately calm to the general ideas and religious traditions. To this general characteristic must be added the full optimism of a man whose life path is perfectly clear and who does not even suppose that one can choose the best one. He always knows what his fatherland, his family and his religion require of him. This optimism is carried to the point where it makes him look with contempt at anything foreign. This contempt for the foreigner and for their customs exceeds to some extent in England even that which the Romans once held for the barbarians in the age of their greatness. It is such that in relation to the foreigner all moral rule disappears. There is not an English politician who would not regard as perfectly legitimate, in relation to another nation, acts which would risk the deepest and most unanimous indignation if they were practiced toward his countrymen. There is no doubt that this contempt for the foreigner, from a philosophical point of view, is a very lowly feeling, but from the point of view of the public welfare, it is extremely useful. As General Walsley of England rightly pointed out, it is one of the qualities that builds up the strength of England. Somebody has very aptly expressed about their refusal, quite, however, thoroughly, to allow a tunnel to be built under the channel, which would have facilitated the communications of England with the mainland, that the English are making as much effort as the Chinese to prevent any foreign influence from penetrating them. All the traits which we have just enumerated can be found in the various social strata, there is not a single element of English civilization on which they do not make their deep imprint. Does not this strike every foreigner who visits England for the first time? He will notice the need of independent life in the hut of the humblest worker or room, it is true, cramped, but protected from all coercion and secluded from all neighborhood, in the most frequented railway stations, where the public circulates incessantly, without being driven like a herd of docile rams behind a barrier guarded by gendarme, as if only force could ensure the safety of people who cannot find in themselves the shares of attention necessary not to crush each other. He will find the energy of the race in the hard work of the worker, as well as in the work of the student, who being left to himself from an early age, learns to lead himself, knowing already that in life no one will be engaged in his destiny, except him, in professors, very moderately pressing on the study, but paying increased attention to the development of character, which they consider one of the greatest engines in the world. Authorized by the Queen of England to determine the terms of the annual prize which she has appointed for Wellington College, 
Prince Albert determined that it should be awarded not to the pupil who has excelled most in the sciences, but to the one who is recognized as having the most exalted character. All our education, meaning what we think of as higher education, consists in making young people retell lectures. Even afterwards they retain this habit to such an extent that they continue to repeat what has long been recited throughout the rest of their lives. Delving into the public life of the citizen, he will see that if it is necessary to fix a spring in a village, to build a seaport or to build a railroad, it is always the personal initiative, not the state, that is appealed to. Continuing his research, he will soon learn that this people, notwithstanding its defects, which make it the most obnoxious of all nations to a foreigner, is alone truly free, because it alone has learned the art of self-government and has succeeded in leaving to the government a minimum of active power. If you run through his history, you see that he was the first to free himself from all domination, from the domination of the church as well as from the domination of autocrats. As early as the 15th century Fortescue contrasted Roman law, the legacy of the Latin peoples, with English law, the one is a work of autocratism and is all imbued with the sacrifice of the individual, the other is a work of the common will and always ready to defend the individual. To whichever place on the globe such a people moved, they would immediately become dominant and lay the foundations of mighty empires. If the race it enslaves, such as the Redskins in America, is weak enough but not useful enough, it will be systematically eradicated. But if the enslaved race, such as the people of India, is too numerous to be wiped out, and can in between deliver productive labor, it will simply be reduced to a state of very severe vassal dependence and forced to work exclusively for its masters. But especially in such a new country as America, one can observe those amazing successes which owe their existence only to the mental disposition of the English race. Having migrated to a country without culture, barely inhabited by a few savages, and with no one to rely on but herself, everyone knows what she has become. It took her less than a century to become one of the world's great powers, and now there is no one who can compete with her. I recommend reading M. Ruzier's book on the United States to those who wish to get an idea of the enormous mass of initiative and personal energy expended by the citizens of the great republic. The capacity of the people to govern themselves, to unite to establish large enterprises, to found cities, schools, harbors, railroads, etc., is brought to such a maximum, and the activities of the state reduced to such a minimum, that it may be said that there is almost no state power. Apart from police and diplomatic representation, one cannot even think of what it could serve. To prosper in the United States, however, is only possible under the condition of possessing the qualities of character which I have just described, and this is why the immigration of foreigners cannot change the basic spirit of the race. The conditions of existence are such that he who does not possess these qualities is condemned to a quick death. In this atmosphere, saturated with independence and energy, only an Anglo-Saxon can live. The Italian starves to death there, the Irishman squanders in inferior occupations. The Great Republic is, of course, a land of liberty, but at the same time it is not a land of equality or fraternity. In no country on the globe has natural selection ever made its iron paw felt more strongly. It manifests itself here ruthlessly, but it is in consequence of its ruthlessness that the race to whose formation it has contributed retains its power and energy. On the soil of the United States there is no room at all for the weak, the mediocre, and the incapable. Individuals and entire races are condemned to perish by the mere fact that they are inferior. The redskins, having become useless, have been exterminated by iron and famine. The Chinese laborers, whose labor is very unpleasant competition, will soon suffer the same fate. The law which decreed their utter expulsion could not be enforced because of the enormous expense it would have cost to enforce it. But even apart from the law they will be systematically exterminated, as is in part already practiced in some districts. Other laws have recently been vetoed to deny access to American territory to poor immigrants. As for the Negroes, who served as a pretext for the abolitionist war, a war between those who owned slaves and those who themselves did not, and did not allow others to own them, they are barely tolerated in society, 
being always associated with those lower occupations that no American citizen would want to take on. In theory they have all rights, but in practice they are treated like useful animals, which they try to get rid of when they become dangerous. A brief lynching under Lynch's law is universally recognized as perfectly sufficient for them. At the first serious crime they are shot or hanged. Statistics, knowing only a fraction of these executions, have recorded 1,100 in the last seven years alone. These, of course, are the darker sides of the picture. It is bright enough to make them invisible. If one were to define in one word the difference between continental Europe and the United States, one might say that the former represents the maximum that official regulation can produce, replacing personal initiative, the latter the maximum that personal initiative can produce, entirely free from all official regulation. These basic differences are consequences of character. It is not on the ground of a stern republic that European socialism has any chance of taking root. As the last expression of the tyranny of the state, it can flourish only in the old races, who for centuries have been subjected to a regime which has taken from them all ability to govern themselves. We have just seen what has been produced in one part of America by a race possessing a certain mental disposition, in which perseverance, energy, and will prevail. It remains for us to show what has become of almost the same country in the hands of another race, though very advanced, but possessing none of those qualities of character of which I have just had to speak. South America, in terms of its natural wealth, is one of the richest countries on the globe. Twice as big as Europe and ten times less populous, it has no shortage of land and is, so to speak, at everyone's disposal. Its predominant population is of Spanish origin and is divided into many republics, Argentine, Brazilian, Chilean, Peruvian, etc. They have all borrowed their political system from the United States, and consequently live under the same laws. And for all this, because of racial distinction alone, i.e., because of the lack of those essential qualities which the race which inhabits the United States possesses, all these republics are without a single exception the constant victims of the bloodiest anarchy, and, notwithstanding the wonderful wealth of their soil, one after another fall into all kinds of plunder, bankruptcy, and despotism. One must look through T. Child's remarkable and impartial work on the Spanish-American republics to appreciate the depth of their decline. Its causes are rooted in the mental constitution of a race that has neither energy, will, nor morals. In particular, the lack of morals exceeds anything we know the worst of in Europe. Citing the example of one of the most important cities, Buenos Aires, the author declares it utterly impossible for those who still retain the slightest conscience and morality to live there. Concerning one of the least fallen South American republics, Argentine, the same writer adds, Examine this republic from a commercial point of view, and you will be struck by the immorality that is on display here everywhere. As to institutions, no example better shows the extent to which they are the product of race, and how impossible it is to transfer them from one people to another. It would be very interesting to know what such liberal institutions of the United States would become if they were transferred to an inferior race. These countries, child observes, referring to the various Spanish-American republics are under the feral of presidents, enjoying as unlimited autocracy as the Turkish sultan, even more unlimited, as they are protected from the intrusiveness and influence of European diplomacy. The administrative staff consists only of their creatures. The citizens cast their vote for what they think is good, but he pays no attention to their votes. The Argentine Republic is a republic in name only, in reality it is an oligarchy of people who have made politics into commerce. The only country, Brazil, has somewhat escaped this deep decline, and that only because of the monarchical regime that shielded power from co-optation. Too liberal for these races without energy or will, it eventually fell. Immediately the country fell into complete anarchy and in two or three years the men in power embezzled the treasury to such an extent that taxes had to be increased by 60%. Of course, the decline of the Latin race inhabiting South America is evident not only in politics, but in all elements of civilization. Left to themselves, 
these unhappy republics would revert to pure barbarism. All industry and all commerce are in the hands of foreigners the English, the Americans, and the Germans. Valparaiso has become an English city, and there would be nothing left in Chile if foreigners were taken from it. It is only thanks to them that these countries still retain the outward gloss of civilization that sometimes resembles Europe. The Argentine Republic has four million whites of Spanish descent, I don't know if I could name one of them, besides foreigners, at the head of any truly large enterprise. This terrible decline of the Latin race, left to itself, in comparison with the prosperity of the English race in a neighboring country, is one of the saddest and yet most instructive experiences which can be cited to confirm the psychological laws I have outlined. We see from these examples that a people cannot get rid of that which arises as a consequence of its mental disposition, and if it succeeds, it succeeds at very rare moments so the sand lifted by the storm seems to be freed for a time from the laws of gravitation. In our opinion, to believe that forms of government and constitutions are decisive in the destiny of a people is to indulge in childish daydreaming. It is in him alone that their destiny lies, not in external circumstances. All that can be demanded of a government is that it be the spokesman for the feelings and ideas of the people it is called upon to govern. For the most part, by the mere fact that a government exists, it is an accurate representation of the people. There are no forms of government or institutions about which we can say that they are absolutely good or absolutely bad. The reign of the King of Dahomey is probably an excellent reign for the people he was called upon to rule, and the most skillful European constitution would be to that same people inferior to the regime he produced. This, unfortunately, is what many statesmen ignore, imagining that the form of government is a subject of exportation, and that the colonies can be governed by the institutions of the metropolis. It would be equally reasonable to try to persuade fish to live in the air, on the sole ground that all higher animals enjoy air breathing. Because of the mere difference in their mental disposition, different peoples cannot remain under the same regime for long. An Irishman and an Englishman, a Slav and a Hungarian, an Arab and a Frenchman can be kept under the same laws with the greatest difficulty and at the cost of ceaseless revolutions. Great empires composed of different peoples are always condemned to an ephemeral existence. If they existed sometimes for a long time, as the Mughal Empire and then the English in India, it is on the one hand because the native races were so numerous, so different and therefore so hostile to one another, that they could not think of uniting against foreigners, on the other hand because these foreign rulers had the right political instinct to respect the habits of subdued peoples and let them live according to their own laws. Many books would have to be written and even the whole of history remade from an entirely new perspective if researchers were to set out to show all the implications arising from the psychological makeup of peoples. A deeper study of it would be the basis for politics and for pedagogy. It might even be said that this study would save people from an abyss of errors and many upheavals, if nations at all could avoid the evils arising from the properties of their race, if the voice of reason were not always drowned out by the commanding voice of the ancestors. Chapter 2 The Various Elements of Civilization as the Outward Manifestation of the Soul of a People The elements out of which civilization is formed constitute the outward manifestations of the soul of the peoples who created them. The importance of these various elements varies from one people to another. Art, literature, institutions, etc., play different roles in different peoples. Examples provided in antiquity by the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. Different elements of a civilization may have an evolution quite independent of the general course of that civilization. Examples represented by art. What it conveys the impossibility of finding in any one element of a civilization the measure of its level. Elements that ensure the superiority of any one people. Elements, philosophically, very low, can be very important from a societal point of view. The various elements, language, institutions, ideas, beliefs, art, literature, of which civilization is formed, must be regarded as the outward manifestation of the soul of the people who created them. But, according to epics and races, 
the importance of these elements as expressions of the soul of a people varies greatly. It is difficult nowadays to find a book devoted to works of art in which it is not repeated that they faithfully convey the thought of peoples and serve as the most essential expression of their civilization. No doubt this is often the case, but there is still much missing for this rule to be absolute and for the development of art to correspond always to the intellectual development of nations. If there are nations for whom works of art constitute the most important expression of their souls, there are, in turn, others, very high on the ladder of civilization, in whom art has played only a very secondary role. If one were to write the history of the civilization of each people, taking into account only one element of it, that element would have to vary from one people to another. Some peoples would make it possible to know better the arts, others the political and military institutions, industry, etc. This point is important to establish from the beginning, because it will enable us later to understand why the various elements of civilization, being transmitted from one people to another, have undergone very unequal changes. Among the peoples of antiquity, the Egyptians and Romans represent very characteristic examples of this disparity in the development of the various elements of civilization and even of the various branches from which each of the named elements is formed. Take the Egyptians first. Their literature has always been very weak, their painting very mediocre. On the contrary, architecture and sculpture have masterpieces. Their monuments still astonish us now. The statues which they have left us can still serve as models, and the Greeks needed only a very short period to surpass them. From the Egyptians we move on to the Romans, who played such a dominant role in history. They had no shortage of educators or models, for they already had predecessors in the form of the Egyptians and the Greeks, and yet they did not have time to create an original art. Never, perhaps, did any people find less originality in their artistic works. The Romans cared very little for art, looking at it only from a utilitarian point of view and seeing in it only a sort of object of importation, similar to other products, such as metals, spices and spices, which they demanded from foreign nations. Even when they were already masters of the world, the Romans had no national art, and even in an age when universal peace, wealth, and the needs of luxury had developed a little of their weak artistic sensibilities, they only wrote out models and artists from Greece. The history of Roman architecture and sculpture is no more than a supplementary chapter to the history of Greek architecture and sculpture. But this great Roman people, so insignificant in its art, raised the other three elements of civilization to unreachable heights. It had the military organization which secured its world domination, then the political and judicial institutions, from which we still take examples to this day, and finally, the literature which has inspired ours for centuries. So, we see strikingly clearly the disparity in the development of the elements of civilization in the two nations whose high level of culture cannot be disputed, and therefore we can predict in advance the errors into which one risks falling who takes as a scale only one of these elements, for example, art. We have just found in the Egyptians an extremely original and remarkable art, with the exception of painting, in a very mediocre literature. The Romans had a very mediocre art without a trace of originality but a brilliant literature and, lastly, first-rate political and military institutions. The Greeks themselves, one of the nations who showed their superiority in the most varied branches, may also be cited to show the lack of parallelism in the development of the various elements of civilization. In Homeric times their literature was already very brilliant. Even now the songs of Homer are regarded as the models on which the university youth of Europe have been educated for centuries and yet the discoveries of modern archaeology have shown that at the time of the origin of the Homeric songs Greek architecture and sculpture were grossly barbaric and consisted only of ugly imitations of Egyptian and Assyrian. But these disparities in development are best shown to us by the Hindus. From the point of view of architecture, there are very few peoples who have surpassed them. From the point of view of philosophy, their speculations reached a depth which European thought has reached only in very recent times. If the literature of the Hindus stands below that of the Greeks and Romans, yet it has given us some remarkable things. 
in the field of sculpture of the Hindus, on the other hand, are very mediocre and far inferior to the Greeks. In the domain of science and historical knowledge they are utterly insignificant, and it may be stated that they have a lack of accuracy which cannot be found in any other people on a similar stage of development. Their science is just a childish speculation, their historical books are ridiculous legends without any chronological date and probably without any exact events. It is clear that a study of art alone would not be sufficient to determine the level of civilization of this people. Many other examples could be given to support what has been said. There are races which, while never occupying a very high position, have succeeded, however, in creating for themselves a completely individual art, without any apparent connection with preceding specimens. Such were the Arabs. Less than a century after their flood swept over the old Greco-Roman world, they first of all altered the Byzantine architecture which they had borrowed, so that it would be impossible to discover which models their work had been inspired by, if we did not have before our eyes a whole series of monuments of a mixed style. However, even when a people does not have any artistic or literary ability, it can create a very high civilization. Such were the Phoenicians who had no superiority other than their commercial abilities. It was only through their mediation that the ancient world civilized, the various parts of which were brought into contact with one another by them, but they themselves produced almost nothing, and the history of their civilization is only the history of their commerce. Finally, there are peoples in whom all the elements of civilization, with the exception of art, have remained in a very low state. Such were the Mughals. The monuments erected by them in India, the style of which contains almost nothing Hindu, are so magnificent that some of them are recognized by competent artists as the finest works of human hands, but no one would think of placing the Mughals among the superior races. It may be observed, however, that even with the most civilized peoples the arts did not always reach their highest stage of development at the culmination of their development. With the Egyptians and Hindus the most perfect monuments are at the same time the most ancient, in Europe the wonderful Gothic art flourished, the amazing works of which had never had anything equal in the Middle Ages, considered as a half-barbaric age. So, it is quite impossible to judge the level of development of any nation only by the development of its art. It is, I repeat, only one element of its civilization, and it is not proven that this element, just as literature, is the highest. Often, on the contrary, the peoples who are at the head of a civilization, the Romans in ancient times, the Americans at present, have the weakest works of art. Often also, as we have just noticed, peoples have created their literary and artistic masterpieces in semi-barbaric ages. Thus we may consider that the period of individuality in art is the blossom of its childhood or of its youth, but not of its maturity and if we take into account that in the utilitarian concerns of the new world, whose dawn we only barely discern, the role of art is hardly noticeable, then we can foresee the day when it will be placed if not among the lower, then at least among the completely secondary manifestations of civilization. However, many arguments can be made against the view that art progresses simultaneously with the other elements of civilization, it has its own separate and special evolution whether we take Egypt, Greece, or the various nations of Europe, we always state the general law that as soon as art has reached a certain level, having created certain masterpieces, a period of imitation begins immediately, which is inevitably followed by a period of decline, entirely independent of the movement of the other elements of civilization. This period of decline continues until some political revolution, invasion, adoption of a new religion, or some other factor introduces new elements into art. Thus in the Middle Ages the Crusades brought knowledge and new ideas which gave art a boost which had the consequence of transforming the Romanesque into the Gothic style. In the same way, a few centuries later, the revival of the study of Greco-Roman life led to the transformation of Gothic art into Renaissance art. Similarly, in India, Muslim invasions led to the transformation of Hindu art. It is also important to note that, since art expresses in general terms the known needs of civilization and corresponds to known feelings, 
it is condemned to undergo changes consistent with these needs and even to disappear completely if the very needs and feelings that gave birth to it change or disappear by chance. It does not follow from this that civilization is in decline, and here again we see a lack of parallelism between the evolution of art and the evolution of the other elements of civilization. In no historical epoch has civilization been as high as it is now, and in no epoch, perhaps, has art been more banal and less individualized. As the religious beliefs, ideas, and needs that made art an essential element of civilization in an era when it counted temples and palaces as shrines have disappeared, so art itself has become something incidental, an object of entertainment to which one cannot devote much time or money. No longer an object of necessity, it can only be artisanal and imitative. There is no nation at the present time which has a national art, and everyone in architecture, as in sculpture, lives only by more or less successful copies from distant times. Art is only an inferior kind of industry when it ceases to be an expression of the needs, ideas and feelings of a known epoch. I marvel now at the sincere work of our medieval painters who painted saints, heaven and hell, subjects very essential then and constituting the main focus of existence, but when artists, who no longer have any real beliefs, cover our walls with the same subjects, trying to return to the techniques of another age, they make only pathetic imitations, totally uninteresting for the present and which the future will despise. The cute naivete of a child is disgusted when it begins to be imitated by an old man. What we have just said about painting also applies to our architecture, which is currently imitating forms that correspond to needs and beliefs that we no longer have. The only sincere architecture of our day, because it alone corresponds to the needs and ideas of our civilization, is that of the five-story house, the railway bridge, and the train station. This utilitarian art is as characteristic of the known epoch as were once the Gothic church and the feudal castle, and for future archaeology the great modern hotels and the Gothic cathedrals will be of equal interest, because they will be the successive pages of those stone books which each century leaves behind, and at the same time it will reject with contempt, as worthless documents, the pitiful forgeries which constitute all modern art. The mistake of our artists is that they wish to revive formulas that correspond to aesthetic needs and feelings that we no longer have. Our miserable classical education has filled their heads with obsolete concepts and imbues them with an aesthetic ideal which is not at all interesting for our days. Everything changes over the centuries people, their needs, their beliefs. In the name of what principles do they dare to say that aesthetics alone is not subject to the law of development? which governs the universe. Every aesthetic represents the ideal of beauty of a known epoch and a known race, and by the mere fact that epochs and races are different, and the ideal of beauty must be constantly changing. Philosophically, all ideals are of equal value because they constitute only temporal symbols. When the influence of the Greeks and Romans, which for so many centuries has falsified the European mind, finally disappears from our education and when we learn to look around us independently, it will become clear to us that the world possesses monuments of at least the same aesthetic value as the Parthenon, and of far higher interest to modern peoples. From the foregoing we may conclude that if art, like all the elements of civilization, constitutes the outward expression of the soul of the people who created them, this does not mean that it constitutes for all peoples the exact expression of their thought. This clarification was necessary. For the importance which a certain people has of one or another element of civilization measures the transformative power which that people applies to the same element when it borrows it from an alien race. If, for example, its individuality is chiefly manifested in the arts, it will not be able to reproduce imported specimens without putting a deep imprint of its own on them. On the contrary, he will change very little of the elements which cannot serve as interpreters of his genius. When the Romans borrowed architecture from the Greeks, they made no radical changes in it, because they invested their soul most of all by no means in their monuments. And yet even with such a people, utterly devoid of original architecture, compelled to seek for themselves models and artists abroad, art must in a few centuries submit to the influence of the environment and become, almost in spite of itself, the expression of the race which borrows it. 
the temples, the palaces, the triumphal arches, the bar-reliefs of ancient Rome the work of Greeks or Greek disciples, and yet the character of these monuments, their purpose, their ornaments, even their dimensions, will no longer in us the poetic and tender memories of Athenian genius, but more the idea of power, domination, military passion, which lifted up the great soul of Rome. Thus, even in that sphere where race displays the least originality, it cannot take a step without leaving some trace that belongs only to it and reveals to us something of its soul and of its hidden thoughts. Indeed, a true artist, whether he is an architect, a literary man or a poet, has the magical ability to convey in magnificent summaries the soul of a known era and a known race. Very impressionable, almost unconscious, thinking mainly in images, very little resonance, artists are the truest mirror of the society in which they live, their works are the truest documents to which one can point in order to reproduce the true image of any civilization. They are too unconscious not to be sincere, and too susceptible to the impressions of their environment not to convey faithfully its ideas, feelings, needs, and aspirations. They have no freedom, and this constitutes their strength. They are enclosed in a close circle of traditions, ideas, beliefs, the totality of which forms the soul of a race and of an age, a heritage of feelings, thoughts and compulsions, whose influence on them is all-powerful, because it governs the dark sphere of the unconscious in which their works are produced. If, without these works, we knew of past ages only what the absurd accounts and tendentious writings of ancient historians tell us, then the true past of every nation would be for us almost as hidden as the past of that mysterious Atlantis submerged by the sea, of which Plato speaks. The property of a work of art is to sincerely express the needs and ideas that brought it into being, but if a work of art is the right language, that language is often difficult to interpret. There is an intimate connection between the work and the unconscious thought that created it, but how can we find the thread that enables us to ascend from one to the other? This thought, formed day by day from innumerable influences of environment, beliefs, needs, accumulated by heredity, is often incomprehensible to people of another race and another age, but it is less incomprehensible when conveyed to us by stone than when it comes to us by words, for words are elastic forms covering with the same garment completely dissimilar ideas. Of all the different languages which tell the past, works of art, especially works of architecture, are still the most intelligible. More sincere than books, less artificial than religion and language, they express feelings and needs at the same time. The architect is the builder of man's home and the home of the gods and it is always in the bounds of the temple or near the hearth that the first causes of the events that make up history were worked out. From the foregoing we may conclude that if the various elements from which a civilization is formed are a faithful expression of the soul of the people who created them, some of them reproduce the soul of that people much better than others. But since the nature of these elements varies from one people to another, from one epoch to another, it is obviously impossible to find among them even one that can be used as a common measure for different civilizations. It is also evident that no hierarchical distribution can be established between these elements, for this distribution changes from age to age as the social utility of the elements in question themselves changes with the ages. If we were to judge the importance of the various elements of civilization from a purely utilitarian point of view, we would have to say that the most important elements are those which enable one people to enslave others, that is, military institutions. But then we would have to put the Greeks, artists, philosophers, and scientists, below the heavy Roman cohorts, the wise and learned Egyptians below the half-barbarian Persians, the Hindus below the half-barbarian Mughals. History does not deal with these subtle differences. The only superiority before which it always worships is military, but the latter is very rarely accompanied by a corresponding superiority in the other elements of civilization, or at least does not allow it to exist near itself for long. Unfortunately, the military superiority of a people cannot weaken without its being condemned to soon disappearance. It has always happened that when the superior peoples reached the height of civilization, they had to yield to barbarians far below them in intelligence but possessing certain qualities of character and militancy, which two refined civilizations have always destroyed, 
so we must come to the sad conclusion that those elements of civilization which from the philosophical point of view are very low are from the social point of view the most important. If the laws of the future are to be the same as those of the past, we might say that the most harmful thing for a people is if they reach too high a level of development and culture. Nations perish as the qualities of their character, which are the basis of their souls, deteriorate as their civilization and development grows. Chapter 3 How Institutions, Religions, and Languages Are Transformed The superior races cannot, just as the inferior races cannot, drastically change the elements of their civilization. The contradictions presented by peoples who have changed their religion, their language, and their art. In what these changes are seen. The profound changes to which Buddhism, Brahmanism, Islamism, and Christianity have been subjected, according to the races which have adopted them. The changes to which institutions and languages have been subjected according to the races which have adopted them. Words regarded as corresponding in different languages represent quite dissimilar ideas and ways of thinking. The impossibility, as a consequence, of translating certain languages into foreign ones. Why, in historical writings, the civilization of a people sometimes undergoes profound changes. The limits of the mutual influence of different civilizations. In one of my writings I have shown that the superior races are unable to impose their civilization on the inferior ones. By examining one by one the strongest means of influence available to Europeans' education, institutions, and beliefs I have proved the utter insufficiency of these means of influence to change the social condition of the inferior peoples. I have also tried to establish that, since the elements of a civilization correspond to a known, well-defined state of mind, created by a long influence of heredity, it would be impossible to change them without at the same time changing the state of mind from which they arise. Ages alone, not conquerors, can accomplish such a work. I have also shown that only through a series of successive stages, similar to those through which the barbarians, the destroyers of Greco-Roman civilization, passed, can a people ascend the ladder of civilization. If one tries, through education, to rid him of such stages, it only destroys his morals and mental faculties and ultimately brings him down to a much lower level than that which he himself has attained. The reasoning that applies to the lower races also applies to the higher races. If the principles outlined in this work are correct, then we must argue that the higher races cannot dramatically change their civilization either. They, too, need time in successive stages. If it sometimes seems that some superior people have adopted beliefs, institutions, language, and arts quite different from those of their ancestors, in reality this is only possible after they have slowly and deeply changed them to conform to their own state of mind. Obviously, history contradicts on every page the statement just made. There you can very often see peoples changing elements of their civilization, adopting new religions, new languages, new institutions. Some leave their centuries-old beliefs to convert to Christianity, Buddhism, or Islam, others transform their language, still others, finally, fundamentally change their institutions and arts. It even seems that some conqueror or apostle, or even a mere caprice, is enough to make such changes very easily. But in telling us about these dramatic upheavals, history is only doing its usual work, creating and spreading misconceptions over the years. When you study closer all these imaginary changes, you soon notice that only the names of things easily change, while the essence, which is hidden behind these words, continue to live and change only very slowly. To be convinced of this and to show, at the same time, how behind similar names the slow development of things is accomplished, it would be necessary to study the elements of each civilization in different peoples, i.e. to write a completely new history of them. To this difficult work I have already begun in many volumes and do not intend to resume it here. Leaving aside the innumerable elements from which civilization is formed, I will choose only one of them art. But before I begin, in a separate chapter, to study the evolution which art undergoes in the transition from one people to another, I will say a few words about the changes experienced by the other elements of civilization, 
in order to show that the laws which apply to one of these elements are also applicable to all the others, and that if the art of nations is in connection with a certain psychological structure, then language, institutions, beliefs, etc., are of the same mutual nature, etc., are in the same mutual dependence, and, therefore, cannot abruptly change and pass from one people to another. This theory may seem paradoxical as it relates to religious beliefs, and yet one can find the best examples in the history of these very beliefs to prove that it is as impossible for a people to change the elements of its civilization as it is for an individual to change his height or the color of his eyes. No doubt everyone knows that all the great religions, Brahmanism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, have caused mass conversions among whole races, who formally adopted them at once but when one delves a little deeper into the study of these conversions, it is immediately apparent that if anything the peoples have changed, it is the name of their old religion and not the religion itself, that in reality the adopted beliefs have undergone the changes necessary to join the old beliefs to which they have replaced and in relation to which they were only mere the changes experienced by beliefs in the transition from one people to another are often even so great that the newly adopted religion has no visible kinship with the one whose name it retains. The best example of this is Buddhism, which, after being transferred to China, became so unrecognizable there that at first scholars mistook it for an independent religion and it took a long time to discover that it was simply Buddhism, modified by the race that adopted it. Chinese Buddhism is not at all the Buddhism of India, very different from the Buddhism of Nepal, and the latter, in turn, is distant from the Buddhism of Ceylon. In India Buddhism was only a schism of the Brahmanism which preceded it, from which it differs very little in essence, just as in China it is a schism of the former beliefs to which it is closely attached. What is strictly proven for Buddhism is no less true for Brahmanism. Since the races of India are extremely different, it was easy to suppose that under the same names they must have had extremely different religious beliefs. Doubtless all the Brahmanist tribes regard Vishnu and Shiva as their principal deities and the Vedas as their sacred books, but these principal deities have left in their religion only their names, the sacred books only their text. Next to them innumerable cults were formed, in which a variety of beliefs can be found, depending on the race monotheism, polytheism, fetishism, pantheism, the cult of ancestors, demons, animals, etc. If one were to judge the cults of India only by what the Vedas say, it would be impossible to get the slightest idea of the deities and beliefs prevailing in the vast peninsula. The title of the sacred books is revered by all the Brahmins, but nothing at all remains of the religion which these books teach. Even Islam itself, despite the simplicity of its monotheism, has not escaped this law, there is a great distance between the Islam of Persia, Arabia, and India. India, essentially polytheistic, has found the means to make polytheistic the most monotheistic of religions. For 50 million Hindu Muslims, Muhammad and the saints of Islam are only new deities added to thousands of others. Islam has not even succeeded in establishing that equality of all men which elsewhere has been one of the reasons for its success. Muslims in India apply, like other Hindus, the caste system. In the Deccan, among the Dravidian nationalities, Islam has become so unrecognizable that it can no longer be distinguished from Brahmanism, it would not differ from it at all, were it not for the name of Muhammad and the mosque where the adored prophet is worshipped. One need not go to India to see the profound changes to which Islam was subjected as it passed from one race to another. It is enough to look at Algeria. It contains two very different races, Arabs and Berbers, both equally Muslim. But from the Islam of the former to the Islamism of the latter is very far, the polygamy of the Quran is turned into monogamy among the Berbers, whose religion is only a compound of Islam with the old paganism that reigned among them for many centuries when Carthage still reigned. And the religions of Europe have not escaped the general law of modifying themselves in accordance with the soul of the races that adopt them. As in India, the letter of the dogmas established by the texts has remained unchanged, but these are only simple formulas, the meaning of which each interprets in his own way. Under the general name of Christians we find in Europe real pagans, such as the Lower Breton, 
who pray to idols, fetishists, such as the Spaniard, who adores amulets, polytheists, such as the Italian, who revere the Madonnas of each village as different deities. By investigating further, it would be easy to show that the great religious schism of the Reformation was a necessary consequence of the interpretation of the same religious book by different races, the northern races themselves wish to explore their faith and regulate their lives, the southern nations have been left far behind in terms of independence and philosophical development. No example could be more convincing. But these are facts whose development would take us very far. We would have to devote even less space to the other two basic elements of civilization, institutions and language, because it would be necessary to go into technical details that would be too far beyond the limits of this work. What is true of beliefs is equally true of institutions, these latter cannot be transmitted from one people to another without being changed. Without wishing to bore the reader with a mass of examples, I ask him simply to pay attention to the extent to which in modern times the same institutions, imposed by force or belief, change in different races, even though they retain the same names. I showed this in the previous chapter by the example of the various countries of America. Institutions in reality constitute only a consequence of necessities on which the will of one generation can have no effect. For every race and for every phase of that race's development there are conditions of existence, feelings, thoughts, opinions, hereditary influences which presuppose some institutions and exclude others. Governmental labels mean very little. It has never been given to any people to choose the institutions that seemed best to them. If a very rare occasion allows him to choose them, he does not know how to preserve them. The numerous revolutions, the incessant changes of constitutions to which the French have been indulging for a century, constitute an experience which should have long ago developed in the people of the state a certain view on this subject. I think, however, that only in the minds of the dark masses and in the narrow mind of some fanatics is it still possible to hold the idea that important social changes can be made by decrees. The only useful role of institutions is to give legal sanction to changes that have already been accepted by mores and public opinion. They follow these changes, but do not precede them. It is not by institutions that the character and thought of the people are changed. It is not by them that one can make a people religious or skeptical, to teach them to govern themselves instead of ceaselessly demanding from the state measures to restrain them. I will not dwell at length on languages, I will only remind you that even when a language is already established thanks to writing, it necessarily changes, passing from one people to another, and this is what makes the idea of a universal language so ridiculous. Less than two centuries after the conquest, the Gauls, in spite of their immeasurable numerical superiority, adopted a Latin language, but this language the people soon modified according to their needs and the particular logic of their mind. From these modifications the modern French language finally emerged. Different races cannot speak the same language for a long time. Accidents of conquest, commercial interests may, no doubt, lead some people to adopt a foreign language instead of their own, but within a few generations the borrowed language is completely transformed. The deeper the transformation will be, the more the race from which the language was borrowed differs from that which borrowed it. One can always find dissimilar languages in countries where different races exist. India provides a shining example of this. The Great Peninsula is inhabited by very many and very different races, scholars number their 240 languages, some of which differ from each other far more than Greek from French. 240 languages, not to mention almost 300 dialects. Among these languages, the most widely spoken is the most recent, because it has not existed for more than three centuries. It is Hindustani, formed by combining Persian and Arabic both spoken by the Muslim conquerors, with Hindustani, one of the most widely spoken languages of the conquered countries. The conquerors and the conquered soon forgot their primitive language in order to speak a new language adapted to the needs of the new race formed by the interbreeding of the various peoples living together. I cannot dwell longer on this matter and am compelled to confine myself to an indication of the main ideas. 
If I could go into the necessary details, I would go further and show that when peoples are different, the words which we consider to be unambiguous represent in reality such distant ways of thinking and feeling from each other, that a quite correct translation from one language to another is impossible. It is easy to see how, over the course of several centuries in one and the same country, in one and the same race, the same word corresponds to completely dissimilar concepts. Ancient words represent the concepts of people of an earlier time. Words, which in the beginning were signs of real things, soon lost their meaning because of changes in ideas, morals and customs. People continue to reason with the help of these habitual signs, which would be too difficult to change, but there is no longer any correspondence between what they represented at the moment and what they signify at the present time. When it comes to peoples very distant from us, belonging to civilizations that bear no resemblance to our own, translations can only yield words completely devoid of their real original meaning, that is, evoking in our minds ideas that are not in any connection with those which they once evoked. This phenomenon is especially striking in the ancient languages of India. With this people, Hindus, with fluctuating ideas, whose logic has no kinship with ours, words have never had the exact and definite meaning which they were finally given in Europe by the ages and the fold of our mind. There are books, such as the Vedas, of which no translation is possible. To penetrate into the thought of the individuals with whom we live, but from whom we are separated by certain differences in age, in sex, in upbringing, is already very difficult. To penetrate into the thought of races over which the dust of centuries hangs is a labor that no scientist will ever be able to accomplish. All the knowledge available to us serves only to show the utter futility of such attempts. However brief and underdeveloped the preceding examples may be, they are quite sufficient to show what profound changes the elements of civilization undergo in the peoples who borrow them. Borrowing often seems considerable, because in name it is sometimes very reliefful, but the assimilation of it is always in reality very insignificant. With the centuries, through the slow work of generations and through gradual additions, the borrowed element differs greatly from its original prototype. With these gradual changes history, which is interested mainly in appearances, does not count at all, and when it tells us, for example, that some people adopted a new religion, we immediately imagine not those beliefs, which were actually adopted by them, but exactly that religion, which is known to us at the present time. It takes a deep study of these slow adaptations to understand their genesis well and to grasp the distinctions that separate words from essences. So the history of civilization consists of slow adaptations, of insignificant gradual changes. If they seem sudden and significant to us, it is because, as in geology, we skip the intermediate phases and consider only the extreme ones. In reality, no matter how advanced and gifted a people may be, its ability to assimilate this or that new element of civilization is always very limited. Brain cells cannot assimilate to themselves in a day what took centuries to create, and what has been adapted to the senses and needs of completely different organisms. Slow hereditary acquisitions alone allow for such assimilations. When we turn to the study of the evolution of art in the most developed of the peoples of antiquity, the Greeks, we see that it took him many centuries to emerge from the crude imitations of the Assyrian and Egyptian models and in successive stages to reach the masterpieces which still amaze mankind to this day. And yet all the peoples who have followed one another in history, with the exception of certain primitive peoples, such as the Egyptians and the Chaldeans, have done nothing but assimilate the elements of civilization that constitute the legacy of the past, changing them according to their mental disposition. The development of civilizations would have been incomparably slower, and the history of different peoples would have been only an eternal repetition, if they had not been able to use the materials worked out before them. The civilizations created seven or eight thousand years ago by the inhabitants of Egypt and Chaldea formed a source of materials to which all nations in turn came to draw. Greek art was born from the art created on the banks of the Tigris and the Nile. From the Greek style came the Roman style, which in turn, mixed with Oriental influences, gave rise successively to the Byzantine, Romanesque and Gothic styles, 
varying according to the genius and age of the peoples from whom they arose, but all having a common origin. What we have just said about art applies to all the elements of civilization, institutions, languages, and beliefs. European languages are derived from a common foretongue once spoken on the Central Asian Plateau. Our law is the offspring of Roman law, which in turn was born of prior law. Our sciences themselves would not be what they are now without the slow work of the ages. The great founders of modern astronomy, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, are in connection with Ptolemy, whose works served as manuals until the 15th century. Ptolemy is connected through the Alexandrian school with the Egyptians and the Chaldeans. Thus we see, in spite of the terrible gaps with which the history of civilization is full, the slow evolution of our knowledge, which makes us ascend through the centuries and empires to the dawn of these ancient civilizations, the latter which modern science now tries to connect with the primitive times, when mankind had no history yet. But if the source is common, the changes, progressive or regressive, to which the borrowed elements have been subjected by each people according to its psychological disposition, are very different. The history of these changes constitutes the history of civilizations. We have just shown that the basic elements out of which a civilization is formed are individual to each people, that they constitute not only the result but even the expression of the structure of its soul, and cannot, therefore, pass from one race to another without undergoing very profound changes. We have also seen that the magnitude of these changes is masked on the one hand by the linguistic needs which force us to denote with the same words completely different things, and on the other by the inevitable shortcomings of historical works which draw our attention only to the extreme forms of civilization and do not show us the intermediate forms which connect them. Passing in the next chapter to the general laws of the evolution of the arts, we shall be able to show even more clearly the sequence of changes occurring in the basic elements of any civilization as they pass from one people to another. Chapter 4 How the Arts Are Transformed Applying the above principles to the study of the evolution of the arts in Oriental peoples. Egypt The religious ideas from which its art derives. What its art became after it was transferred to the different races, the Ethiopians, the Greeks, and the Persians. The primitive low level of Greek art. The slowness of its development. The adoption and development in Persia of Greek, Egyptian, and Assyrian art. The transformations experienced by art depend on race, but in no way on religious beliefs. Examples represented by the great changes which Arabian art has undergone in dependence on races which have embraced Islam. Application of our principles to the change in the origin and development of Hindu art. India and Greece drew from the same source, but in view of the difference of the races they came to arts which have no kinship. The tremendous changes to which architecture in India has been subjected, according to the races that inhabited it, and in spite of the similarity of the beliefs. In examining the relations connecting the soul of a known people with its institutions, beliefs, and language, I have had to confine myself to brief notes on the subject. It would be necessary to write volumes to cover such questions in a comprehensive way. As far as art is concerned, a clear and precise account is incomparably easier. Institutions and beliefs are things of dubious certainty and very difficult to explain. One has to study the entities that change with each age and hide behind dead texts, to devote oneself entirely to argumentation and criticism, in order to arrive at controversial conclusions in the end. In contrast, works of art, especially monuments, are very definite and easy to interpret. The stone books are the clearest of all books, the only ones that never lie, and on this account I accord them a leading place in my works on the history of the civilizations of the East. I have always had a great distrust of literary documents. They are often misleading and rarely teach. A monument never deceives and always teaches. It best preserves the thought of vanished peoples. One should regret the mental blindness of specialists who wish to find only inscriptions on them. So we will briefly examine how the arts are an expression of a people's state of mind and how they are transformed as they move from one civilization to another. In this study I will deal only with Eastern art. 
the genesis and transformation of European art obeyed the same laws, but to show its evolution in the various peoples, it would be necessary to enter into details which the extremely narrow limits of this study do not permit. Let us take first the art of Egypt, and see what it once became, passing successively to three different races, the Negroes of Ethiopia, the Greeks, and the Persians. Of all the civilizations that have ever flourished on the globe, the civilization of Egypt has been most fully expressed in its art. It expressed itself in it with such force and clarity that the artistic types born on the banks of the Nile could only be suitable for Egypt alone and be adopted by other peoples only after they had undergone considerable change. Egyptian art, especially architecture, is the expression of a particular ideal, which in the course of fifty centuries was constantly interested in all the people. Egypt dreamed of making man an incorruptible dwelling in view of his ephemeral existence. This race, contrary to so many others, despised life and cherished the thought of death. Most of all it was concerned with the motionless mummy who, with its enameled eyes and its golden mask, perpetually contemplated the mysterious hieroglyphs in the depths of its dark dwelling. Fearing no profanity in their coffin house, huge as a palace, among the endless corridors painted and covered with statues, these mummies found here everything that enticed man during his short earthly existence. Dungeons were dug for them, obelisks, pylons and pyramids were erected, and pensive colossi were hewn for them, sitting with an expression of calmness and grandeur on their stone thrones. Everything is solid and massive in this architecture because it's sought to be eternal. If of all the peoples of antiquity we knew only the Egyptians, we might after all assert that art is the truest expression of the racial soul which created it. Very different peoples, the Ethiopians, the lowest race, the Greeks and the Persians, the highest race, borrowed their art either from Egypt alone, or partly from Egypt, partly from Assyria. Let us see what it became in their hands. Let us first take the lowest of the nations we have just named, the Ethiopians. It is known that in a very early era of Egyptian history, Ziv dynasty, the peoples of Sudan, taking advantage of the anarchy and decline of Egypt, took possession of some of its provinces and founded a kingdom, which had successively as its capital Mapeda and Mero and maintained its independence for many centuries. Blinded by the civilization of the vanquished, they tried to imitate their monuments and art, but these imitations, of which we have specimens, are for the most part crude, debased statues. These Negroes were barbarians, their underdeveloped brains condemned them to stagnation, and indeed, in spite of the civilizing influence of the Egyptians, which continued for many centuries, they never emerged from barbarism. There is no example, either in ancient or modern history, of any Negro tribe rising to a certain level of civilization, whenever, by one of those accidents which in ancient times occurred in Ethiopia, and in our days in Haiti, a high civilization fell into the hands of a Negro race, that civilization quickly took a very deplorable form. Another race, then also barbarous but white, the Greek race borrowed the first examples of its art from Egypt and Assyria, and it too was at first confined to ugly imitations. The works of art of these two great civilizations were brought to her by the Phoenicians, then lords over the sea lanes connecting the shores of the Mediterranean, and by the peoples of Asia Minor, masters of the dry routes leading to Nineveh and Babylon. Everyone knows very well how far the Greeks eventually rose above their examples. But the discoveries of modern archaeology have also proved how crude their first obfuscated statues were, and that it took them centuries to reach the masterpieces that won them immortality. It took the Greeks some 700 years to produce original art which left foreign art behind them, but the progress they made in the last century is greater than that of all the centuries before. It takes the longest time for any people to pass, not the higher stages of civilization, but the lower ones. The most ancient works of Greek art, those of the treasury at Mycenae, dating from the 12th century B.C., reveal entirely barbarous experiments, crude copies of oriental specimens, six centuries later the art also remains oriental, Apollo of the Shadow and Apollo of Orchomena are extremely similar to Egyptian statues but soon the progress becomes very rapid, and a century later we meet Phidias and the marvelous statues of Parthenon, that is, 
art freed from its oriental origin and standing far above the specimens by which it had been inspired for so long. The same was true of architecture, though the stages of its development are more difficult to ascertain. We do not know what the palaces of the Homeric poems might have been like around the 9th century BC, but the copper walls, the multicolored roofs, the gold and silver animals guarding the gates, make us involuntarily think of Assyrian palaces lined with bronze planks and enameled bricks and guarded with carved bowls. At any rate, we know that the type of the most ancient Doric Greek columns, which apparently go back to the 7th century, can be found in Egypt, at Karnak and at Beni Hassan, that the Ionic column borrowed many of its parts from Assyria, but we also know that from these foreign elements, first superimposed on each other, then merged and finally transformed, new columns, quite different from their primitive examples, arose. At the other end of the ancient world Persia shows us an example of similar borrowing and development, but a development which did not have time to reach its apogee because it was abruptly stopped by foreign conquest. Persia did not have seven centuries like Greece, but only two centuries to create art for itself. The only nation, the Arabs, has so far managed to develop original art in such a short time. The history of Persian civilization begins only with Cyrus and his successors, who in five centuries BC managed to take possession of Babylon and Egypt, the two great centers of civilization which then illuminated the Eastern world with their glory. The Greeks, who were to dominate in their turn, did not count then. The Persian Empire made itself the center of civilization until it was overthrown by Alexander, who moved at the same time, the center of world civilization. Possessing no art, the Persians, after taking possession of Egypt and Babylonia, borrowed artists and examples of art from them. Their power lasted only two centuries, so they had no time to change deeply the art they had inherited, but when these conquerors in turn were conquered, they had already begun to transform it. The ruins of Persepolis, still standing today, tell us the genesis of these transformations. We find there an undoubted mixture, or rather layering, of Egyptian and Assyrian art, mixed with some Greek elements, but new elements, namely the tall Persepolitan column with double-headed capitals, are already shown there and allow us to predict that, had the Persians not had such a limited time of domination, this superior race would have produced an art as original, if not as high, as the Greek. Proof of this can be seen in the Persian monuments found ten centuries later. After the Achaemenid dynasty, overthrown by Alexander, the Seleucid dynasty succeeded, then the Arsacid dynasty, and finally the Sassanid dynasty, overthrown in the 7th century by the Arabs. When Persia again began to build monuments, they bore the unmistakable stamp of originality which stemmed from the combination of Arab art with the ancient Achaemenid architecture, modified by the combination with the Hellenistic art of the Arsacids giant portals over the entire height of the façade, enameled bricks, lancet vaults, etc. It was this new art that the Mughals subsequently transferred to India, having previously transformed it in their own way. In the preceding examples we find different stages of transformation, which one people can make in the art of another, depending on their race and the time they have at their disposal for this transformation. In the lower race, the Ethiopians, which had centuries at its disposal, but had very little psychological development, we have seen that the art borrowed was reduced to an inferior form. In the race high and having centuries at its disposal, the Greeks, we have observed a complete transformation of the ancient art into a new, considerably higher one. In another race, the Persians, less developed than the Greeks and having a short time, we found a great capacity for adaptation and the rudiments of transformation. But besides the examples, for the most part remote, which we have just given, there are others, much more modern, which show the magnitude of the changes which this or that race has to make in the art which it has borrowed. These examples are all the more typical because in this case we are talking about peoples professing the same religion, but of different origins. When in the 7th century AD the Arabs took possession of the biggest part of the old Greco-Roman world and founded a gigantic empire, stretching from Spain to Central Asia, occupying the whole north of Africa, they came face to face with a very particular architecture, Byzantine. 
From the beginning they adopted it in its entirety, both in Spain and in Egypt and Syria, to build their mosques. The Mosque of Omar at Jerusalem, the Mosque of Amru at Cairo, and other monuments still standing testify to this borrowing. But this did not last long, and we see how the monuments have changed from country to country, from century to century. In my history of the civilization of the Arabs I have shown the origin of these changes. They are so significant that there is not the slightest resemblance between such a monument of the beginning of the conquest as the Amru Mosque at Cairo, 1742, and the Cape Bay Mosque, 1468, of the end of the Great Arab Era. I have shown by my explanations and drawings that in different countries subject to the law of Islam in Spain, in Africa, in Syria, Persia, any of the monuments have such great differences that it is quite impossible to connect them under a common name, as can be done, for example, in relation to Gothic monuments, which, despite all their differences, show a clear resemblance. These radical differences in the architecture of Muslim countries cannot depend on differences in religion, for in this case the religion is the same, they depend on racial differences which affect the development of art as deeply as they affect the fortunes of empire. If this statement is true, then we must find very dissimilar monuments in the same country inhabited by different races, despite the same beliefs and unity of political power. This is precisely what is observed in India. In India it is easiest to find examples suitable to prove the general principles set forth in this work, and for this reason I constantly return to it. The Great Peninsula is the most instructive and the most philosophical of historical books. It is really the only country where one can travel through time at will and see still alive the whole series of successive stages that humanity had to pass through to reach the highest stages of civilization. All forms of development can be found in India, both the Stone Age and the Age of Electricity have their representatives there. Nowhere can the role of the major factors governing the origin and development of civilizations be better seen. Applying the principles developed in this work, I have tried in another to solve a problem that has long remained unsolved, the origin of Hindu art. Since this work is very little known and constitutes an interesting application of my ideas concerning the psychology of races, we shall cite here the most essential lines from it. From the point of view of art, India appears in history only very late. Its most ancient monuments, such as the columns of Ahsoka, the temples of Karli, Rarit, Sanchi, etc., go back scarcely to the 3rd century BC. When they were built, most of the old civilizations of the ancient world, those of Egypt, Persia and Assyria, and even Greece itself, had finished their development and were sinking into the gloom of decay. A single civilization, the Roman one, replaced all others. The world knew only one ruler. India, which emerged so late from the gloom of history, could therefore borrow much from the civilizations which had preceded it, but the deep isolation in which it was always thought to have lived, and the remarkable originality of its monuments without any apparent kinship with all those which had preceded them, have long led us to reject any hypothesis of foreign borrowing. From the point of undeniable originality the first monuments of India exhibited such a height of execution, above which they have never risen again. Works of such perfection were preceded by long groping, but in spite of the most painstaking research, not one of her statues, not one of her monuments, has revealed a trace of these wanderings. The recent discovery in certain isolated countries of the northwestern part of the peninsula of fragments of statues and monuments, showing undoubted Greek influences, has finally convinced Indianists that India borrowed her art from Greece. The application of the above principles and a deeper study of most of the monuments still existing in India led me to a very different decision. India, in my opinion, in spite of its accidental contact with Greek civilization, did not borrow any of its arts from it and could not have done so. The two races in contact were too different, their thoughts too dissimilar, their artistic genius too distinctive, to enable them to influence one another. A study of the ancient monuments scattered over India shows us directly that there is no kinship between her art and the Greek. Whereas our European monuments are full of elements borrowed from Greek art, the monuments of India present us with none. 
the most superficial examination shows that we are dealing here with quite different races, and that perhaps there have never been more dissimilar geniuses, I would even say more opposed to each other, than the Greek and the Hindu. This general notion only becomes clearer when one delves more deeply into the study of the monuments of India and the intimate psychology of the peoples who created them. One soon notices that the Hindu genius is too individual to submit to an alien influence too inconsistent with its own thought. This foreign influence may, no doubt, be imposed, but, however long it lasts, it remains entirely superficial and fragile. There seems to be as high a barrier between the mental disposition of the various races of India and other nations as the terrible obstacles created by nature between the Great Peninsula and the other countries of the globe. The Hindu genius is so original that whatever subject he has to borrow, that subject is immediately transformed and becomes Hindu. Even in architecture, where it is difficult to conceal the borrowings, the individuality of this peculiar genius, this capacity for rapid distortion is very soon apparent. One can, of course, make a Hindu architect copy a Greek column, but one cannot prevent him from modifying it into a column which at a glance will be mistaken for a Hindu one. Even in these days, when European influence is so strong in India, such modifications are seen daily. Give a Hindu artist to copy any European specimen, he will take from it only the general form, but exaggerate some parts, multiply, beforehand, the ornamental details, and the second or third copy will entirely lose its Western character, to become exclusively Hindu. The main feature of Hindu architecture, as well as of literature, is the extreme exaggeration, the infinite profusion of detail, the complexity which is just the opposite of the correct and cold simplicity of Greek art. Studying the art of India, one can best understand the extent to which the plastic works of a known race are in connection with its state of mind and constitute the clearest language for those who are able to interpret it. If the Hindus, like the Assyrians, had completely disappeared from history, the bar-leafs of their temples, their statues and monuments would be sufficient to reveal to us their past. In particular they would have told us that the methodical and lucid mind of the Greeks could never have had the slightest influence on the unbridled and unmethodical imagination of the Hindus. They would also explain to us why Greek influence in India could only be temporary and limited always to the area where it was imposed for a short time. The archaeological study of the monuments has enabled us to confirm with precise documentation what the general knowledge of the monuments of India and of the Hindu spirit reveals directly. It has enabled us to ascertain the curious fact that the Hindu sovereigns, being in relations with the Ars Acids the kings of Persia, whose civilization bore the strong imprint of Hellenism, many times and especially in the first two centuries of our era wanted to introduce Greek art into India, but never succeeded in doing so. This borrowed art, completely official and without any connection with the spirit of the people to whom it was brought, always disappeared along with the political influences that brought it into the world. Such transplantation, however, was too repugnant to the Hindu genius to have, even in the period in which it was imposed, any influence on national art. Indeed, in the monuments of that time and in the later ones, such as the numerous underground temples, no trace of Greek influences can be found. On the other hand, they are themselves too distinctive to be unrecognizable. Besides proportionality, which is always characteristic, there are also technical details, especially the art of drapery, immediately revealing the hand of the Greek artist. The disappearance of Greek art in India was as sudden as its appearance, and this very suddenness shows to what extent it was an imported art, officially imposed, without any kinship with the people who were to receive it. The arts never completely disappear from any people, they are transformed and the new art always borrows something from the one it is replacing. Suddenly coming to India, Greek art suddenly vanished from there, and has had as little influence there as the European monuments built by the English two centuries ago. The present lack of influence of European art in India, in spite of more than a century of unrestricted domination, can be compared to the negligible influence of Greek art 18 centuries ago. It cannot be denied that there is some irreconcilability of aesthetic sensibilities here, for Muslim art, though as foreign as European art, 
has caused imitations in all parts of the peninsula. Even where Muslims have never exercised any power, it is rare to find a temple which does not contain some motifs of Arabic ornamentation. No doubt, as in the remote era of King Kanishk, we see nowadays that Rajas like Gwalior, enticed by the grandeur of foreign power, build themselves palaces in the Greco-Latin style, but, as in the time of Kanishk, such official art, piled on top of native art, remains without any influence on this latter. So, Greek art and Hindu art once existed side by side, just as European art and Hindu art do nowadays, but never influenced each other. As regards purely Hindu monuments, there is not a single one among them of which it can be said that it presents in whole or in detail the remotest resemblance to the Greek monument. This impotence of Greek art to take root in India is something astonishing, and must of course be ascribed to the irreconcilability between the souls of the two races which we have mentioned, but not to the innate inability of India to assimilate foreign art for she was perfectly able to assimilate and transform arts which agreed with her state of mind. The archaeological documents that we have been able to collect prove that India sought the beginning of its art in fact in Persia, but not in the slightly Hellenistic Persia of the time of the Ars Acids, but in Persia, the heir of the ancient civilizations of Assyria and Egypt. We know that when, 330 BC, Alexander overthrew the dynasty of the Achaemenid kings, the Persians had had a brilliant civilization for two centuries. Of course they did not find a formula for any new art, but the mixture of Egyptian and Assyrian which they inherited produced remarkable works. We can judge them by the ruins of Persepolis which are still extant. They're the pylons of Egypt, the winged bulls of Assyria, and even some Greek elements show us that all the arts of the great preceding civilizations converged in this limited region of Asia. To Persia India came to draw, but in reality drew from the arts of Chaldea and Egypt, which Persia alone borrowed. The study of the monuments of India reveals to us what borrowings they owe to their coming into being, but to ascertain these borrowings we must turn to the most ancient monuments, the Hindu soul is original to such an extent that borrowed things, to adapt themselves to its notions, must undergo very great changes, after which they soon become unrecognizable. Why did India, which proved so incapable of borrowing anything from Greece, in contrast prove so capable of borrowing from Persia? Obviously, Persian art suited her state of mind, whereas Greek art did not agree with it at all. The simple forms, the surfaces with the lowly ornamentation of the Greek monuments could not appeal to the Hindu spirit, while the refined forms, the abundance of ornaments, the richness of the ornamentation of the Persian monuments must have enticed it. However, it was not only in that distant era before our era that Persia, the representative of Egypt and Assyria, influenced India with its art. When, many centuries afterwards, the Moslems came to the peninsula, their civilization, in the course of its passage through Persia, was deeply imbued with Persian elements, and what it brought to India was chiefly Persian art, which still bore the trace of its old Assyrian traditions, continued by the Achaemenid kings. The giant doors of the mosques, and especially the enameled bricks covering them, are signs of the Chaldeo Assyrian civilization. This art India was still able to assimilate, because it was in harmony with the spirit of her race, whereas the old Greek and the modern European, which were deeply opposed to her way of feeling and thinking, had always remained unaffected. So, not to Greece, as archaeologists still maintain, but to Egypt and Assyria through the mediation of Persia India adjoined. India took nothing from Greece, but both drew from the same source, the common treasury, the foundation of all civilizations, worked out over the centuries by the peoples of Egypt and Chaldea. Greece borrowed from it through the medium of the Phoenicians and the peoples of Asia Minor, India, through the medium of Persia. Greek and Hindu civilizations thus go back to a common source but in both these countries the currents that emerged from that source soon diverged deeply according to the spirit of each race. But if, as we have already said, art is in close connection with the mental condition of a race, and if on this ground the same art, borrowed by dissimilar races, takes at once entirely different forms, we must meet in India, inhabited by very diverse races, entirely different arts, architectural styles without the slightest resemblance, notwithstanding the same beliefs.
an examination of the monuments of the various regions shows to what extent this is indeed the case. The differences between the monuments are so profound that we could only classify them by country, i.e. by race, but not at all by the religion to which the people who built them belong. There is no resemblance between the monuments of northern India and those of southern India, erected in the same epoch by peoples professing the same religion. Even during Muslim domination, i.e., the period when the political unity of India was most complete, the purely Muslim monuments have profound differences in different areas. The mosques of Ahmedabad, Lagore, Agra, Bijapur, though dedicated to the same cult, represent only a very faint affinity, even much less than that which links a Renaissance monument with those of the Gothic period. Not only does architecture differ in India from one race to another, but sculpture also varies in different areas, both in the types represented and especially in the manner in which they are rendered. Compare the bar-reliefs and statues of Sanchi with the almost simultaneous bar-reliefs and statues of Rarit, and the difference is already evident. It is even greater when comparing the bar-reliefs and statues of the province of Orissa with the bar-reliefs and statues of Bayandokhand, or even the statues of Mysore with the statues of large pagodas of South India. The influence of race can be seen everywhere. It is reflected, among other things, in the smallest artistic objects, everyone knows how different they are from one another in the different parts of India. It does not take a very experienced eye to distinguish a carved wooden chest from that of Mysore, or from that of Guzra, or to distinguish a precious thing from the coast of Orissa from a precious thing from the coast of Bombay. There is no doubt that the architecture of India, like that of all Eastern nations, is predominantly religious, but however great the religious influence may be, especially in the East, the influence of race is still greater. This racial soul, which guides the destiny of peoples, also guides their beliefs, institutions, and arts, whatever element of civilization we study, we will always find it in it. It is the only force that no other can surpass. It represents the weight of thousands of generations, the synthesis of their thought. Section 3. How the Psychological Traits of Races Change Chapter 1. The Role of Ideas in the Development of Civilizations There are always very few guiding ideas in every civilization. The extreme slowness of their emergence and disappearance. Ideas influence behavior only after they have been transformed into feelings. They participate then in the formation of character. Due to the slowness of ideas, civilizations have a certain stability. How ideas are established. The effect of reasoning on the masses is utterly negligible. The effect of affirmation and prestige. The role of the convinced and the apostles. The distortion experienced by ideas as they descend into the masses. A commonly accepted idea acts soon on all elements of civilization. Because of the commonality of ideas, the people of each age have a certain stock of average notions which makes them very similar in their thoughts and in their deeds. The yoke of custom and public opinion. It diminishes only in critical epochs of history, when old ideas have lost their influence and have not yet been replaced by new ones, this critical epoch is the only time when a contestation of opinions can be tolerated. Dogmas are held only under the condition that there is no criticism. Peoples cannot change their ideas and their dogmas without being immediately forced to change their civilization. Having shown that the psychological traits of races are of great stability, and that the history of peoples derives from these traits, we have added that psychological elements may, like those of anatomy, have been transformed by slow hereditary accumulations toward the end. Much of the development of civilization depends on these changes. The factors that can cause psychological change are quite varied. They include, needs, the struggle for existence, the action of a known environment, the progress of knowledge and in industry, education, beliefs, etc. I have already devoted an entire volume to their study, and will not now treat of this subject in detail, but will return to it only in order to show the mechanism of their action, to which the present and the following chapters will be devoted. 
A study of the various civilizations that have followed one another from the beginning of the world shows that a very small number of basic ideas have always played a leading role in their development. If the history of peoples were reduced to the history of their ideas, it would never be very long. When any civilization has managed in a century or two to produce basic ideas in the arts, sciences, literature, and philosophy, it may be regarded as exceptionally brilliant. We already know that the course of any civilization derives chiefly from the character, that is, from the hereditary feelings of the people from whom that civilization has manifested itself. We have also seen that these hereditary feelings are of great durability, but that they may be changed by various factors in the end. In the line between these factors last must be placed the influence of ideas. But ideas can have a real effect on the soul of peoples only when, after a very slow development, they have descended from the mobile spheres of thought into that stable and unconscious area of feeling where the motives of our actions are developed. They then constitute in some way a part of character and can influence behavior. When ideas have already undergone this slow development, their power is very considerable, because reason ceases to have power over them. The convinced man, over whom any idea, religious or otherwise, dominates, is not prepared for reasoning, no matter how sound it may be. All he can try is to introduce, by means of artificial thought techniques and often through very great distortions, the idea which refutes it into the circle of the concepts which dominate him. If ideas can have an influence only after they have slowly descended from the conscious spheres into the sphere of the unconscious, it is not difficult to understand the slowness with which they must change, and why the guiding ideas of any civilization are so few and take so long to develop. We should rejoice that this is so, for otherwise civilizations could have no durability. It is also fortunate that new ideas can eventually force their acceptance, for if the old ideas remain completely immobile, civilizations could make no progress whatsoever. In view of the slowness of our mental changes, it takes many human generations to allow new ideas to prevail and many more human generations to make them disappear. The most civilized nations are those whose guiding ideas have managed to keep an equal distance from variability and stability. History is littered with the remains of those who were unable to maintain this balance. Thus, it is easy to see why, in studying the history of peoples, what is most striking is not the richness or novelty of their ideas, but, on the contrary, the extreme poverty of these ideas, the slowness of their change and the power they have. Civilizations are the results of certain basic ideas, when by chance these ideas change, the civilizations they nurture are condemned to change soon. The Middle Ages lived by two basic ideas, religious and feudal. From these two ideas flowed their art, literature, and their notions of life. In the Renaissance both these ideas changed slightly, the ideal found in the ancient Greco-Latin world is embraced by Europe, and soon the concept of life, art, philosophy and literature begin to be transformed. Then the authority of tradition begins to waver, scientific truths replace gradually revealed truth, and again civilization is transformed. At the present time the old religious ideas have clearly finally lost much of their power, and in consequence of this one thing all the social institutions that had relied on it threatened to collapse. The story of the origin of ideas, their domination, their survival, their transformation, and their disappearance can only be convincingly told when supported by numerous examples. If we could go into detail, we would show that every element of civilization, philosophy, religion, art, literature, etc., is subject to a very small number of guiding ideas whose development is extremely slow. The sciences themselves do not escape this law. All physics derives from the idea of conservation of energy, all biology from the idea of transformism, changeability, all medicine from the idea of the action of infinitesimals, and the history of these ideas shows that although the latter appeal to the most enlightened minds, they are established only little by little and with difficulty. In our time, when everything goes so quickly, and moreover in the field of research, where no longer speaks neither passions nor interests, to establish a basic scientific idea requires at least 25 years. 
the clearest, easiest to prove ideas that should have given the least cause for controversy, example, the idea of circulation, took no less time. Whether it be scientific, artistic, philosophical, religious, in a word, whatever the idea, its dissemination is always done in the same way. It must first be accepted by a small number of apostles, to whom the power of their faith or the authority of their name gives great prestige. They then act more by suggestion than by evidence. It is not in the dignity of any proof that one should look for the essential elements of the mechanism of persuasion. They inspire their ideas by the prestige they possess or by appealing to their passions, but it is impossible to produce any effect if they appeal only to reason. The masses never allow themselves to be persuaded by proofs, but only by assertions, and the authority of these assertions depends on the charm with which the one who makes them speaks. When the apostles have already managed to convince a small circle of their disciples and have thus formed new apostles, the new idea begins to enter the field of controversy. It first raises general opposition against itself, because it greatly offends many old and established things. The apostles who defend it are naturally aroused by this opposition, which convinces them only of their superiority over the rest of the people, and they defend with energy the new idea, not because it is true, more often than not they know nothing of this, but simply because they have accepted it. The new idea is then discussed more and more, i.e., actually accepted without reservation by some and rejected without reservation by others. Assertions and denials are exchanged and very few arguments are made, since they cannot serve as the only motives of acceptance or rejection of an idea for the vast majority of people, as motives of feeling, in which reasoning can play no part. Thanks to this always passionate debate, the idea progresses very slowly. New generations, seeing it challenged, tend to accept it by virtue of the mere fact that it is challenged. For young people, always thirsty for independence, total opposition to accepted ideas represents the most accessible form for them to show their originality. So the idea continues to grow, and soon it will no longer need any support. Its dissemination will now be accomplished everywhere by the mere act of imitation, by contagion, an ability of which humans in general are endowed to the same degree as great apes. From the time the mechanism of contagion intervenes, the idea enters a phase that leads it quickly to success. Public opinion soon accepts it. It then acquires a pervasive and irresistible force that subdues all minds, creating, at the same time, a special atmosphere, a general manner of thinking. Like a fine dust that penetrates everywhere, it slips into all the concepts and mental products of a known era. The idea and the conclusions from the notion are then part of that stock of inherited platitudes that are imposed on us by our upbringing. It has triumphed and entered the realm of feeling, which henceforth shields it for a long time from all encroachment. Of the various ideas which guide civilization, some, such as those concerning art or philosophy, remain in the highest strata, others, especially those concerning religious and political notions, sometimes descend into the depths of the masses. The latter usually reach their highly distorted, but when they have succeeded in penetrating there, the power they have over the primitive, incapable of reasoning, is enormous. The idea is then something invincible, and its consequences spread with the swiftness of a stream that no dam can hold back. This is when those great events erupt that create historical upheavals and which only the masses can accomplish. It was not scientists, artists or philosophers who founded the new religions that ruled the world, nor the vast empires that stretched from one hemisphere to the other, nor the great religious and political revolutions that overturned Europe, but people absorbed enough by a known idea to sacrifice their lives to spread it. With this very insignificant baggage in theory but very strong in practice, the nomads of the Arabian deserts conquered parts of the ancient Greco-Roman world and founded one of the greatest empires history has ever known. With a similar moral baggage, a devotion to the idea, the heroic soldiers of the convention victoriously repelled a coalition of armed Europe. A strong conviction is invincible until it meets an equally strong conviction the latter can fight against the former with a chance of victory. Faith has no other more serious enemy than belief. 
it is assured of victory when the physical force that is arrayed against it serves weak feelings and weakened beliefs. But if it is confronted by an equally strong faith, the struggle becomes very lively, and success is then decided by chance circumstances, mostly of a moral order, such as the spirit of discipline and better organization. With a closer acquaintance with the history of the Arabs just discussed, we would notice that in their first victories, and these victories are always both the most difficult and the most important, they met morally very weak opponents, although their military organization was quite high. At first the Arabs directed their weapons against Syria. There they found only Byzantine troops, formed of mercenaries, small enough to sacrifice themselves for any cause. Encouraged by a living faith which increased their strength, they dispersed these troops without an ideal, just as once a handful of Greeks, inspired by love for their country, dispersed the numerous hordes of Xerxes. The outcome of their enterprise would have been quite different had they faced the Roman cohorts a few centuries earlier. History proves by numerous examples that when equally powerful moral forces clash with each other, it is always the better organized who prevail. The Van Deans must have had a very lively faith, they were very strongly convinced men, on the other hand, the soldiers of the convention also had very strong convictions, but because they were militarily better organized, they prevailed. In religion, as in politics, success always belongs to the believers, but never to the skeptics, and if at present it seems that the future belongs to the socialists, despite the apparent immaturity of their teachings, it is only because they alone fervently believe in the salvific nature of their ideals. The modern ruling classes have lost faith in the fruitfulness of their activities. They do not believe in anything, not even in the possibility of defending themselves against the threatening wave of barbarians surrounding them on all sides. When, after a more or less long period of wandering, remaking, propaganda, some idea has taken a definite form and penetrated the soul of the masses, it forms a dogma, that is, one of those absolute truths which are no longer disputed. It then forms part of those general beliefs on which the existence of peoples is based. Its universal character allows it then to play a predominant role. Great historical epics, such as the Age of Augustus or the Age of Louis XIV, are those in which ideas, having emerged from a period of wandering and discussion, are established and become the supreme rulers of human thought. They then become shining beacons, and everything they have to shine their light on takes on their coloring. From the time a new idea enters the world, it lays its stamp on the smallest elements of civilization, but for this idea to produce all its effects, it must always penetrate the soul of the masses. From the intellectual heights, where the idea has often originated, it descends from layer to layer, ceaselessly changing and transforming, until it assumes a form accessible to the popular soul, which will prepare its triumph. It may then be expressed in a few words, and sometimes even in one word, but this word evokes vivid images, both seductive and terrifying, and therefore always making a strong impression. Such are heaven and hell in the Middle Ages short words that have the magical power to answer everything and, for simple souls, to explain everything. The word socialism represents for the modern worker one of the magical synthetic formulas capable of dominating souls. It evokes, depending on the environment into which it has penetrated, different images, but usually strongly effective, despite their always rudimentary forms. For the French theorist, the word socialism evokes the idea of some kind of paradise where people are equal, just, good, and all who have become workers will enjoy perfect happiness under the patronage of the state. For the German worker, the evoked image appears as a smoky tavern, where the government offers huge pyramids of sausages and sauerkraut and endless pints of beer for free to everyone who comes. It is clear that none of these dreamers of sauerkraut and equality have bothered to find out the actual amount of things to be divided or the number of participants in the division. The peculiarity of this idea is that it is inculcated in an unconditional form against which all objections are powerless. When the idea is gradually transformed into a feeling and becomes a dogma, its triumph is ensured for a long period and all attempts to shake it would be in vain. Undoubtedly, the new idea, too, will eventually suffer the fate of the idea it has succeeded in replacing.
the idea will grow old and decay, but before it becomes completely unfit, it will have to undergo a series of regressive changes and strange distortions, which will take many generations to realize. Before it finally dies, it will long form part of old hereditary ideas, which are called prejudices, but which we, however, respect. An old idea, even when it is no more than a word, a sound, a mirage, will have a magical power that can still subjugate us to its influence. Thus holds this old legacy of outmoded ideas, opinions, conventions, which we reverently accept, though they would not withstand the slightest touch of criticism if we were to examine them. But how many people are capable of making sense of their own opinions, and how many opinions are there that can stand up to even the most superficial examination? It is better not to undertake this dreadful study. Fortunately, we are little inclined to do so. The critical spirit is the highest, very rare quality, while the imitative mind is a very common ability, the vast majority of people accept without criticism all established ideas, which he receives from public opinion and transmits to him the upbringing. Thus through heredity, upbringing, environment, imitation and public opinion people of every age and every race receive a certain amount of average ideas which make them similar to each other, and moreover to such an extent that when they already lie under the weight of the centuries we recognize the epoch in which they lived by their artistic, philosophical and literary works. Of course, it cannot be said that they made exact copies of each other but what they had in common the same ways of feeling and thinking will necessarily lead to very kindred works. We should be glad that this is the case, because this web of shared traditions, ideas, feelings, beliefs, ways of thinking, constitute the soul of a people. We have seen that this soul is the more stable the stronger this network is. In fact, it in it alone preserves the nations not being able to rupture without these nations immediately disintegrating. It constitutes at once their real strength and their real ruler. Sometimes Asian monarchs are imagined as despots who are guided by nothing but their fantasies. On the contrary, these fantasies are confined within extremely tight limits. Particularly in the East, the network of traditions is very strong. The religious traditions, so shaken in our country, have retained their strength there, and the most willful despot will never offend tradition and public opinion these two masters, which he knows to be much stronger than himself. Modern civilized man lives in one of those critical times in history when, because the old ideas from which his civilization derives have lost their power and new ones have not yet been formed, criticism is tolerated. He needs to be transported mentally to the ages of ancient civilizations, or only two or three centuries ago, to understand what the yoke of custom and public opinion was then, and to know how much moral courage the innovator had to have to attack these two forces. The Greeks, who, according to ignorant rednecks, enjoyed such freedom, were in reality subject to the yoke of public opinion and custom. Every citizen was surrounded by a network of unconditionally inviolable beliefs no one dared to think of challenging accepted ideas and obeyed them without protest. The Greek world knew no religious freedom, no freedom of private life, and no freedom at all. Athenian law did not even permit a citizen to live away from popular assemblies or not to participate in religious national festivals. The supposed freedom of the ancient world was only an unconscious and therefore perfect form of the total enslavement of the citizen to the yoke of the ideas of the city. In the state of universal warfare in the midst of which the world of that time lived, a society whose members possessed freedom of thought and action would not have survived a single day. The age of decline always began for the gods, institutions, and dogmas the day they were criticized. Since in modern civilizations the old ideas that served as the basis for custom and public opinion have been almost destroyed, their power over souls has become very weak. They have entered that phase of dilapidation in which the old idea already passes into a state of prejudice. As long as new ideas replace them, anarchy will reign in the mind. Only through this anarchy can criticism be tolerated. Writers, thinkers, and philosophers should bless the present age and hasten to take advantage of it, for we shall see no more of it. It may be an age of decline, 
but it is one of those rare moments in the history of the world when the expression of thought is free. The new dogmas which are about to be born cannot really be otherwise established than under the condition of avoiding any criticism and being as intolerant as those which have preceded them. Modern man is still looking for ideas that could serve as the basis for a future social order, and herein lies the danger for him. It is not revolutions, not wars the traces of their devastation are soon extinguished but changes in basic ideas that are important in the history of peoples and profoundly affect their destiny. They cannot take place without simultaneously condemning all elements of civilization to transformation. The real revolutions really dangerous to the existence of a known people are those that concern their thought. It is not so much dangerous for any people to adopt new ideas as it is for them to continually try out ideas, which they are inevitably doomed to do before they find one on which they can firmly ground a new social edifice designed to replace the old one. An idea is dangerous, however, not because it is wrong, but because long-term experiments are needed to see whether new ideas can adapt to the needs of the societies that adopt them. Unfortunately, their degree of usefulness can only become clear to the crowd through experience. History often shows us the cost of trying ideas inaccessible to a certain era, but it is not in history that man draws his lessons. Charlemagne tried in vain to restore the Roman Empire. The idea of universalism was not feasible then, and his cause perished with him, as the causes of Cromwell and Napoleon were to perish later. Philip II had fruitlessly expended his genius and the strength of Spain, then still predominant, in the struggle against the spirit of free inquiry which, under the name of Protestantism, was spreading in Europe. All his efforts against the new idea only succeeded in plunging Spain into a state of ruin and decay from which it has never risen again. In these days the chimerical ideas of the crown dreamer, inspired by the incurable sentimentalism of his race, created the unity of Italy and Germany and cost France two provinces and peace for a long time. That so profoundly false idea that quantity constitutes the strength of armies has covered Europe with a kind of armed national defense and leads it to inevitable ruin. Socialist ideas of labor, capital, and the conversion of private property into state property will finish those nations that escaped the doom of permanent armies and bankruptcy. The national principle, once so dear to statesmen and constituting the only foundation of their policy, may yet be cited among those guiding ideas whose harmful influence the civilized world has had to experience. Its implementation has led Europe to the most ruinous wars, has placed it under arms, and will gradually lead all modern nations to ruin and decay. The only reasonable motive that could be given for defending this principle was that the largest and most populous countries were at the same time the most secure from attack. It was also secretly thought that they were the most capable of conquest. But now it turns out that the smallest and least populated countries Portugal, Greece, Switzerland, Belgium, Sweden, the small Balkan principalities are the least likely to be attacked. The idea of unification has ruined a once so happy Italy to the point that it is now on the eve of revolution and bankruptcy. The annual expenditure budget of all the Italian states, which before the realization of Italian unification came to 550 million, has now reached 2 billion. But it is not in the power of men to stop the course of ideas when they have already penetrated the soul, then it is necessary that their evolution be completed. The defenders of them are more often than not those who are intended to be their first victims. In relation to ideas, we are only sheep, obediently following the leader who leads us to the slaughter. Let us bow before the power of ideas. When it has already reached a certain period of its development, there is no longer any reasoning or evidence that can defeat it. It takes centuries or violent revolutions, or sometimes both for peoples to free themselves from the yoke of an idea. Mankind has only to count the chimeras which it has invented for itself and of which it has consistently fallen prey. Chapter 2 The Role of Religious Beliefs in the Development of Civilization The Predominant Influence of Religious Beliefs They have always constituted the most important element in the life of nations. Most historical events as well as political and social institutions stem from religious ideas. 
with a new religious idea a new civilization is always born. The power of the religious ideal. Its influence on character. It directs all faculties toward one goal. The political, artistic and literary history of nations is the daughter of their beliefs. The slightest change in the state of a people's beliefs has the effect of a whole series of changes in its existence. Different Examples Among the various ideas which have guided peoples and constituted the beacons of history and the poles of civilization, religious ideas have played too predominant and too basic a role not to have a separate chapter devoted to them. Religious beliefs have always constituted the most important element in the lives of peoples and, consequently, in their history. The most significant historical events with the most colossal influence were the birth and death of the gods. Along with a new religious idea comes a new civilization. In all ages, in ancient times as well as in new ones, the main questions for man have always been religious questions. If mankind could allow all its gods to die, such an event could be said to be the most important that has ever occurred on the surface of our planet since the emergence of the first civilizations. In fact, it should not be forgotten that since the dawn of historical times all political and social institutions have been based on religious beliefs, and that on the world stage the gods have always played the first role. Apart from love, which is also a kind of religion, but personal and temporary, religious beliefs alone can quickly act on character. The conquests of the Arabs, the Crusades, Inquisition era Spain, Puritan England. Era, France with the Knight of Bartholomew and the wars of religion show what a people fanaticized by their beliefs becomes. The latter produce a kind of constant hypnotization, so strong that the whole psyche is profoundly transformed by it. No doubt man created the gods. Having created them, he himself was quickly enslaved by them. They are not the sons of fear, but rather of hope, and that is why their influence will be eternal. What the gods gave to man, and what they alone have been able to give so far, is a state of mind that brings happiness. No philosophy has ever yet been able to realize it. The consequence if not the goal of all civilizations, all philosophies, all religions is to produce certain states of mind. But of these states of mind, some contain happiness, others do not. Happiness depends very little on external circumstances, but very much on the state of our soul. The martyrs at their fires probably felt much happier than their executioners. A railroad watchman who eats his garlic rubbed bread crust without a care in the world may be infinitely happier than a millionaire besieged by worries. The development of civilization has unfortunately created in modern man a mass of needs without giving him the means to satisfy them, and has thus produced a general discontent in souls. Civilization is doubtless the mother of progress, but it is also the mother of socialism and anarchy, those formidable expressions of the despair of the masses which no religion supports any longer. Compare the restless, feverish, dissatisfied European with the Oriental, always happy with his lot. How are they different, if not by their state of mind? A nation changes when its way of understanding, and therefore of thinking and acting, changes. To find the means to create a state of mind that makes a person happy is what society, under pain of forfeiting its existence, must first seek. All hitherto established societies have found support in an ideal capable of subduing souls and they have always disappeared when the ideal has lost its effect on them. One of the great mistakes of the modern age is the belief that the human soul can find happiness only in external things. It is in us, created by ourselves, but almost never outside of ourselves. Having destroyed the ideals of the old ages, we now notice that it is impossible to live without them and that, under pain of imminent doom, we must solve the mystery of replacing them with new ones. The true benefactors of mankind, who deserve to have colossal golden statues erected by grateful peoples, are those strong magicians, the creators of the ideals that mankind sometimes produces, but so rarely produces. Above the flood of meaningless phenomena, the only realities that man can know, above the cold and dead mechanism of the world, they have caused the appearance of strong and conciliatory chimeras closing to man the dark sides of his destiny and creating for him enchanting abodes of dream and hope. 
putting ourselves solely on the political point of view, we can see that there, too, the influence of religious beliefs is enormous. Their irresistible power is formed by the fact that they constitute the only factor that can instantly give any people a complete community of interests, feelings, and thoughts. The religious spirit thus replaces at once the gradual hereditary acquisitions necessary for the formation of a national soul. A nation, absorbed by a belief, does not, of course, change its mental structure, but all its abilities are turned to one goal, to the triumph of its religion, and because of this alone its power becomes terrible. Only in religious epochs do instantly transformed peoples make those enormous efforts, laying the foundations of those empires that surprise history. Thus a few Arab tribes, united by the thought of Muhammad, conquered in a few years nations that did not even know their names, and founded their vast empire. It is not the quality of the faith that must be kept in mind, but the degree of power it has over souls. Let the god being called be Moloch or some other even more barbaric deity, it does not matter. The gods who are too tolerant and too meek give no power to their worshippers. The followers of the stern Muhammad dominated much of the world for a long time and are still fearful now, the followers of the peaceful Buddha never founded anything lasting and are already forgotten by history. So the religious spirit played a major political role in the existence of nations. Of course, the gods are not immortal, but the religious spirit is eternal. Asleep for a time, it is awakened as soon as a new religion is created. It allowed France a century ago to hold out victoriously against an armed Europe. Once again the world has seen what the religious spirit can do, for then, indeed, a new religion was founded that inspired the breath of an entire people. The deities that had just had time to be born were too fragile to be able to last, but as long as they existed, they enjoyed unlimited power. The power to transform souls possessed by religions, however, is quite ephemeral. Rarely do beliefs persist for more or less a long time in a degree of intensity that can completely change character. The dream eventually begins to fade, the hypnotized wakes up little by little, and the old background of character reappears. Even when beliefs are omnipotent, the national character is always recognized by the way the beliefs have been received and by the manifestations they cause. Look at the same religion in England, in Spain, and in France, what differences? Was the Reformation ever possible in Spain, and could England ever agree to submit to the terrible yoke of the Inquisition? Is it difficult to see in the peoples who adopted the Reformation the essential features of races which, in spite of the hypnotization of beliefs, retain the specific features of their mental disposition, independence, energy, the habit of reasoning, and not slavishly submitting to the law of the ruler? The political, artistic and literary history of peoples is the daughter of their beliefs, but these latter, while completely changing their character, are in turn profoundly changed by them. The character of a people and its beliefs are the keys to its destiny. The first in its main elements is unchanged, and precisely because it does not change, the history of any people always maintains a certain unity. Beliefs can change, and it is because they change that history records so many upheavals. The slightest change in the state of the beliefs of a people has as a necessary consequence a whole series of transformations in the conditions of its existence. We said in the previous chapter that in France the people of the 18th century seemed quite different from those of the 17th century. Undoubtedly, but what is the origin of this difference? Simple, in the fact that in the interval of these two centuries thought shifted from theology to science, contrasted reason with tradition and mind truths revealed truth. Because of this simple change in understanding, the physiognomy of the age changed and if we were to trace all the consequences that came out of it, we would see that the great French Revolution, as well as the events that followed it and continue to this day, are simply the result of the evolution of religious doctrines. And if at the present time the old society is wavering in its foundations and sees all its institutions greatly shaken, it is because it is more and more losing the old beliefs by which people have lived up to now. When mankind loses them completely, a new civilization, based on the new faith, will need to take their place. 
history shows us that nations do not survive the disappearance of their gods for long. The civilizations born with them die with them as well. Nothing is more destructive than the ashes of dead gods. Chapter 3 The Role of Great Men in the Development of Civilizations the great successes of every civilization have always been carried out by a small handful of superior minds. The essence of their role. They synthesize all the efforts of a known race. Examples delivered by great discoveries. The political role of great men. They embody the dominant ideal of their race. The influence of great men suffering from hallucinations. Genius inventors transform civilization. Fanatics and hallucination sufferers make history. In studying the hierarchy and differentiation of races, we have seen that the real difference between European peoples and Eastern peoples is that the former alone possess a small selection of superior men. Let us try to outline in a few lines the limits of their influence. This small selection of superior men, which a civilized people possesses and which would be sufficient to destroy in each generation to immediately cross that people off the list of civilized nations, constitutes the true embodiment of the forces of race. To them and to them alone we owe the progress made in the sciences, the arts, industry, in a word, in every branch of civilization. The study of civilization shows that in reality we owe all the successes we have won to only a very small select few. Although the crowd enjoys these successes, yet it does not like to be too obviously superior to itself, and the greatest thinkers and inventors have very often been made its martyrs. Yet all the generations, all the past of the known race, blossom in these beautiful geniuses, which make up the wonderful flowers of the old human tree. They are the true glory of the nation, and every member of society, down to the lowest, can be proud of them. They do not appear by chance or miracle, but represent the crown of a long past, as if concentrating in themselves the greatness of their time and of their race. To favor their emergence and their development is to favor the blossoming of progress that all mankind will enjoy. If we were too blinded by our dreams of universal equality, we would have to be its first victims. Equality is only possible at the lowest level. For equality to reign in the world, it would be necessary to reduce little by little all that constituted the value of a known race to the level of what is lowest in it. To raise the intellectual level of the last of the peasants to the genius of some Lavoisier is impossible. It is easy to destroy such geniuses, but they cannot be replaced. But if the role of great men is significant in the development of civilization, it is, however, not at all what it is usually considered. Their action, I repeat, consists in the synthesis of all the efforts of a race, their discoveries are always the result of a long series of previous discoveries, they build a building from the stones that their ancestors slowly shaped. Historians, who are usually very one-sided, have always supposed that they could write the name of one man under every invention, and yet among the great inventions which have transformed the world, such as the printing press, gunpowder, steam, the electric telegraph, there is not one concerning which it could be said that it was made by one head. When one studies the origin of such discoveries, one sees that they were born out of a series of preparatory efforts, the final invention is only the crowning achievement. Galileo's observation concerning the simultaneity of the oscillations of a suspended lamp prepared the invention of accurate chronometers, from which the sailor was to be able to correctly find his way in the ocean. Cannon powder was derived from the slowly changing Greek fire. The steam engine is the sum of a number of inventions, each of which required enormous labor. The Greek, had he been a hundred times more brilliant than Archimedes, could not have invented the locomotive, for to accomplish such a task he would have had to wait for mechanics to make advances that required two thousand years of effort. Although the political role of great statesmen seems to be more independent of the past, in reality it is no more independent than that of great inventors. Blinded by the noisy brilliance of these powerful engines of humanity which transformed the political existence of peoples, writers such as Hegel, Cousin, Carlyle, etc., wanted to make of them demigods, before whom all must bow, and whose genius alone changes the destiny of peoples. 
Doubtless they can disturb the evolution of a society, but it is not in their power to change its course. The genius of some Cromwell or Napoleon cannot accomplish such a thing. Great conquerors can destroy cities, people, and empires with fire and sword, as a child can burn down a museum filled with art treasures, but this destructive power must not deceive us about the nature of its role. The influence of great politicians lasts only as long as, like Caesar or Richelieu, they are able to direct their efforts in the spirit of the needs of the age, the real cause of their successes preceded themselves. Two or three centuries earlier, Caesar would not have succeeded in bringing the great Republic of Rome under the power of a monarch, and Richelieu would have been powerless to bring about the unification of France. The real great men in politics are those who foresee incipient needs, events prepared by the past, and point out the path to be followed. No one may have seen that path, but the fateful conditions of evolution must soon have pushed through the nations whose destinies are temporarily ruled by these powerful geniuses. They, like the great inventors, synthesize the results of long previous labor. We need not, however, take these analogies too far. Inventors play an important role in the development of civilization, but no direct role in the political history of nations. The great men to whom we owe all the important discoveries, from the plow to the telegraph, which constitute the common heritage of mankind, have never possessed the qualities of character necessary for founding a religion or for conquering an empire, i.e. for markedly changing the appearance of history. The thinker sees too clearly the complexity of problems for him ever to have very deep convictions, and too few political ends seem worthy of his efforts for him to pursue any one of them. Inventors can change the appearance of civilization, fanatics of limited intelligence, but of vigorous character and with strong passions alone can establish religions, empires and raise the masses. At the call of some Peter the deserted, millions rushed to the east, the fame of a man who suffered hallucinations like Muhammad created the power necessary to triumph over the old Greco-Roman world, some unknown monk, Luther, betrayed Europe to fire and blood. It is not among the masses that the voice of some Galileo or Newton can find but a faint resonance. Genius inventors accelerate the course of civilization. Fanatics and the hallucinatory make history. What does history really consist of, at least that which we read in books, if not a long narrative of the struggles that man had to endure in order to create an ideal, worship it, and then destroy it? But do such ideals have more value before pure science than the empty mirages formed by light on the shifting sands of the desert? However, some of the famous creators of such mirages who suffered from hallucinations have most profoundly transformed the world. From the depths of their graves they still bend the soul of the masses under the yoke of their thoughts. Let us not lose sight of the importance of their role but let us not forget that the work they undertook succeeded only because they unconsciously embodied in themselves and expressed the dominant ideal of their race and their time. One cannot be the leader of a people without embodying its dreams. Moses embodied, in the eyes of the Jews, the longing for liberation that had been lingering for years in the souls of slaves tormented by the scourges of Egypt. Buddha was able to understand the endless calamities of his time and to express in religion the need for love and pity, which in times of universal suffering were beginning to appear in the world. Muhammad brought about, through the unification of religion, the political unification of a people divided into thousands of hostile tribes. Napoleon, the artilleryman, embodied the ideal of military glory, brilliance, and revolutionary propaganda that were then the main features of the people, whom he drove through Europe for fifteen years, pursuing the most insane adventures. In the end, ideas, and consequently those people who embody and disseminate them, rule the world. Their triumph is assured from the moment they have among their defenders the hallucinatory and the convinced. It makes little difference to the power of their action whether they are true or false. History even shows us that the most ridiculous ideas have always been the most fanatical and the most important. In the name of the most deceptive chimeras, the world has so far been subjected to the greatest upheavals, civilizations that seemed eternal have collapsed and others have been founded. The earth belongs to the poor in spirit, but on the condition that they possess the blind faith that moves mountains. 
philosophers, who often devote centuries to the destruction of what men of profound conviction sometimes create in a single day, must bow before them. Persuaders participate, as it were, in those hidden forces that govern the world. They have caused the most important events recorded by history. To be sure, the fanatics have spread only illusions, but these illusions, at once fearful, seductive and empty, have hitherto lived humanity and no doubt will continue to do so. They are only shadows, but they must be respected. Thanks to them our fathers recognized hope, and in their heroic and mad pursuit of these shadows led us out of primitive barbarism and brought us to the point where we are at present. Of all the factors in the development of civilizations, illusion constitutes perhaps the most powerful. Illusion brought the pyramids into existence and covered Egypt for 5,000 years with stone colossi. Illusion built our giant cathedrals in mid century and caused the West to rush to the East to conquer fiction. In the pursuit of illusion, religions were founded that were able to subjugate half of humanity to their laws, and they also built and destroyed the most enormous empires. Not in the pursuit of truth, but rather in the pursuit of lies. Mankind has expended most of its efforts. The chimerical goals it has pursued it has not been able to achieve, but in pursuing them it has made all the progress it did not seek at all. The Fourth Division The Decay of the Character of the Races and Their Downfall Chapter 1 How Civilizations Gleep and Gasp The Decomposition of Psychological Species how hereditary predispositions that took centuries to form can be quickly lost. It always takes a very long time for a known people to rise to a high stage of civilization and sometimes a very short time to fall from it. The chief factor in the fall of any people is the lowering of their character. The mechanism of the decay of civilizations has so far been the same for all peoples. Symptoms of decline represented by some Latin nations the development of selfishness, a weakening of initiative and will, decline of character and morals, modern youth. Just as the anatomical species are not eternal, neither are the psychological species. The environmental conditions that maintain the constancy of their traits do not always exist. If that environment changes by chance, then the elements of the mental makeup supported by its influence eventually undergo regressive changes, leading to their disappearance. According to the physiological laws observed in all creatures, it takes infinitely less time for an organ to disappear than it takes for it to form. Any organ that remains without action soon loses its ability to function. The eye of the fish living in cave lakes eventually atrophies, and this atrophy eventually becomes hereditary. Even within the confines of a short individual life, an organ, the formation of which through slow adaptations and hereditary inclinations may have taken thousands of centuries, very quickly comes to atrophy if it is no longer actuated. The mental warehouse of creatures cannot escape these physiological laws. A brain cell that is not exercised in turn ceases to function, and mental qualities that took centuries to form can be quickly lost. Courage, initiative, energy, spirit of enterprise, and various qualities of character, very slowly acquired, may fade quite quickly since they are no longer given a reason to exercise. This explains the fact that it always takes a very long time for a people to rise to a high level of culture, and sometimes a very short time to fall into the abyss of degeneration. When one examines the causes which gradually brought to ruin all the different nations of which history tells us, whether it be the Persians, the Romans, or any other nation, one sees that the main factor in their downfall was always a change in their mental disposition, resulting from a lowering of their character. I do not know of any people who have disappeared because of a lowering of their mental faculties. For all past civilizations the mechanism of decomposition was the same and, moreover, to such an extent that one can only ask oneself, as one poet did, whether the history, which occupies so many books, does not in fact consist of only one page? After a people has reached that stage of civilization and power, when, secure in its security, it begins to enjoy the benefits of peace and prosperity, brought to it by wealth, its military prowess is gradually lost, the excesses of civilization develop in it new needs, and egoism grows. 
chasing only the feverish enjoyment of rapidly acquired goods, citizens leave the conduct of public affairs to the state and soon lose all the qualities which once created their greatness. Then neighboring barbarians and half-barbarians, having very little need and a very intense ideal, invade the two civilized people, destroy them, and form a new civilization on the ruins of the ruined one. Thus, despite the terrible military organization of the Romans and the Persians, the barbarians destroyed the empire of the former and the Arabs the empire of the latter. It was not, however, the intellectual development of the peoples invaded that was lacking. From this point of view, there could be no comparison between the victors and the vanquished. It was when Rome already bore in itself the germs of near decay, that is, under the first emperors, it had the greatest number of artists, writers, and scientists. Almost all the works that created its greatness go back to this era of its history. But it has lost that basic element which no amount of mental development can replace, character. Mores were corrupted, the family decayed, characters were pampered. Under the hand of absolute power the degenerate man shrank. There was so much terrible oppression, but never the slightest protest. The Romans of ancient times had very weak needs and a very strong ideal. This ideal the greatness of Rome absolutely dominated all souls, and every citizen was willing to sacrifice his family, his fortune, and his life for it. When Rome became the center of the universe, the richest city in the world, it flooded with foreigners who came from all countries and who were finally given the rights of citizenship. Demanding only the pleasures of luxury for themselves, they took very little interest in their own glory. The great city became a great inn, but it was no longer Rome. It still seemed alive when the barbarians appeared at its gates, but its soul had long been dead. Similar causes of decline threaten our sophisticated civilizations, but these are joined by others indebted to the evolution produced in minds by modern scientific discoveries. Science has renewed our ideas and taken away all authority from our religious and social notions. It has shown man the insignificant place he occupies in the universe and nature's total indifference to him. He saw that what he thought was freedom was only ignorance of the causes to which he submitted and that in the system of necessities that govern him, the natural position of all creatures was such as to be an enslavement. He observed that nature knows not what we call compassion, and that all conquered progress has been achieved only by ruthless selection, leading ceaselessly to the suppression of the weak in favor of the strong. All these icy and cold notions, so contrary to everything that the old beliefs that fascinated our fathers said, have caused disturbing doubts in the souls of modern generations. In mediocre heads they have produced that anarchic state of ideas which seems most characteristic of modern man. In the young generation of artists and educated people these inner contradictions have led to a kind of gloomy indifference, murderous to all will, to a remarkable inability to be inspired by any cause and to an exclusive cult of immediate and personal interests. Commenting on de Vogt's very correct idea that the sense of the relative dominates modern thought, the Minister of Public Education proclaimed with obvious pleasure in a recent speech that the replacement of relative ideas by abstract notions in all fields of human knowledge constitutes the greatest conquest of science. The new declared victory is, in fact, very old. Hindu philosophy accomplished it many centuries ago. We cannot particularly rejoice at the fact that it is striving and will now spread. The real danger to modern civilization lies precisely in the fact that people have lost all faith in the absolute value of the principles on which it rests. I do not know whether it is possible to name one civilization, one institution, one belief, from the beginning of the world, which has managed to persist on the basis of principles regarded as having only relative value. And if the future seems to belong to the socialist doctrines, it is because only their apostles speak in the name of the truths they proclaim as absolutes. The masses will always turn to those who will speak to them of absolute truths and quite reasonably turn away from others. To be a statesman one must be able to penetrate the soul of the crowd, understand its dreams and leave philosophical abstractions to it. Things do not change by themselves. It is only the ideas that are made about them that can change greatly. 
it is these ideas that one must be able to act upon. Of course, we can learn from the real world only phenomena, simple states of consciousness, the value of which is obviously relative. But when we place ourselves in the social point of view, we can say that for a given age and for a given society there are conditions of existence, moral laws, institutions of absolute value, because this society could not exist without them. Ever since their value began to be challenged and doubt spread in the minds, society has been condemned to a speedy death. These are truths that can be boldly proclaimed, for they are not the kind of truths that any science could challenge. The opposite doctrine can only produce the most disastrous consequences. Modern statesmen believe too much in the importance of institutions and too little in the importance of ideas. Science shows them, however, that the former are always the child of the latter and cannot exist without relying on them. Ideas are the invisible springs of things. When they are gone, the hidden props of institutions and civilizations are broken. It has always been a terrible hour for a people when their old ideas have descended into the dark dungeons where the dead gods rest. Leaving aside now the causes in order to examine the results, we must admit that most of the great European nations are seriously threatened by a clear degeneration, especially the so-called Latin nations and those who belong to them, if not by blood, then at least by tradition and upbringing. They are losing every day their initiative, their energy, their will, and their ability to act. The satisfaction of ever-increasing material needs tends to become their only ideal. The family is decaying, the social springs are weakening. Discontent and restlessness spread throughout all classes, both the richest and the poorest. Like a ship that has lost its compass and wanders at random in the winds, Modern man wanders at random in spaces once inhabited by gods and which sober knowledge has made desolate. Having become highly impressionable and extremely fickle, the masses, no longer restrained by any barriers, seem condemned to oscillate ceaselessly between the most frantic anarchy and the crudest despotism. They very easily rise at a word, and their one-day deities soon become their victims. The masses seem greedy for freedom, in reality, they always repel it and ceaselessly demand from the state to forge chains for them. They blindly obey the darkest sectarians and the most limited despots. Red bellies, wishing to lead the masses and most often following them, excite impatience and nervousness, forcing ceaseless changes of lords with a real spirit of independence, thus weaning them from obedience to any lord. The state, whatever its nominal regime, is the deity to which all parties turn. It is demanded with every passing day more and more heavy regulation and patronage, clothed in the smallest acts of life and the most tyrannical formalities. Young people more and more refuse careers that require understanding, initiative, energy, personal effort, and will, the slightest responsibility frightens them. The limited scope of functions for which they are paid by the state is quite satisfactory. The energy and activity of the state have been replaced by terribly fruitless personal bickering, the masses by the delights and anger of the day, the educated by a kind of whiny, powerless, vague sentimentalism and pale speculation on the woes of life. A boundless selfishness developed everywhere. Everyone eventually became preoccupied only with himself. Conscience becomes malleable, general morality is lowered and gradually extinguished. Man loses all power over himself. He no longer knows how to control himself, and he who does not know how to control himself is condemned soon to fall under the power of others. This lowering of morals becomes very serious when it is observed in such areas as the court and notariate, in which once honesty was as common as courage in the military. As for the notariate, its morality has now fallen to a very low level. The same symptoms of profound demoralization are unfortunately to be found in all Latin nations. The scandal of the Italian state banks, where theft was practiced on a large scale by the highest politicians, the insolvency of Portugal, the miserable financial situation of Spain, whose finances are no better than those of Italy, the deep decline of the Latin republics of America prove that the character and morals of the well-known nations suffer an incurable disease and that their role in the world is nearing its end. To change all this would be a difficult thing to do. 
it would be necessary first of all to change our deplorable upbringing. It robs all initiative and energy, even from those who are hereditary. It extinguishes every glimmer of intellectual independence by giving young people as the only ideal the hateful contests which, requiring nothing but the effort of memory, lead to mental development being considered above all but it is the slavish habit of imitation which makes them utterly incapable of individuality and of personal effort. I try to pour iron into the soul of children, said an English pedagogue to the minister Guizot, who visited the schools of Great Britain. Where are the Latin people's educators and programs that could accomplish such a dream? This general lowering of character, this inability of citizens to govern themselves and their selfish indifference, owes chiefly to the difficulty experienced by most European peoples of living under liberal laws, equally distant from despotism as from anarchy. That such laws have little sympathy with the masses is easy to understand, for Caesarianism promises them if not freedom, of which they care very little, then at least very great equality in slavery. On the contrary, that republican institutions can be very readily accepted by the enlightened classes will not be difficult to understand if one evaluates properly the power of the ancestral influences. Were it not through these institutions that all sorts of superiorities, and especially mental ones, had the greatest opportunity to manifest themselves? One might even say that the only real disadvantage of these institutions for dreamers of absolute equality is that they foster the formation of powerful intellectual aristocracies. On the contrary, the most oppressive regime for both character and mind is Caesarism in its various forms. It can only easily lead to equality and lowliness, to submission and slavery. It is very adapted to the low needs of degenerate peoples, and so, as soon as the opportunity presents itself to them, they return to it. The first sultan of some general that comes along brings them to him. When any nation has reached this point, its hour has come and its time is over. It, this Caesarism of the old ages, the appearance of which history has always seen in all civilizations at their very first emergence and at their extreme decline, now undergoes a clear evolution. Chapter 2 General Conclusions we had to point out in the introduction to the present work that it is only a brief summary, a sort of synthesis of the volumes we have devoted to the history of civilizations. Each of its constituent chapters must be regarded as the conclusion of the preceding writings. It is therefore very difficult to compress ideas that are already very compressed. I wish, however, to attempt, for readers who cherish time, to present in very brief terms the main principles which constitute the philosophy of the present work. Race has almost as enduring psychological traits as its anatomical traits. Like the anatomical species, the psychological changes only after centuries of accumulation. To the stable and hereditary psychological traits, the combination of which forms the mental constitution of a race, are joined, as an anatomical species, by incidental elements created by various environmental changes. Constantly renewed, they leave the race wide scope for external change. The mental constitution of a race is not only the synthesis of the living beings that make it up, but especially the synthesis of all the ancestors who contributed to its formation. Not only the living but also the dead play a predominant role in the contemporary life of a people. They are the creators of its morals and the unconscious engines of its behavior. The very great anatomical differences that separate the various human races are accompanied by equally great psychological differences. When one compares among themselves the average of each race, the mental differences often seem rather slight. They become enormous only when we extend the comparison to the higher elements of each race. It may then be observed that the chief difference between the higher peoples and the lower ones is that the former excrete from their midst a certain number of very developed brains, while the latter have none. The individuals constituting the inferior races have an obvious equality among themselves. As races ascend the ladder of civilization, their members tend to differ more and more from each other. The inevitable result of civilization is the differentiation of individuals and races. So it is not to equality that nations go, but to greater inequality. 
the life of a people and all the manifestations of its civilization constitute a mere reflection of its soul, the visible signs of an invisible but very real thing. External events form only the visible surface of the hidden fabric that defines them. Neither chance, nor external circumstances, nor political institutions in particular, play a major role in the history of any people. The various elements of the civilization of a people, being only outward signs of its psychological makeup, an expression of the known modes of feeling and thinking peculiar to the people in question, cannot be transmitted without change to peoples of a totally different psychological makeup. Only external, superficial and irrelevant forms can be transmitted. The profound differences which exist between the mental disposition of different peoples lead them to perceive the outer world quite differently. It follows that they feel, reason and act quite differently, and that there is disagreement between them on all matters when they come into contact with each other. Most of the wars with which history is full have arisen out of these disagreements. Wars of conquest, wars of religion, and wars of dynasty have always in reality been wars of race. A cluster of people of different origins succeeds in forming a race, i.e., in forming a collective soul, only when by repeated interbreeding over the centuries and by living the same life in the same environment it has acquired common feelings, common interests, common beliefs. Civilized peoples no longer have natural races, but only artificial ones created by historical conditions. The new environment, moral or physical, acts profoundly only on new races, that is, on mixtures of ancient races whose interbreeding has decomposed the traits inherited from their ancestors. Heredity alone is strong enough to combat heredity. On races in which interbreeding has not yet had time to destroy the stability of traits, the influences of the environment have only a purely destructive effect. The ancient race is more likely to perish than to undergo the changes which adaptation to the new environment requires. The acquisition of a firmly constituted collective soul represents for a known people the apogee of its greatness. The decay of this soul always signifies the hour of its downfall. The intervention of foreign elements constitutes one of the most sure means of achieving this decomposition. Psychological species, like the anatomical, are subject to the action of time. They are also condemned to grow old and fade away. Always very slowly formed, they can, on the contrary, quickly disappear. It is enough to deeply disrupt the functioning of their organs to cause them to experience regressive changes, the result of which is often very rapid destruction. Peoples need many centuries to acquire a certain mental constitution, and they sometimes lose it in a very short time. The upward road that leads them to the high stage of civilization is always very long the slope that leads them to their downfall is most often very short. Next to character we must put ideas as one of the main factors in the evolution of any civilization. They work only when, after a very slow evolution, they have been transformed into feelings. Then they are immune to objections, and it takes a very long time for them to disappear. Every civilization derives from a very small number of generally accepted basic ideas. Among the most important guiding ideas of any civilization are religious ideas. Most historical events have flowed directly from changes in religious beliefs. The history of mankind has always paralleled the history of its gods. These children of our dreams have such a powerful power that even their name cannot be changed without immediately shaking the world. The birth of new gods has always meant the dawn of a new civilization and their disappearance has always meant its downfall. We live in one of those historical periods when for a time the heavens remain empty. Because of this alone, the world must change. Book 2 Psychology of Masses Prediction We have devoted our preceding work to a description of the soul of races, now we shall take up the study of the soul of the crowd. The common traits due to heredity in all individuals of the same race constitute the soul of that race. But when a certain number of these individuals form an active crowd, observation indicates that the result of this convergence of individuals of the same race are new psychological traits, not only opposed to the character of the races, but often differing from it in a considerable degree. 
The organized crowd has always played a great role in the life of nations, but this role has never been as important as it is at the present moment. The main characteristic of our epic is precisely the replacement of the conscious activity of individuals by the unconscious activity of crowds. I have attempted to study the difficult problem of crowds by means of purely scientific methods, that is, I have tried to find a method, leaving aside opinions, theories and doctrines. I believe that this is the only way of revealing even a particle of truth, especially in a matter that so intensely concerns the mind. The scientist who embarks on the study of a phenomenon has no need to consider the interests that may be affected by his discoveries. A prominent contemporary thinker recently made the observation that, since I do not belong to any modern school, I very often find myself in opposition to the findings and conclusions of all schools. This new work of mine is likely to provoke similar remarks. To belong to a school is to share, in a necessary way, all its prejudices and prejudices. I must explain to readers, however, why in my research I sometimes reach quite different conclusions than one might expect at first sight. I point, for example, to the extremely low degree of the crowd intellectually, including even the assemblies of the elect, and yet I still declare that it would be dangerous to touch the organization of these assemblies. Careful observation of historical facts has led me to the conclusion that social organisms are as complex as those of all living things, and it is not in our power to cause profound changes in them. Nature acts sometimes radically, but never in the way we understand it, this is why the mania for great reforms can be very detrimental to people, no matter how theoretically good they may seem. They could only be good if they could change the soul of nations instantly, but only time has such power. It is ideas, feelings, mores, what we carry within us, that govern men. Institutions and laws are only a reflection of our souls, an expression of our needs, therefore, they cannot change the soul of nations, because they come from it. The study of social phenomena cannot be separated from the study of the peoples with whom they are observed. Philosophically, these phenomena may even be of absolute value but in practical terms their value is always relative. Therefore, when studying a social phenomenon, one must consider it consistently from two different angles. Thus, it becomes clearer that very often the dictates of pure reason are in direct contradiction with the teachings of practical reason. This is observed everywhere, even where the data of physics are concerned. From the point of view of absolute truth, the cube and the circle are unchangeable geometric figures, strictly defined by known formulas. But to our eye, these figures can take a variety of forms. For example, perspective can transform a cube into a pyramid or a square, a circle into an ellipse or even a straight line, and these fictitious forms are much more important for us than the real ones, because we can only see them and a photograph or a painting can only reproduce these forms. The unreal is in some cases even truer than the real. To represent objects only in their exact geometric forms would be a distortion of nature and would make it unrecognizable. Let us imagine a world whose inhabitants could only photograph and sketch various objects without being able to touch them, it would be very difficult for these inhabitants to make a true conception of their shape. However, the knowledge of this form, accessible only to a small number of scientists, would not be of particular interest to them. A philosopher who studies social phenomena should always remember that beside their theoretical value they also have a practical value, and from the point of view of the evolution of civilizations, this latter is the only one that represents some significance. This point of view should make him very cautious in the conclusions that logic seems to suggest to him. But other motives also cause him to be restrained in his conclusions. The complexity of the social facts is such that they cannot be embraced all at once and it is impossible to foresee the results of their mutual influence. Moreover, visible facts very often conceal thousands of invisible causes. Social phenomena, on the other hand, are the result of enormous unconscious work, much of it inaccessible to our analysis. These visible phenomena can be compared to the waves on the surface of the ocean as an expression of the subterranean shaking of its bottom, which we do not know. Observing most of the actions of the crowd, 
we see that they most often serve as an expression of its remarkably low mental level. But there are such cases when the actions of the crowd are, apparently, directed by mysterious forces called in ancient times fate, nature, providence, and now called the voice of the dead. We cannot but recognize the power of these forces, although we do not know their essence at all. Sometimes it seems that in the depths of nations there are hidden forces guiding their actions. What could be, for example, more complex, more logical and more surprising than the language of a people? Introduction The Age of Crowds The Evolution of the Modern Age The great changes of civilization are the consequence of changes in the thought of nations. The Modern Belief in the Power of the Crowd it is transforming the traditional politics of nations. How the lower classes perform and how their power is manifested. The crowd can only play a destructive role. The crowd completes the disintegration of obsolete civilizations. General ignorance of the psychology of crowds. The importance of the study of crowds to legislators and statesmen. The great upheavals that precede the change of civilization such as the fall of the Roman Empire and the founding of the Arab Empire, are at first sight determined chiefly by political change, by the invasion of foreign tribesmen, by the fall of dynasties. But a closer examination of these events indicates that behind these apparent causes are often hidden profound changes in the ideas of peoples. Truly historical upheavals are not those that astonish us in their grandeur and power. The only important changes from which the renewal of civilizations derives are those in ideas, concepts, and beliefs. Major historical events are only visible consequences of invisible changes in people's thoughts. Such changes, however, are rare, because the most lasting thing in every race is the hereditary foundations of its thoughts. The modern age represents one of those critical moments when human thought prepares for change. There are two main factors underlying this change. The first is the destruction of the religious, political, and social beliefs that have given rise to all the elements of our civilization, the second is the emergence of new conditions of existence and of entirely new ideas resulting from modern discoveries in science and industry. The ideas of the past, though half destroyed, are still quite strong. The ideas that are to replace them are still in their infancy that is why the present age is a time of transition and anarchy. It is not easy to predict what might emerge from such a period, which is willy-nilly chaotic in nature. What will be the basic ideas upon which to build the new societies that will succeed us? We do not yet know. But we can already see that, in organizing themselves, they will have to reckon with a new force, the final ruler of the modern age the power of the masses. This power has arisen on the ruins of many ideas once thought to be true and now gone, many powers that have been destroyed by successive revolutions, and seems ready to absorb the rest. And while all our ancient beliefs falter and disappear, the ancient pillars of society crumble one after another, the power of the masses is the only force that is threatened by nothing and whose importance is ever increasing. The coming era will truly be an era of the masses. No more than a century ago, the traditional politics of states and the rivalry of sovereigns were major factors in events. The opinion of the masses was not taken into account, and for the most part it did not exist. Nowadays, political tradition, the personal inclinations of monarchs, and their rivalries are no longer taken into account, and, on the contrary, the voice of the mob becomes predominant. The masses dictate the government's behavior, and it is to their wishes that the government seeks to heed. Not in the deliberations of sovereigns, but in the souls of the multitude, the destinies of nations are now being prepared. The entry of the popular classes into the arena of political life, that is, in fact, their gradual transformation into ruling classes, represents one of the most outstanding features of our transitional epoch. This entry is in fact not at all caused by the general suffrage, which for a long time had no independent, guiding role and was easily subjugated to outside influences. The progressive growth of the power of the crowd was accomplished first of all by the dissemination of well-known ideas which were slowly planted in the minds, 
and then by the gradual formation of associations of individuals for the purpose of carrying out theoretical constructions. By association, the crowd has developed ideas, if not quite just, then at least quite definite, about its interests and has become conscious of its power. The crowd forms syndicates, before which all authorities capitulate, one by one, and organizes labor exchanges, seeking to control conditions of work and wages. The mob sends its representatives to government assemblies, devoid of any initiative and, more often than not, serving only as mere instruments of the committees that elected them. At present the claims of the mob are becoming more and more definite. Limitation of working hours, expropriation of mines, railroads, factories, land, uniform distribution of all products, etc., etc. These are the demands of the mob. Little inclined to theoretical reasoning, the masses are very inclined to action. Thanks to its present organization, the mob has gained enormous power. The dogmas that are just emerging will soon have the power of the old dogmas, that is, that tyrannical supreme power which does not permit any discussion. The divine right of the masses must replace the divine right of kings. Writers who enjoy the sympathy of our modern bourgeoisie and are best able to express its somewhat narrow ideas, its superficial skepticism and sometimes excessive selfishness, are lost at the sight of the new power growing before their eyes, and to somehow overcome the confusion that dominates the mind, they make desperate appeals to the moral powers of the church, which they once so neglected. They tell us of the bankruptcy of science and, returning repentant sinners from Rome, urge us to study the truths of Revelation. But all these converts forget that it is too late. Even if in fact the grace of God had touched them, they could not now have sufficient power over souls little interested in the questions with which the newly formed saints are so absorbed. The crowd now does not want the gods that they themselves did not want to know until so recently and to whose overthrow they themselves had contributed. There is no divine or human power that can make the river flow back to its source. There has been no bankruptcy with science, and it has nothing to do with the present anarchy of minds, nor with the formation of a new power growing in the midst of that anarchy. Science has promised us truth, or at least knowledge of those relations that are accessible to our minds, but it has never promised us peace or happiness. Completely indifferent to our feelings, science does not hear our complaints. We must adjust ourselves to it, because nothing can return to us the illusions it has dispelled. The general symptoms visible in all nations indicate to us the rapid growth of the power of the masses, and do not permit us to think that this power will soon cease to grow. Whatever it may bring us, we shall have to come to terms with it. All arguments and speeches against this power are empty words. Of course, it is possible that the entry of the mob on the scene marks some of the last stages of Western civilization, a complete return to the periods of troubled transition, always seemingly preceding the heyday of every new society. But how can this be prevented? Until now, the most certain role of the masses has been the great destruction of obsolete civilizations. This role has not existed since the present day. History indicates to us that as soon as the moral forces on which a civilization has rested lose power, the work of final destruction is completed by an unconscious and brutal mob, rightly called barbarians. Civilizations were created and preserved by a small handful of intellectual aristocracy, never by the mob. The power of the mob is directed only toward destruction. The domination of the crowd always indicates a phase of barbarism. Civilization presupposes the existence of certain rules, discipline, a shift from the instinctive to the rational, anticipation of the future, a higher degree of culture, all conditions which the crowd, left to itself, has never been able to fulfill. Because of its exceptionally destructive power, the crowd acts like germs accelerating the decomposition of a weakened organism or a corpse. If the edifice of any civilization is undermined, the crowd always causes it to fall. This is when its main role is revealed, and for the time being the philosophy of numbers seems to be the only philosophy of history. Will it be the same with our civilization? We may fear it, but we cannot yet know it. Whatever it is, we must submit to and survive the reign of the crowd. 
This crowd, about which we begin to talk so much, we know very little. Professional psychologists who have lived away from it have always ignored it, and if they have taken up with it lately, it is only in terms of its criminality. No doubt there is a criminal crowd, but there is also a virtuous crowd, a heroic crowd, and many others. The crimes of the crowd constitute only a particular case of its psychology, one cannot know the spiritual organization of the crowd by studying only its crimes, just as one cannot know the spiritual organization of any personality by studying only its vices. However, to tell the truth, all the rulers of the world, all the founders of religions or states, the apostles of all faiths, the outstanding statesmen and, in a more modest sphere, the simple leaders of small human communities have always been unconscious psychologists, who instinctively understand the soul of the crowd and often very correctly. It is through this understanding that they became the masters of the crowd. Napoleon perfectly understood the psychology of the masses of the country in which he reigned, but he often showed a complete lack of understanding of the psychology of the crowds of other peoples and races. It was only because he did not understand this psychology that he was able to wage war with Spain and Russia, which dealt his power the blow from which it perished. Knowledge of the psychology of the masses is now the last means in the hands of the man of state, not to control the masses, for this is no longer possible, but to keep them from having too much power over themselves. Only by delving deeper into the psychology of the masses can we understand the extent to which indoctrinated ideas have power over them. Crowds cannot be guided by rules based on purely theoretical justice, but must find what can impress and entice them. If, for example, any legislator wishes to establish a new tax, should he then choose the tax that would be the fairest? By no means. The most unjust tax may in practical terms be the best for the masses. If such a tax is not conspicuous and seems to be the least severe, it will most easily be accepted by the masses. So an indirect tax, no matter how great, will not arouse the protest of the masses, because it does not constrain their habits or impress them, for it is levied daily and is paid in trifles on the purchase of articles of consumption. But try to replace this tax with a proportional tax on earnings or other income, and demand that it be paid at once, and you will arouse unanimous protests, even if theoretically this tax were ten times lighter than the first. Instead of an insignificant penny to be paid daily, the amount is relatively high, and on the day it has to be paid it will seem excessive and therefore already make an impressive impression. If we were to save a penny at a time, of course, it would not seem so large but such an economic method would show a prudence to which the crowd is generally incapable. The above example is very simple, and its fairness is striking. A psychologist like Napoleon certainly understood this, but most legislators, who do not know the soul of the crowd, will not notice this feature. Experience has not yet sufficiently convinced them that the masses cannot be guided by the prescriptions of reason alone. The psychology of the masses can have application in many other cases. It throws light on many historical and economic facts which without it would be completely inexplicable. I shall have occasion to point out here that if the most remarkable of modern historians, Taine, understood so poorly in some cases the events of our great revolution, it was only because he never thought to study the soul of the mob. He took the naturalist's descriptive method as a guide for his study of this difficult period, but among the phenomena which naturalists have to observe we find no moral forces, and yet these forces constitute the true springs of history. So, the study of crowd psychology seems desirable from a practical point of view, but even if it were of purely theoretical interest, it would still deserve attention. Recognizing the engines that govern people's actions is no less interesting than recognizing a mineral or a flower. Our study of the soul of the crowd can be nothing more than a mere synthesis, a summary of our previous investigations. Nothing more can be demanded of our essay than some thought-provoking views. Others will deepen the furrow we have made on the surface of hitherto very little explored ground. Chapter 1 The Soul of the Crowd Chapter 1 a general characteristic of the crowd. The psychological law of its spiritual unity. What constitutes a crowd from the psychological point of view? 
a multiplicity of individuals is not sufficient to constitute a crowd. The special character of the spiritualized crowd. The fixation of ideas and feelings in the individuals constituting such a crowd, and the disappearance of their own personality. The unconscious always predominates in a crowd. Cessation of cerebral hemispheric activity and predominance of the spinal cord. A diminution of the mental faculties and a complete change of the senses. Altered feelings may be better or worse than those of the individual individuals who make up the crowd together. A crowd is as easily heroic as it is criminal. The word crowd refers in the ordinary sense to an assembly of individuals, whatever their nationality, profession, or gender, and whatever the accidents that caused the assembly. But from the psychological point of view, the word takes on an entirely different meaning. Under certain conditions and only under those conditions an assembly of people has completely new features, different from those that characterize the individual members of the assembly. The conscious individual disappears, and the feelings and ideas of all the individual units composing the whole, which is called a crowd, take the same direction. A collective soul is formed, which has, of course, a temporary character, but also very definite features. The assembly in such cases becomes what I would call, for lack of a better expression, an organized crowd or a spiritualized crowd, constituting a single entity and subject to the law of the spiritual unity of the crowd. Undoubtedly, the mere fact of accidental presence of many individuals together is not sufficient for them to acquire a character of an organized crowd, for this some exciters, the nature of which we will try to determine, are necessary. The disappearance of a conscious personality and the orientation of feelings and thoughts in a certain direction, the main features characterizing a crowd that has entered the path of organization, do not require the indispensable and simultaneous presence of several individuals in the same place. Thousands of individuals, separated from one another, may at certain moments be simultaneously influenced by some strong emotion or by some great national event and thus acquire all the features of a spiritualized crowd. It is enough to bring these individuals together by some accident that all their actions and deeds immediately take on the character of the actions and deeds of the crowd. At certain moments, even six people are enough to form a spiritualized crowd, while at other times a hundred people, gathered together by chance, in the absence of necessary conditions, do not form such a crowd. On the other hand, a whole people, under the influence of certain influences, sometimes becomes a crowd, without being an assembly in the proper sense of the word. The spiritualized crowd, after its formation, acquires general features, temporary but quite definite. These general features are joined by particular ones, changing in accordance with the elements that form the crowd and may, in turn, change its spiritual composition. The spiritualized crowd can be subjected to a certain classification. Further, we will see that a diverse crowd, i.e., one consisting of heterogeneous elements, has many features in common with a homogeneous crowd, i.e., one consisting of more or less related elements, sex, castes, and classes. Next to these common features, however, there are sharply pronounced features that make it possible to distinguish the two kinds of crowds. Before speaking of the various categories of crowds, we must examine their common features and will act as a naturalist who begins by describing the common features that exist in all the individuals of one family and then proceeds to the particularities that make it possible to distinguish the species and genera of that family. It is not easy to depict with accuracy the soul of a crowd, for its organization varies not only according to the race and composition of the assemblies, but also according to the nature and power of the agents to which the assemblies are subject. We encounter the same difficulties, however, in the psychological study of the individual. Only in novels does the character of individuals not change throughout their lives, in reality, the monotony of the environment creates only a seeming monotony of characters. Elsewhere I have already pointed out that in every spiritual organization there are character traits that immediately declare their existence as soon as there is a sudden change in the environment. Thus, for example, among the harshest members of the convention one could find perfectly harmless bourgeois who, under ordinary conditions, 
would certainly have been simple peaceful citizens, occupying the offices of notaries or judges. When the storm passed, they returned to their normal state of peaceful bourgeoisie, and it was among them that Napoleon found his most obedient servants. Not being able to examine here all degrees of mob organization, we shall confine ourselves chiefly to a mob already perfectly organized. Thus, our presentation will show only what a crowd can be, but not what it always is. Only in this later phase of crowd organization, among the unchanging and predominant basic features of the race, new special features stand out and the orientation of the feelings and thoughts of the assembly in the same direction takes place, and only then does the above-mentioned psychological law of the spiritual unity of the crowd reveal its force. Some psychological traits of the crowd's character are shared by it with isolated individuals, others, on the contrary, are peculiar to it alone and are found only in assemblies. We shall first consider these special traits in order to better elucidate their importance. The most striking fact observed in a spiritualized crowd is this, whatever the individuals who make it up, whatever their mode of life, occupation, character, or mind, their transformation into a crowd is enough for them to form a kind of collective soul that makes them feel, think, and act quite differently from what each of them would think, act, and feel individually. There are such ideas and feelings that arise and turn into actions only in the individuals who make up the crowd. A spiritualized crowd is a temporary organism formed from heterogeneous elements, which for a moment come together, just as the cells that make up a living body come together to form through this union a new being with properties different from those possessed by each cell separately. Contrary to the opinion encountered, to our surprise, by such an astute philosopher as Herbert Spencer, in the aggregate which forms a crowd there is neither the sum nor the average of its constituent elements, but there is a combination of these elements in the formation of new properties, just as it occurs in chemistry when certain elements, bases and acids, are combined, for example, to form a new body possessing completely different properties from those possessed by the elements which serve to form it. It is not difficult to see how an isolated individual differs from an individual in a crowd, but it is much more difficult to determine the reasons for this difference. In order to make these reasons at least somewhat clear to ourselves, we must recall one of the tenets of modern psychology, namely, that the phenomena of the unconscious play a prominent role not only in the organic life, but also in the activities of the mind. The conscious life of the mind is only a very small part compared to its unconscious life. The subtlest analyst, the shrewdest observer is able to discern only a very small number of unconscious drives which it obeys. Our conscious acts are derived from the substrate of the unconscious, created especially by the influences of heredity. This substratum contains the innumerable hereditary residues that constitute the actual soul of the race. In addition to the openly acknowledged causes that guide our actions, there are also secret causes that we do not admit to, but behind these secret causes there are even more secret ones, because they are unknown to ourselves. Most of our daily actions are caused by hidden drives that escape our observation. The elements of the unconscious, which form the soul of a race, are precisely the cause of the similarity of the individuals of that race who differ from one another chiefly in the elements of the conscious, that which is the fruit of upbringing or the result of exceptional heredity. The most dissimilar individuals may have the same passions, instincts, and feelings, and in all matters of feeling, religion, politics, morals, affections and antipathies, etc., the most famous only very rarely rise above the level of the most ordinary individuals. Between the great mathematician and his cobbler there may be a whole gulf in terms of intellectual life, but in terms of character there is often no or very little difference between them. These general qualities of character, governed by the unconscious and existing to almost the same degree in most normal individuals of the race, come together in a crowd. In the collective soul the intellectual capacities of the individuals and hence their individuality disappear, the heterogeneous drowns in the homogeneous, and the unconscious qualities take over. This very combination of mediocre qualities in the crowd explains to us why the crowd can never perform actions that require a sublime mind. Decisions concerning common interests, 
made by an assembly of even famous people in different specialties, still differ little from the decisions made by an assembly of fools, because in both cases not any outstanding qualities are combined, but only mediocre ones, found in everybody. Only stupidity, not intelligence, can accumulate in a crowd. The whole world, as it is often said, can in no way be smarter than Voltaire, on the contrary, Voltaire? is smarter than the whole world, if that word is to be understood as a crowd. If the individuals in a crowd were limited to a combination of the mediocre qualities that each of them possesses individually, then we would have an average, not the formation of new traits. How do these new traits arise? This is the question that we will now address. The emergence of these new special traits, which are characteristic of a crowd and, moreover, are not found in separate individuals in its composition, is caused by various reasons. The first of them is that the individual in a crowd acquires, thanks only to the number, the consciousness of irresistible power, and this consciousness allows him to yield to such instincts as he never gives free rein to when he is alone. In a crowd, however, he is less inclined to restrain these instincts, because the crowd is anonymous and does not bear responsibility. The sense of responsibility that has always held individuals back disappears completely in a crowd. The second reason, contagiousness or contagion, also contributes to the formation of special properties in the crowd and determines their direction. Contagion is a phenomenon that is easy to point out, but not to explain, it must be classified as a hypnotic phenomenon, to which we shall now turn. In a crowd, every feeling, every action is contagious, and moreover to such an extent that the individual very easily sacrifices his personal interest to the interest of the collective. Such behavior, however, contradicts human nature, and therefore a person is capable of it only when he is part of a crowd. The third reason, and the most important one, for the appearance in individuals in a crowd of such special characteristics which may not be found in them in an isolated position is susceptibility to suggestion, the contagion of which we have just spoken is only a consequence of this susceptibility. To understand this phenomenon, we should recall some recent discoveries of physiology. We now know that by various means an individual can be brought into a state in which his conscious personality disappears and he submits to all the suggestions of the person who has forced him into this state, performing at his behest acts which are often quite contrary to his personal character and habits. Observations show that an individual, having spent some time among the crowd in action, whether under the influence of currents emanating from the crowd or for some other unknown reason, soon comes to a state which closely resembles that of a hypnotized subject. Such a subject, due to the paralysis of his conscious brain life, becomes a slave to the unconscious activity of his spinal cord, which the hypnotist controls at his discretion. The conscious personality of the hypnotized person completely disappears, as well as the will and reason, and all feelings and thoughts are directed by the will of the hypnotist. Such is roughly the situation of the individual who is part of the spiritualized crowd. He is no longer conscious of his actions, and in him, as in a hypnotized person, some abilities disappear, while others reach an extreme degree of tension. Under the influence of suggestion such a subject will perform known actions with unrestrained impetuosity, and in a crowd this unrestrained impetuosity is manifested with even greater force, as the influence of suggestion the same for all, is increased by reciprocity. The people who have a strong enough individuality to resist indoctrination are too few in the crowd, and therefore unable to fight the tide. The most they can do is to distract the crowd by some new suggestion. Thus, for example, a lucky word, an image, conjured up conveniently in the imagination of the crowd, has at times distracted it from the most bloodthirsty deeds. Thus, the disappearance of the conscious personality, the predominance of the unconscious, the same direction of feelings and ideas determined by suggestion, and the desire to turn immediately the ideas suggested into action these are the main features characterizing the individual in the crowd. He ceases to be himself and becomes an automaton with no will of his own. Thus, by becoming a part of the organized crowd, man descends several steps down the ladder of civilization. In an isolated situation, he might be a cultured man, 
In a crowd, he is a barbarian, an instinctive being. He has a tendency to arbitrariness, rampage, ferocity, but also to the enthusiasm and heroism characteristic of primitive man, a resemblance to which is further enhanced by the fact that the individual in the crowd submits extremely easily to words and ideas that would have had no influence on him in an isolated position and commits acts apparently contrary both to his interests and to his habits. The individual in a crowd is a grain of sand among a mass of other grains of sand, tossed up and carried away by the wind. It is thanks to this capacity of the multitude that we have occasionally to observe juries passing sentences which each of them individually would never have pronounced, we find parliamentary assemblies agreeing to such measures and laws as each of the members of the assembly separately would have condemned. The members of the convention, taken separately, were enlightened bourgeois with peaceful habits. But when they joined together as a mob, they accepted without any hesitation the most ferocious proposals and sent people who were perfectly innocent to the guillotine, on top of this they gave up their immunity, against their own interests, and punished themselves. But it is not only through his actions that the individual in the crowd differs from himself in an isolated position. Before he loses his independence, a change must take place in his ideas and feelings a change so profound that it can turn a miser into a profligate, a skeptic into a believer, an honest man into a criminal, a coward into a hero. The renunciation of all its privileges, vocally vocalized by the aristocracy under the influence of enthusiasm on the famous night of August 4, 1789, would never have been accepted by any of its members individually. From the foregoing we conclude that the mob is intellectually always inferior to the isolated individual, but in terms of the feelings and the actions evoked by those feelings, it may be better or worse than he, depending on the circumstances. It all depends on what kind of indoctrination the crowd obeys. It is this circumstance that has been completely overlooked by all the writers who have studied the crowd only from the point of view of its criminality. Crowds are often criminal, it is true but crowds are also often heroic. The crowd will go to its death for the sake of the triumph of some creed or idea, the crowd can be awakened to enthusiasm and forced, for glory and honor, to go without bread or weapons, as in the days of the Crusades, to free the sepulcher from the hands of infidels, or, as in 93, to defend the homeland. This is heroism, somewhat unconscious, of course, but it is with this heroism that history is made. If only great deeds in cold blood were counted among the nations, there would be very few in the world's lists. Chapter 2 The Personality and the Purpose of a Crowd Asterisk 1. The Impulsiveness, Volatility, and Irritability of Crowds The impulses to which the crowd obeys are strong enough to destroy personal interests. The crowd never acts deliberately. Asterisk 2. The malleability of suggestion and the credulity of the crowd. The disappearance of the distinction between the scholar and the fool in the crowd. Impossibility of believing the testimony of the crowd. The unanimity of the testimony of many witnesses is the least suitable to confirm any fact. The inferiority of historical writings. 3. The exaggeration and one sidedness of the feelings of the mob. 4. The intolerance, authority, and conservatism of the mob. The temporary manifestation of revolutionary instincts in the crowd does not prevent it from being deeply conservative. 5. Crowd morality. The crowd is seldom guided by self-interest, whereas it is self-interest that most often serves as the exclusive driver of the actions of individuals. The moralizing role of the crowd. Having pointed out in general terms the main properties of crowds, we will now proceed to a detailed consideration of these properties. Among the special properties characterizing crowds we find, for example, impulsiveness, irritability, inability to think, lack of reasoning and criticism, exaggerated sensitivity, etc., which are observed in creatures belonging to the lower forms of evolution, such as women, savages, and children. I point to this analogy, however, only in passing, as I would have to break the framework of this work if I wanted to prove it. However, this would be useless for people familiar with the psychology of primitive man, while for those who are not familiar with it, 
such proof would still be insufficiently convincing. I now turn to a sequential consideration of the various properties observed in a crowd in most cases. Asterisk 1. The impulsiveness, volatility, and irritability of crowds. In examining the basic properties of a crowd, we have indicated that it is almost exclusively controlled by the unconscious. Its actions are much more subject to the influence of the spinal cord than of the brain, and in this respect they are closer to completely primitive creatures. The acts performed by the crowd may be excellent in themselves, but since the mind does not direct them, the individual in the crowd acts according to chance. The crowd serves as the plaything of all external stimuli and reflects all their changes, it is, therefore, slavishly submissive to the impulses it receives. The individual may be subjected to the same excitations that act on him in the crowd, but, isolated from the crowd, he is already subject to reason and resists the influence of these excitations. Physiologically, this can be expressed as follows. The isolated individual has the ability to suppress his reflexes, whereas the crowd does not have this ability. The various impulses to which the crowd obeys may be, depending on the nature of the excitement, magnanimous or fierce, heroic or cowardly, but they are always so strong that no personal interest, not even the feeling of self-preservation, is able to suppress them. Since the stimuli acting on the crowd are very diverse and the crowd always obeys them, hence its extreme changeability. That is why we see that the crowd can suddenly pass from the most bloodthirsty cruelty to magnanimity and exhibit even on occasion the most absolute heroism. The crowd easily becomes the executioner, but just as easily it becomes a martyr. Out of its bowels poured those streams of blood that were necessary for any faith to triumph. There is no need to turn to the heroic age to see what the crowd is capable of from this very point of view. Crowds never value their lives in times of outrage, and until very recently one general, Boulanger, who suddenly became popular could easily find hundreds of thousands of people ready to die for his cause, if only he demanded it. There is no premeditation in a crowd, it can consistently go through the whole school of contradictory feelings, but will always be influenced by the excitements of the moment. The crowd is like leaves lifted by a hurricane and blown in different directions, and then falling to the ground. Speaking further about some kinds of revolutionary crowd, we will point out a few examples of the variability of its feelings. Because of this volatility the crowd is very difficult to lead, especially if part of the public power is in its hands. If the needs of everyday life were not a kind of invisible regulator of things, the autocracy could not have lasted long. But although all the desires of the crowd are always very passionate, they still do not last long, and the crowd is as little capable of showing a persistent will as it is of exercising reason. The crowd is not only impulsive and changeable, like the savage, it does not allow anything to stand between its desire and the realization of that desire. The crowd is all the more capable of allowing this to happen because numbers create in it a sense of irresistible power. For the individual in the crowd, the notion of impossibility does not exist. The isolated individual is aware that he cannot set fire to a palace alone, loot a store, and even if he feels the urge to do so, he will easily resist it. In a crowd, on the other hand, he is conscious of the power afforded him by his numbers, and it is enough to indoctrinate him with ideas of murder and robbery for him to yield to the temptation at once. Any unexpected obstacle will be destroyed by the crowd with its own impetuousness, and if the human organism allowed an unrelenting state of rage, we could say that the normal state of the crowd, which has encountered an obstacle, is rage. In the irritability of the crowd, in its impulsiveness and volatility, as well as in all the popular feelings which we shall further consider, the basic features of race, which form the immutable ground on which all our feelings develop, always manifest themselves. Every crowd is always irritable and impulsive this is beyond doubt. But the degree of this irritability and impulsiveness varies. Thus, for example, the difference in this respect between Latin and Anglo-Saxon crowds is striking, and even in recent history there are facts pointing to it. It was enough, for example, 
to publish 25 years ago a simple telegram announcing an alleged insult to an envoy for there to be an explosion of rage, the immediate result of which was a terrible war. A few years later the telegraphic notification of a minor mishap at Lang Sun again caused another explosion that brought about the overthrow of the government. At the same time, the much more significant failure of the English expedition to Khartoum caused only very little excitement in England, and no ministry was harmed by it. A crowd always reveals the traits of a woman's character, and these traits are most sharply expressed in the Latin crowd. He who leans on it can climb very high and very quickly, but will constantly touch the Tarpeian rock and must always expect to be toppled from that rock one day. Asterisk 2. Susceptibility to suggestion and the credulity of the crowd. We have already said, in describing the crowd, that one of its general characteristics is its extraordinary susceptibility to suggestion. We have pointed out that in every human agglomeration suggestion becomes contagious, and this explains the rapid orientation of the senses in a certain direction. No matter how neutral the crowd is, it is still most often in a state of expectant attention, which facilitates all suggestion. The first formulated indoctrination is immediately transmitted through contagiousness to all minds, and a corresponding mood immediately arises. As with all creatures under the influence of suggestion, the idea that has taken possession of the mind seeks to express itself in action. The crowd will just as easily commit the burning of the palace as some supreme act of self-denial. Everything will depend on the nature of the instigator, not on the relationship that in the isolated individual exists between the inspired act and the sum of rationality that opposes its fulfillment. Always wandering on the border of the unconscious, easily subject to all suggestion, and possessing the violent feelings peculiar to those beings who cannot submit to the influence of reason, the crowd, devoid of all critical faculties, must be extremely easygoing. The improbable does not exist for her, and this must be remembered, because this explains the unusual ease with which legends and the most improbable stories are created and disseminated. People who were in Paris during the siege have seen many examples of this light-heartedness of the crowd. The lighted candle in the upper floor was immediately taken as a signal to the enemy, although it would take a moment's reflection to be convinced of the absurdity of this assumption, because, of course, the enemy could not distinguish the flame of the candle at a distance of several miles. The formation of legends, easily spreading in the crowd, is due not only to its credulity, but also to those distortions that undergo events in the imagination of the people gathered by the crowd. In the eyes of the crowd, the simplest event quickly takes on an entirely different dimension. The crowd thinks in images, and the image evoked in its imagination, in turn, evokes others that have no logical connection with the first. We can easily understand this condition if we remember the strange combination of thoughts that sometimes brings us to the recollection of a fact. Reason points us to the incongruities that lie in these images, but the crowd does not see them and mixes with the real event that is created by its distorting imagination. The crowd does not separate the subjective from the objective at all, it considers real the images conjured up in its mind, which often have only a very distant connection with the fact it observes. It would seem that the distortions which an event undergoes in the eyes of the crowd must have a very diverse character because the individuals who make up the crowd have very different temperaments. But not at all. Under the influence of contagion, these distortions are always of the same character for all individuals. The first distortion, created by the imagination of one of the individuals in the assembly, serves as the core of the contagious suggestion. Before the image of St. George was seen by all on the walls of Jerusalem and on all the windows, it was first seen by only one of those present, and by suggestion and contagion the miracle pointed out by him was immediately accepted by all the others. This is always the mechanism of all collective hallucinations, of which history often speaks and whose authenticity is confirmed by thousands. It would be superfluous, in view of the refutation of the foregoing, to point out the mental qualities of the individuals who make up the crowd. These qualities are irrelevant, the ignorant and the scholar, since they are part of the crowd, are equally incapable of observation. This position may seem paradoxical, 
but to prove it we would have to cite so many historical facts that it would take entire volumes. Not wishing, however, to leave the reader under the impression of unproven assertions, I will give a few examples, taken at random among the mass of facts I would have to quote. The most typical case of such a collective hallucination in the crowd consisted of individuals of all kinds, both the most ignorant and the most educated is told by Lt. Julian Felix in his book on sea currents and was once printed in the Revue Scientifique. The frigate La Velle Rose was cruising at sea, looking for the corvette Vague Seek, with which it was separated by a violent storm. It was daytime and the sun was shining brightly. Suddenly the sentry saw the abandoned vessel. The crew directed their eyes to the point in question, and all, officers and sailors, clearly noticed a raft, laden with men, attached by a tug to the boats, on which were seen signals. Of distress. All this, however, was nothing but a collective hallucination. Admiral de Fossette immediately sent boats to the aid of the dying. As the officers and sailors approached the scene of the disaster, they could clearly see piles of people agitating, arms outstretched, and hear the muffled and mixed noise of many voices. When the boats finally approached the spot, there appeared to be nothing there but a few branches with leaves carried away by the waves from the neighboring shore. Such clear evidence, of course, made the hallucination disappear. In this example we can clearly trace the mechanism of formation of a collective hallucination. On the one hand we have the crowd in a state of expectant attention, on the other hand we have the suggestion made by the sentry who saw the abandoned ship at sea, this suggestion has already spread by contagion to all those present, both officers and sailors. The crowd does not necessarily have to be numerous for the ability to see correctly what is going on in front of it to be destroyed in it and for the place of the real facts to be taken by hallucinations which have no connection with them. As soon as a few individuals get together, they are a crowd, even if they are eminent scientists. Sometimes, however, they take on the characteristics of a crowd with respect to anything outside their specialty. The powers of observation and criticism that each of these scientists possesses as an individual immediately vanish into the crowd. The witty psychologist Davitt gave us a very curious example of this condition, described in Annals de Science's Psychiques. Having summoned prominent observers, among whom was one of the first scientists in England, Wallace, Dave presented before them, having first invited them to examine all the objects in the room and to place seals everywhere, all the classic phenomena of spiritists, such as the materialization of spirits, writing on a board, etc. Having then received from them a written confirmation of what had been seen, in which it was stated that the above phenomena could not be produced except through supernatural forces, Dave confessed that the phenomena were the result of a very simple deception. The most amazing thing about Dave's experiments, says the author of the story, is not so much the tricks themselves, quite bizarre, however, as the remarkable inconsistency of the testimony given by witnesses not privy to his purposes. It follows that the positive accounts of numerous witnesses can be completely wrong, because in this case, for example, if we accept these testimonies as true, we would have to agree that the described phenomena cannot be explained by any deception. However, the methods used by Dave were so simple that one has to wonder at his boldness in using them. But he had such power over the minds of the crowd that he could assure them that they see something that does not really exist. Here again we see a manifestation of the power of the hypnotist over the hypnotized, and if the higher minds, whose distrust has been previously excited, obey this power, how easily the common crowd must obey it. Such examples abound. As I write these lines, all the newspapers are overflowing with stories of two little drawn women pulled out of the seine. At least a dozen or so witnesses acknowledge the identity of these children most emphatically. All their testimonies were so in agreement that no doubt could arise in the mind of the investigator, and he had already written a death certificate. But the moment they wanted to bury the drawn women, it was discovered that the alleged victims were alive and only slightly resembled the drowned. As in all the preceding examples, even here it was enough the assurances of the first witness, who gave in to the illusion, 
for a suggestion to be immediately formed which influenced all the other witnesses. In all such cases the source of the suggestion is always an illusion, caused in one individual by more or less vague memories. This initial illusion, through affirmation, becomes a source of contagion. To the impressionable person a slight incidental resemblance, a detail resembling another person, is enough to make him think that this is precisely the same person. The image thus evoked becomes the nucleus for further crystallization, which fills the entire area of the mind and paralyzes all critical faculties. This explains, for example, such a surprising fact as the mistake of a mother who recognizes in a stranger her own child, as was the case in the case now recalled by the newspapers. In this case one can trace the same mechanism of suggestion as I have already described. The child recognized in the dead man as companion, but this was a mistake, which caused immediately a series of similar mistakes, and the following amazing thing happened, one woman, seeing the corpse of the child, exclaimed. Oh, my God, that's my baby! When she looked closer, she noticed the scar on her forehead and said, Yes, that's my poor son who disappeared in July. I had him kidnapped and murdered. The woman was an usher in the Rue du Fours and was called Chavadra. Her son-in-law was invited, who announced without any hesitation, Here is little Philibert. Several inhabitants of this street also recognized in the dead child Philibert Chavitra, and even his own teacher, noticing the medal, recognized in the dead man his former pupil. So what? The neighbors, the son-in-law, the schoolteacher, and the mother all mistaken. Six weeks later, the identity of the child was finally established, it turned out that it was a child from Bordeaux, murdered there and brought by stagecoach to Paris, ES1 Air, April 21, 1895. Such erroneous recognitions, as has already been observed, are most often made by women and children, that is, the most impressionable subjects, and indicate to us at the same time what value for justice such testimony can have. As for children, for example, their testimony should never have been taken into account. Judges like to repeat that children do not lie, but if they knew anything about psychology, they would know that, on the contrary, children always lie at that age. This lie is undoubtedly innocent, but it is still a lie. It would be better to decide the fate of a defendant by lot, than to pronounce a verdict, as it happened many times, on the basis of the testimony of a child. Returning to observations made by a crowd, these collective observations are the most erroneous of all, and most often represent nothing more than the illusion of one individual spread by contagion and indoctrination. One could endlessly multiply the number of such facts, indicating with what skepticism should be placed on the testimony of the crowd. Thousands were present, for instance, at the famous cavalry attack during the Battle of Sedan, and yet it is impossible, in view of the most contradictory testimony of the witnesses, to know who commanded the attack. The English General Walsley proves in his new essay that there are still the most erroneous notions concerning the most important factors of the Battle of Waterloo, even though these facts are confirmed by hundreds of witnesses. Can we know concerning any battle how it really took place? I highly doubt it. We know who the victors and the vanquished were, and our knowledge probably goes no further than that. What Darcourt, a participant and witness, tells of the Battle of Solferino can be applied to all battles, the generals, receiving information of course from a hundred witnesses, make their official reports, the officers charged with transmitting orders alter these documents and make a final draft of the report, the chief of the general staff refutes it and makes it up again. It is then already being carried to the marshal, who exclaims, you are decisively mistaken, and draws up a new version. Nothing remains of the original report. Darcourt recounts this fact as proof of the impossibility of establishing the truth even concerning an event most striking and most famous. Facts of this kind sufficiently indicate the importance of the testimony of the crowd. According to logic, the unanimous testimony of numerous witnesses would seem to rank among the strongest proofs of any fact. But what we know from crowd psychology shows that it is in this respect that the treatises of logic should have been completely revised. The most dubious events are those which have been observed by the greatest number of people. 
To say that a fact is confirmed at one time by thousands of witnesses is to say, in most cases, that the actual fact is quite unlike the existing accounts of it. It is obvious from what I have just said that historical accounts are to be regarded as works of pure fantasy, fantastic accounts of badly observed facts, accompanied by later explanations. Needing lime is much more useful than writing such books. If the past did not bequeath to us its literary and artistic works and monuments, we would not know the truth about the past. Do we know a single word of truth about the lives of great men who played prominent roles in human history, such as Hercules, Buddha, and Muhammad? Probably not. In fact, however, their actual lives are of little importance to us, we are interested in knowing these great men only as they were created by popular legend. It is such legendary, rather than real heroes and had an impact on the soul of the crowd. Unfortunately, legends, even when written down, are not stable in themselves. The imagination of the crowd constantly changes them according to time and especially according to race. How far, for example, is the bloodthirsty biblical Jehovah from the God of love worshipped by St. Teresa, and Buddha, adored in China, has nothing in common with the Buddha worshipped in India. It does not even take centuries after the deaths of the heroes for the imagination of the crowd to completely change their legend. The transformation of a legend is accomplished sometimes in a few years. We have seen the legend of one of history's greatest heroes changed several times, in less than fifty years. Under the Bourbons, Napoleon was portrayed as some idyllic philanthropist and liberal, a friend of the downtrodden, whose memory, according to the poets, must live long under the roof of the huts. Thirty years later, the good-natured hero is turned into a bloodthirsty despot who, seizing power and freedom, murdered three million people, solely to satisfy his vanity. Now we are witnessing a new transformation of this legend. When several dozen more centuries have passed, future scholars, in view of such contradictory accounts of the hero, may doubt his very existence, just as they sometimes doubt the existence of Buddha and will probably see in these tales of the hero some solar myth or a further development of the legend of Hercules. But these scholars will probably easily reconcile themselves to such doubts, for, better than we are acquainted with the psychology of the crowd, they will certainly know that only myths can perpetuate history. Asterisk 3. The Exaggeration and One-Sidedness of the Feelings of the Crowd Whatever the feelings of the crowd, good or bad, their characteristic features are one-sidedness and exaggeration. In this respect, as in many others, the individual in the crowd approaches primitive beings. Without noticing nuance, he perceives all impressions in a guttural fashion and knows no transitions. In a crowd, the exaggeration of feeling is also conditioned by the fact that this very feeling, spreading very rapidly through suggestion and contagion, arouses general approval, which contributes greatly to increasing its power. The one-sidedness and exaggeration of the feeling of the crowd leads to the fact that it knows neither doubts nor hesitations. As a woman, the crowd always goes to extremes. A suspicion expressed immediately turns into an undeniable obviousness. The feeling of antipathy and disapproval, barely conceived in an individual, in the crowd immediately turns into the most ferocious hatred. The power of the crowd's feelings is further increased by the absence of responsibility, especially in a multifarious crowd. Confidence in impunity, the more numerous the crowd is, an awareness of considerable, although temporary, power provided by the number, allows crowds of people to show such feelings and perform such actions which are impossible for an individual. In a crowd, the fool, the ignorant and the jealous are freed from the consciousness of their nothingness and powerlessness, which they replace with the consciousness of brute power, transient but immeasurable. Unfortunately, exaggeration is more often found in the bad feelings of the crowd, an atavistic remnant of the instincts of primitive man, which are suppressed in the isolated and responsible individual by the fear of punishment. This is the reason for the ease with which the mob commits the worst violence. It does not follow, however, that the mob is incapable of heroism, selflessness, and very high virtues. It is even more capable of them than the isolated individual. 
we shall return to this subject shortly, studying the morality of the crowd. Possessing exaggerated feelings, the crowd is only capable of submitting to the influence of those same exaggerated feelings. An orator, wishing to entice them, must abuse strong language. To exaggerate, to assert, to repeat, and never to try to prove anything by argument are methods of argument well known to all speakers of public assemblies. The crowd wishes to see the same exaggeration of feeling in their heroes, their apparent qualities and virtues must always be magnified. It has been justly observed that in the theater the crowd demands from the hero of a play such qualities, courage, morality, and virtue as are never practiced in life. It has been quite rightly pointed out that there are special optical conditions in the theater, but nevertheless, the rules of the theatrical optics most often have nothing to do with common sense and logic. The art of speaking to a crowd undoubtedly belongs to the arts of the lower order, but nevertheless requires special abilities. It is often quite impossible to explain to oneself in reading the success of certain theatrical plays. Theater directors, when such a play is brought to them, are often unsure of its success themselves, for in order to judge it, they would have to turn into the crowd. And here, if we could go into detail, we would point out the outstanding influence of race. A theatrical play which excites a crowd in one country often has no success in another, or only a conditional success, because it does not act on the springs which move it to a new audience. This explains the fact that sometimes plays rejected by all theater directors and accidentally performed on some stage are an astounding success. For example, Coppet's Rue One rejected by all theaters for ten years, was recently a huge success. The same success fell to Moraine de Harry, rejected by all theaters and finally produced at the expense of a stockbroker, after which it sustained 200 performances in France and more than a thousand in England. Were it not for this inability to mentally turn into a crowd, such gross errors on the part of theater directors, persons competent in this respect and most interested in the matter, would simply be inexplicable. I cannot elaborate further here on this question, which would deserve to be dealt with by some connoisseur of theater and at the same time a subtle psychologist like Sarset. I have nothing to add that exaggeration is expressed only in the feelings, not in the mental faculties of the crowd. I have pointed out before that the mere fact of participating in a crowd is enough to immediately and significantly lower one's intellectual level. The scholar Juris Tart also stated this in his studies of mob crimes. It is only in the realm of the senses that a mob can rise very high or descend very low. Asterisk 4. Crowd Intolerance, Authority, and Conservatism. The crowd knows only simple and extreme feelings. Every opinion, idea, or belief instilled in it, the crowd accepts or rejects entirely and treats them either as absolute truths or as equally absolute delusions. This is always the case with beliefs that have been established by suggestion rather than by reasoning. Everyone knows how strong religious intolerance is and what oppressive power religious beliefs have over souls. Having no qualms about what is true and what delusion, the crowd expresses as much authority in its judgments as it does in tolerance. The individual can tolerate contradiction and contestation, but the crowd can never tolerate them. In public assemblies, the slightest objection on the part of a speaker immediately elicits furious shouts and violent scolding from the crowd, followed by action and expulsion of the speaker if he insists on his point. Were it not for the interfering presence of agents of authority, the disputant's life would very often be in danger. Intolerance and authoritative judgment are common to all categories of crowds, but are expressed in varying degrees. Here, too, are the basic properties of race, which suppress all human feelings and thoughts. In the Latin crowd intolerance and authority are predominantly developed to a high degree and so much so that they completely destroy that sense of individual independence which is so strongly developed in the Anglo-Saxons. The Latin crowd is sensitive only to the collective independence of its sect. The characteristic feature of this independence is the need to immediately and forcibly subject all dissidents to its faith. In the Latin crowd, Jacobins of all times, beginning with the Inquisition, have never been able to rise to a different concept of freedom. 
authoritativeness and intolerance are such definite sentiments that are easily understood and assimilated by the crowd and just as easily put into practice by it once they have been imposed on it. The masses respect only strength, and kindness touches them little, for they look upon it as a form of weakness. The sympathies of the mob have always been on the side of the tyrants who subjugate it, not on the side of the good rulers, and the highest statues are always erected by the mob first, not last. If the crowd willingly tramples on the defeated despot, it is only because, having lost his power, the despot already falls into the category of the weak, who are despised because they are not feared. The type of hero dear to the heart of the crowd will always resemble Caesar, whose helmet charms the crowd, whose power inspires respect and whose sword makes them fear. Always ready to rebel against weak power, the crowd slavishly bows to strong power. If the force of power has an intermittent character, the crowd, always obeying its extreme feelings, moves alternately from anarchy to slavery and from slavery to anarchy. To believe in the predominance of revolutionary instincts in the crowd is to be ignorant of its psychology. We are misled here only by the impetuosity of these instincts. The outbursts of indignation and the desire for resolution are always ephemeral in the crowd. The crowd is too controlled by the unconscious and therefore too subject to the influence of age-old heredity not to be in fact extremely conservative. Left to itself, the crowd soon tires of its own turmoil and instinctively seeks slavery. It was the proudest and most intransigent of the Jacobins who greeted Bonaparte most energetically when he destroyed all rights and made France feel his iron hand hard. It is difficult to understand history, especially the history of popular revolutions, without a good grasp of the deeply conservative instincts of the mob. The crowd is ready to change the names of its institutions and sometimes makes violent revolutions in order to achieve such a change, but the foundations of these institutions serve as an expression of the hereditary needs of the race, and so the crowd always returns to them. The volatility of the crowd is expressed only superficially, in essence, the crowd is governed by conservative instincts, as indestructible as those of all primitive men. It has a most sacred respect for tradition and an unconscious horror, very deep, for any kind of innovation that might change the real conditions of its existence. If democracy had the same power as it does now, in the age in which machinery, steam, and railroads were invented, the realization of these inventions would be impossible, or it would come at the cost of repeated revolutions and massacres. It is a great blessing for the progress of civilization that the power of the mob began to be born when the great discoveries in industry and science were made. Asterisk if by morality we mean a constant respect for known social decrees and a constant suppression of selfish motives, then, no doubt, the crowd is too impulsive and too changeable to be called moral. But if we also include temporary manifestation of known qualities, for example, selflessness, devotion, unselfishness, self-sacrifice, sense of justice, then we must admit that the crowd can sometimes exhibit very high morality. The few psychologists who have studied crowds have looked at them only from the standpoint of S.E. criminal acts and, observing how often the crowd commits such acts, they have concluded that the moral level of the crowd is very low. This is true in most cases, but why? Simply because the instincts of destructive ferocity, which are a remnant of primeval times, are dormant in the depths of each of us. To succumb to these instincts is dangerous for the isolated individual, but when he is in an irresponsible crowd, where he is therefore assured impunity, he is free to follow the dictates of his instincts. Unable in ordinary times to satisfy these ferocious instincts on our fellow human beings, we confine ourselves to satisfying them on animals. The common passion for the hunt and the ferocious actions of the mob stem from the same source. A mob slowly beating some defenseless victim reveals, of course, a very mean ferocity, but to the philosopher there is much in common in this ferocity with the ferocity of hunters who gather by the dozen for the mere pleasure of watching their dogs chase and tear apart an unfortunate deer. But if the crowd is capable of murder, arson, and crimes of all kinds, it is also capable of very lofty acts of devotion, self-sacrifice, and unselfishness, more lofty than even those of the individual. 
by acting on an individual in a crowd and arousing in him a sense of glory, honor, religion, and patriotism, it is easy to make him sacrifice even his own life. History is rich with examples like the Crusades and the Volunteers of 93. Only a crowd is capable of the greatest unselfishness and the greatest devotion. How many times has a crowd heroically died for a belief, a word, or an idea that they themselves barely understood? The mob that staged the strikes does so not so much to increase their meager earnings, which they are satisfied with, as to obey orders. Personal interest is very seldom a powerful engine in a crowd, whereas in the individual it comes first. Not interest, of course, has guided the crowd in many wars, most often beyond its comprehension, but it went to death and accepted it as easily as swallows, hypnotized by the hunter's mirror, let themselves be killed. It happens very often that even perfect scoundrels, while in the crowd, are temporarily imbued with the strictest principles of morality. Tan says that the September murderers brought to the committees all the money and jewels they found on their victims, though it was easy for them to conceal it all. The howling multitude of ragamuffins who took possession of the Tillery's palace during the Revolution of 1848 seized none of the magnificent things that dazzled it, although each of these things could have provided it with sustenance for several days. This moral influence of the mob on individuals, though not a constant rule, is quite frequent, it occurs even in cases less serious than those I have just mentioned. I have already said that in the theatre the crowd demands exaggerated virtues from the characters in a play, and the simplest observation indicates that an assembly, even one composed of elements of the lowest class, is usually more scrupulous in this respect. The professional whippersnapper, the toothpick, the ragamuffin, and the pimp often resent it if the play contains risque scenes and not quite decent talk, which, however, must seem very innocent in comparison with their usual talk. So, while the crowd often falls under the influence of lower instincts, it is still sometimes able to show examples of very high morality. If we consider unselfishness, obedience, and absolute loyalty to a chimerical or real ideal as moral qualities, then we must admit that the crowd very often possesses these qualities to an extent that they are rarely found even in the wisest of philosophers. The crowd applies these qualities unconsciously, but what a misfortune! Let us not complain too much about the fact that the crowd is mainly governed by unconscious instincts and does not reason at all. If it were to reason sometimes and cope with its immediate interests, perhaps no civilization would have developed on the surface of our planet and humanity would have no history. Chapter 3 Ideas, Reasoning, and the Imagination of the Mob Asterisk 1 Crowd Ideas Basic and Additive Ideas how the most contradictory ideas can exist simultaneously. The transformations to which the higher ideas must undergo in order to be made available to the crowd. Asterisk 2. The reasoning of the crowd. The ideas associated by the crowd may only in appearance represent consistency. Asterisk 3. Crowd imagination. The crowd thinks in images, and these images follow one another without any connection. The crowd is particularly susceptible to the miraculous. The miraculous and the legendary are the true pillars of civilization. Asterisk 1. The Ideas of the Crowd. In examining in the first part of this book, The Psychology of Peoples, the role of ideas in the evolution of peoples, we pointed out that all civilization derives from a small number of basic ideas, very rarely renewed. We have presented how these ideas establish themselves in the soul of a crowd, the difficulty with which they penetrate it, and the power they acquire once they have established themselves in it. We have seen how often great historical upheavals result from a change in the basic ideas of the crowd. I have already spoken enough about this subject, and therefore I will not return to it now, I will only say a few words about the ideas available to the crowd and about the form in which they are assimilated by the crowd. These ideas may be divided into two classes. To the first, we include temporary and transient ideas produced by the passing of time, such as admiration for an individual or a doctrine, to the second, all the basic ideas to which environment, heredity, 
and public opinion give very great stability, such as former religious beliefs and present-day social and democratic ideas. Basic ideas can be thought of as a mass of water in a river, slowly developing its current, while transient ideas are small waves, constantly changing and disturbing the surface of a great mass of water. These waves have no real significance, but are more visible to the eye than the movement of the river itself. At the present time, the great basic ideas by which our ancestors lived have begun to loosen, they have lost all strength, and as a consequence all the institutions based on these ideas have also been deeply shaken. We see daily the formation of the small transitory ideas I have just mentioned, but very few of these ideas develop further and can become influential. Whatever ideas are indoctrinated into the crowd, they can only become predominant if they are put into the most categorical and simple form. In this case, these ideas are presented in the form of images, and only in this form are they accessible to the crowd. Such ideas' images are not connected with each other by any logical connection of analogy or sequence and may replace one another quite as in a magic lantern one glass is replaced by another by a magician's hand taking them out of the box where they have been put together. This is why ideas of the most contradictory nature are held side by side in the crowd. According to the contingencies of the moment, the crowd falls under the influence of one of the various ideas in its stock, and therefore can perform the most contradictory actions, its lack of critical ability prevents it from noticing these contradictions. This phenomenon, however, does not constitute a special feature of the crowd, it can be observed in many isolated individuals, and not only in the primitive man, but in all those who in some aspect of their mind approach it, for example, in the followers of some strongly pronounced religious belief. I have observed this phenomenon in Hindu scholars brought up in our European universities and holding diplomas. On the immutable basic religious or hereditary special ideas they had a layer of Western ideas, which did not change the former foundations at all and had no kinship with them. Under the influence of the accidents of the moment, one or another of these ideas came to the surface, causing the corresponding actions and speeches, and one and the same individual could on this basis present the sharpest contradictions. However, all these contradictions are more apparent than real, because only hereditary ideas alone have such power in an isolated individual that they can direct all his actions. It is only when, through interbreeding, a person has come under the influence of different hereditary impulses that his actions actually become contradictory. It would be superfluous to insist on these phenomena here, although their psychological significance is very important, but I think it takes at least ten years of observation and travel to understand them properly. Ideas accessible to the crowd only in their simplest form often have to undergo profound changes in order to become popular. In the field of philosophical and scientific, more elevated, ideas in particular, one can see the depth of change that is necessary so that these ideas can gradually descend to the level of the concepts of the crowd. These changes are dependent on the category and race to which the crowd belongs, but always have a simplifying and downgrading character. This is why, from the social point of view, there is not really a hierarchy of ideas, i.e., more or less elevated ideas. The mere fact of the penetration of an idea into the crowd and its expression in action is enough to deprive it of everything that has contributed to its sublimity and greatness, no matter how true and great it may have been at its beginning. From the social point of view, however, the hierarchical value of the idea is irrelevant, only its consequences must be taken into account. The medieval mystical ideas, the democratic ideas of the last century, and modern social ideas cannot be called very sublime. From a philosophical point of view it is impossible not to consider them rather unfortunate delusions, and yet, their role has been and will be very great, and they will long be considered the most essential factors in the behavior of states. But even when an idea has undergone changes that have made it accessible to the crowd, it is still effective only if, through known processes, which will be discussed elsewhere, it has penetrated into the unconscious and become a feeling, and this always requires quite a long time. It should not be thought that an idea impresses, even on cultured minds, only if its validity is proven. 
It is easy to see this by observing how little effect even the most immutable evidence has on most people. Obviousness, if it is very conspicuous, may be noticed by an educated individual in a crowd, but the convert, being under the power of the unconscious, will still very quickly revert to his original beliefs. If you see him in a few days, he will again present to you all his former arguments and in the same expressions, for he is under the influence of former ideas, which have become feelings, it is these latter that serve as the deep motives of our speeches and actions. The same thing happens in a crowd. When, through certain processes, an idea finally penetrates into the soul of the crowd, it gains an irresistible power over it and produces a series of consequences that have to be borne. The philosophical ideas that led to the French Revolution took a century to take hold in the soul of the crowd. It is already known what irresistible power they acquired after they had become entrenched. The desire of an entire people to acquire social equality, to realize abstract rights and liberties shook all thrones and deeply shook the Western world. For a full twenty years the nations rushed at each other, and Europe experienced the kind of hecatombs that would have frightened Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. Never before has the world witnessed, to such an extent, the results of the domination of an idea. It takes a very long time for ideas to take root in the soul of the crowd, but it takes no less time for them to disappear from it. That is why the crowd has always been several generations behind the scientists and philosophers when it comes to ideas. All statesmen know nowadays how much is erroneous in the basic ideas I have just spoken about, but as the influence of these ideas is still very strong, statesmen are forced to govern according to principles, in the truth of which they themselves no longer believe. Asterisk 2. The Reasoning of the Crowd it cannot be asserted in an absolute way that the crowd does not reason and does not submit to reasoning. But the arguments which they use, and those which act upon them, belong, from the point of view of logic, to such a class, that it is only on the basis of analogy that they can be called reasoning. The reasonings of the crowd, in spite of their low dignity, are also based on associations, just as those of a more exalted kind but they are connected with each other only by a seeming analogy and consistency. They have exactly the same connection as the ideas of the Eskimo, who knows by experience that ice is transparent and melts in the mouth, and hence concludes that glass, as a transparent body, must also melt in the mouth, or the ideas of the savage, who believes that if he eats the heart of a brave enemy, he thereby acquires his courage or the ideas of the worker who is exploited by his master and concludes that all households must be exploited. The association of dissimilar things, having only an apparent relation to one another, and the immediate generalization of particular cases, are characteristic of the reasoning of the mob. This kind of reasoning is always exhibited by those who know how to control a crowd, and it is the only one that can influence it. The coherence of logical reasoning is completely incomprehensible to the crowd, which is why we are allowed to say that the crowd does not reason or reasons falsely and does not submit to the influence of reasoning. More than once we have to wonder how badly read speeches have had a tremendous impact on the crowd that listens to them. It should not be forgotten, however, that these speeches were intended precisely to fascinate the crowd, not to be read by philosophers. An orator who is in close contact with the crowd knows how to conjure up images that captivate it. If he succeeds in this, his aim will be achieved, and twenty volumes of speeches, always invented afterwards, are often not worth a few successful phrases, uttered in the proper minute and affecting the minds of those who were to be persuaded. We consider it superfluous to add here that this inability of the crowd to reason properly prevents it from being critical of anything, i.e., from distinguishing truth from delusion and having a definite judgment about anything. The judgments of the crowd are always imposed upon them and are never the result of comprehensive discussion. But how many people there are who do not rise above the level of the crowd in this case? The ease with which well-known opinions are sometimes disseminated is precisely due to the fact that most people are unable to form a private opinion based on their own reasoning. Asterisk 3 
crowd expression as in all creatures incapable of reasoning, the reproductive capacity of the imagination of the crowd is very developed, very active, and very receptive to impressions. The image is evoked in the mind of the crowd by some person, an idea of some event or incident are almost equal to real images in their vividness. The crowd, to a certain extent, resembles a sleeper, whose intellect is temporarily inactive and in whose mind the images appear extremely lively, but these images would soon dissipate if it were possible to submit them to reflection. For the crowd, which is incapable neither of thinking nor of reasoning, there is therefore nothing unbelievable, and it is always the unbelievable that amazes the most. That is why the crowd is most of all struck by the miraculous and legendary side of events. When we analyze a civilization, we see that in reality its real pillar is the miraculous and legendary. In history, the seeming has always played a more important role than the real, and the unreal always prevails over the real. A crowd capable of thinking only in images is receptive only to images. Only images can fascinate or horrify them and become the engines of their actions. Theatrical performances, where images are presented to the crowd in the most obvious form, always have a tremendous influence on it. Bread and spectacle were once the ideal of happiness for the Roman mob, and they demanded nothing more. Centuries have passed, but this ideal has changed little. Nothing acts on the imagination of crowds of all categories like theatrical performances. The whole audience experiences the same emotions, and if they are not immediately transformed into action, it is because even the most unconscious spectator cannot help knowing in this case that he is the victim of an illusion and that he has laughed and cried at imaginary, not true, adventures. Sometimes, however, the feelings suggested by the images are so strong that they tend, like ordinary suggestions, to be expressed in actions. Many times already quoted the story of a folk theater, where only dismal dramas were always played on stage. The actor, who portrayed a traitor, was in constant danger on his way out of the theater, and had to be guarded because the audience, outraged by his imagined crimes, were ready to tear him to pieces. I believe that this may serve as one of the most remarkable indications of the mental state of the crowd and particularly of how easily it is indoctrinated. The unreal influences them almost as much as the real, and they have a marked tendency not to distinguish between the two. The power of victors and the strength of states is precisely based on the popular imagination. Crowds are drawn to themselves, acting mainly on their imagination. All the great events of history Buddhism, Christianity, Islamism, reform and revolution, and today's threatening invasion of socialism are the direct or distant result of the powerful impressions produced on the imagination of the multitude. Thus all men of state of all ages and countries, including absolute despots, have always looked to the popular imagination as the basis of their power, and have never dared to act against it. By presenting myself as a Catholic, said Napoleon in the Council of State, I could end the Van Dien War, by presenting myself as a Muslim I strengthened myself in Egypt, and by presenting myself as an ultramontane I brought the Italian paters to my side. If I were to govern the Jewish people, I would rebuild the Temple of Solomon. Never since the days of Alexander and Caesar has any man been better at acting on the imagination of the crowd than Napoleon. He constantly thought only of how to strike their imagination, he took care of it in all his victories, in all his speeches, in all his actions, and even on his deathbed. How the imagination of crowds works is something we shall soon see. For the present we will confine ourselves to noting that we cannot influence the crowd by acting on its intellect and reason, that is, by evidence. Antony, for example, had succeeded in rousing the people against Caesar's murderers, not by clever rhetoric but by reading his will and pointing to his corpse. The images that strike the imagination of the crowd are always simple and clear, not accompanied by any interpretations and only sometimes they are accompanied by some miraculous or mysterious facts, a great victory, a great miracle, a major crime, a great hope. The crowd must always present things in whole images, without pointing out their origins. Petty crimes and accidents do not at all strike the imagination of the crowd, however numerous they may be, 
On the contrary, a major accident or crime has a profound effect on a crowd, even if its consequences were far from being as damaging as those of numerous but minor accidents and crimes. The epidemic of influenza, which a few years ago killed some 5,000 people in Paris, had very little effect on the popular imagination. This veritable hecatomb did not appear in any obvious way, and was only indicated by the weekly statistical reports. But any other kind of major accident, the fall of the Eiffel Tower for example, and if it were not 5.000 but only 500 victims at a time in a public place, would certainly have a much stronger effect on the popular imagination. The Alleged Loss of Life of a transatlantic steamship on the ground that no news of it had been received for a long time, greatly affected the imagination of the crowd, while the official statistics indicate that in 1894 alone 850 sailing ships and 203 steamships were lost. This loss of ships, far more important when viewed in terms of loss of life and goods than the loss of a transatlantic steamer, made exactly no impression on the crowd. It follows that it is not the facts themselves that strike the popular imagination, but the way in which they are distributed and presented to the crowd. It is necessary that, condensing, if I am allowed to put it that way, these facts would present such a striking image that it could occupy completely the minds of the crowd and fill the whole field of its concepts. He who possesses the art of impressing the imagination of the crowd also possesses the art of ruling it. Chapter 4 religious forms into which all the beliefs of the crowd are clothed. What constitutes religious feeling? It is independent of the adoration of any deity. It's characteristic. The power of belief clothed in religious form. Various examples. Folk gods have never disappeared. New forms in which they are revived. The religious forms of atheism. The significance of these concepts from a historical point of view. The Reform, the Night of Bartholomew, the Terror, and similar events are the consequence of the religious feelings of the mob, not of individuals. We have already said that the crowd does not reason, that it accepts or rejects ideas entirely, that it tolerates neither argument nor contradiction, that suggestion takes over its thinking faculties entirely and immediately seeks to pass into action. We pointed out that the crowd under the influence of the corresponding suggestion is ready to sacrifice itself for the sake of the ideal inspired to it and that only strong and extreme feelings are peculiar to it, and sympathy quickly turns into adoration, and antipathy, having just appeared, immediately turns into hatred. These general guidelines allow us to anticipate the beliefs of the crowd. Examining closer the beliefs of the crowd, both during epochs of faith and during great political upheavals, such as those of the preceding century, we can see that these beliefs always take a special form which I cannot better define than by calling it religious feeling. This feeling is characterized very simply, adoration of a supposed supreme being, fear of the magical power attributed to him, blind obedience to his commands, an inability to challenge his tenets, a desire to spread them a desire to look upon all those who do not recognize them as enemies these are the main features of this feeling. Whether this feeling refers to an invisible god, to a stone or wooden idol, to a hero, to a political idea, from the moment it has the above features, it already has a religious essence. The supernatural and the miraculous meet in it to the same degree. The crowd unconsciously awards mysterious power to a political formula or to a victorious leader who excites its fanaticism at the moment. Religiosity is not conditioned by adoration of a deity alone, it is also expressed when all the means of the mind, the subordination of the will, the fervor of fanaticism are given over entirely to the service of some cause or entity, which becomes the goal and guide of the thoughts and actions of the crowd. Intolerance and fanaticism are a necessary part of every religious feeling and are inevitable in those who think they possess the secret of earthly or eternal bliss. These traits are found in every group of people who rebel in the name of some belief. The Jacobins at the time of the Terror were as deeply religious as the Catholics at the time of the Inquisition, and their ferocious ardor stemmed from the same source. All the beliefs of the mob have such features of blind obedience, of fierce intolerance, of the need for the most furious propaganda, 
as are inherent in religious feeling, this is why we are entitled to say that the beliefs of the mob always have a religious form. The hero worship by the crowd is truly God to the crowd. Napoleon was one for fifteen years, and never before has any deity had such devoted worshippers or sent people to their deaths with such ease. Pagan and Christian gods have never exercised such absolute power over the souls they subdue. The founders of religious or political beliefs could only achieve their goal because they could instill in the crowd a sense of fanaticism that made people find happiness in adoration and obedience and willingly sacrifice their lives for their idol. This has been the case at all times. In his excellent book on Roman Gaul, Fustel de Colanges points out that the Roman Empire was held together not by force but by the sense of religious admiration it inspired. It would have been an unparalleled case in history, he says not without reason, when a regime hated by the people held on for five whole centuries. It would be impossible to explain to ourselves how thirty legions of empire could have forced obedience on a hundred million people. If these millions obeyed, it was only because the emperor, who personified Roman greatness in their eyes, was adored with common consent, like a god. In the smallest village of the empire, altars were erected to the emperor. In the souls of the people, from one side of the empire to the other, a new religion was born in which the deities were emperors. A few years before the Christian era the whole of Gaul, comprising sixty cities, erected together a temple to Augustus near Lyons. The priests chosen by the assembly of the Gallic cities were the first persons in the country. One cannot attribute all this to a sense of fear and servility. Whole nations cannot be servile, or at any rate cannot have been servile for three centuries. The emperor was adored, not by the kings, but by Rome, and not only by Rome, but by all of Gaul, Spain, Greece, and Asia. Nowadays the great conquerors of souls are no longer built altars, but statues are erected to them and the cult accorded to them now does not differ markedly from that which was accorded to them in former times. The philosophy of history becomes intelligible to us only when we have fully grasped the basic points of crowd psychology, indicating that, for the crowd, one must be a god or nothing. We should not think that these prejudices of past centuries have been finally banished by reason. In its eternal struggle against reason, feeling has never been defeated. The crowd no longer wants to hear the words deity and religion, in the name of which it has been enslaved for so long, but never has it possessed so many fetishes as it has in the last hundred years, and never has it erected so many altars and monuments to its old deities. Those who have studied the popular movement of recent years, known as Belangism, must have been convinced of the ease with which the religious instincts of the mob are revived. There was not a single village in that did not have a picture of the hero. He was credited with the power to destroy all calamities and restore justice, thousands were willing to give their lives for him. What a place he might have occupied in history if his character had been at the height of that legend. There is no need to repeat here that the crowd needs religion, for all beliefs, political, divine, and social, are assimilated by it only if they are clothed in a religious form that allows no contestation. If it were possible to make the crowd internalize atheism, it would express itself in the same fervent intolerance as any religious feeling, and in its outward forms would soon become a real cult. The evolution of the little sect of positivists confirms this point in a curious way. The same thing happened to it as to the nihilist whose story the profound writer Dostoevsky tells us. Illumined one day by the light of reason, this nihilist smashed the images of deity and saints that adorned the altar of his chapel, extinguished the wax candles and, without wasting a moment, replaced the destroyed images with creations of atheist philosophers like Buchner and Molshot, and reverently lit the candles again. The subject of his religious beliefs had changed, but could it really be said that his religious feeling had also changed? Some historical events, and even the most important ones, only become intelligible I repeat this when we have fully understood the religious form into which all the beliefs of the crowd always end up being clothed. There are social phenomena that must be studied from the point of view of a psychologist rather than that of a naturalist. 
Our great historian Taine studied revolution only as a naturalist, which is why the genesis of events often eluded him. He observed the facts perfectly, but not knowing the psychology of the crowd, he did not always get to their sources. The facts frightened him by their bloodthirsty, anarchistic and ferocious character, he saw in the heroes of this great epic only a pack of savage epileptics, obeying their instincts without any barrier, but all the violence of the revolution, the murders, the need for propaganda, the declaration of war on all kings, are easily explained if one looks at them simply as the appearance of a new religious belief in the soul of the mob. The Reformation, the Night of Bartholomew, the Religious Wars, the Inquisition, the Terror all these are also phenomena, committed by a mob animated by religious sentiment, which necessarily require the extermination with fire and sword of all that opposes the consolidation of the new belief. The methods of the Inquisition are those of all sincerely convinced men, and they would not be so if they had used other methods. The upheavals similar to those I have just cited would not be possible if the soul of the mob did not cause them. None of the most absolute despots could have caused them. When historians tell us that Bartholomew's night was the work of a king, they only indicate by this that the psychology of the mob is as unfamiliar to them as the psychology of kings. Manifestations of this kind are produced only by the soul of the crowd, the most absolute of monarchs, the most despotic can only either hasten their appearance or slow them down. It was not the kings who created the night of Bartholomew, the religious wars, and it was not Robespierre, Danton, or Saint Just who created terror. It was the soul of the mob, not the power of kings, that acted in all these events. Asterisk Section 2 Crowds' Views and Beliefs Chapter 1 The Remote Factors of Crowd Opinions and Beliefs The Preparatory Factors of Crowd Beliefs The development of these beliefs is a consequence of prior processing. Asterisk 1 Race Its Predominant Influence In this influence is expressed by the suggestion of the ancestors. Asterisk 2 Traditions Traditions serve as an expression of the synthesis of the soul of the race. The social significance of traditions. What is their harm? The crowd is the most enduring guardian of traditional ideas. Asterisk 3. Time. It consistently prepares the consolidation of beliefs and then their destruction. Its influence restores order out of chaos. Asterisk 4. Political and social institutions. Misconceptions about their role. They are a consequence, not a cause. Institutions are nothing but labels which cover the most dissimilar things by one common name. How constitutions are made. The need of some nations for known, theoretically bad, institutions, such as centralization. Asterisk 5. Education and upbringing. The modern misconception of the influence of education on the crowd. Statistical indications. The demoralizing role of Latin education. The role that education could play. Examples found in various nations. Having studied the spiritual structure of the mob, its ways of thinking, feeling, and reasoning, we now turn to an examination of how its opinions and beliefs arise and are established. The factors determining the nature of a crowd's opinions and beliefs are of two kinds, immediate factors and remote factors. Distant factors are those which make a crowd receptive to known beliefs and quite incapable of absorbing some other views. These factors prepare the ground upon which, later on, some new idea will suddenly emerge with startling force and results. The suddenness of the emergence of these ideas, however, is only apparent. It is true that some ideas often arise in a crowd and are carried out with lightning speed, but this is so only at first sight, for in reality this explosion is always the result of long preceding work. The immediate factors influencing the crowd act on the ground already prepared by the distant factors and would not have produced any results without them, they generate in the crowd an act of confidence, i.e. they put the idea into a certain form and develop it with all its consequences. Thanks to these direct factors, decisions arise in the crowd which fascinate it, thanks to them a riot breaks out, a strike is staged, 
or a vast majority suddenly raises a man to power or overthrows the government. In all the great events of history we can observe the consistent action of these twin factors. Take one of the most striking examples, the French Revolution. The remote factors of this event were the creations of philosophers, the extortions of the aristocracy, and the advances of scientific thought. The soul of the crowd thus prepared was easily already captivated by the immediate factors, such as the speeches of orators and the resistance of the court to the smallest reforms. Distant factors include those common factors found in the depths of all crowd beliefs and opinions, such as race, tradition, time, institutions, and upbringing. Let us now try to examine the role of all these various factors. Asterisk 1. Race. This factor, race, should come first, for in its importance it surpasses all others. We have previously pointed out its influence, and therefore we shall not return to this question again. In the preceding work we spoke of what an historical race is, and what power it receives, through the law of heredity, after its features have been finally formed, then its beliefs, institutions and arts, in a word all the elements of its civilization are no longer anything other than the outward expression of its soul. The influence of race is such that none of these elements can pass from one people to another without undergoing the most profound changes. The environment, circumstances, and events serve only as expressions of the social compulsions of the moment. All this may have a considerable influence, but it is always short-lived, if it only goes against the indoctrinated ideas of the race, i.e., of the whole series of ancestors. We shall have occasion more than once to return to this influence of race and to point out how great it is and how it prevails even in special features of the soul of the crowd. This explains, for example, the fact that the crowds of different countries have great differences in their beliefs and actions, and that they cannot be influenced in the same way. Asterisk 2. Traditions. Traditions express the ideas, needs, and feelings of a past race, in them lies the synthesis of race, pressing down on us with all its weight. Since this thought I have expressed is still new history is difficult to understand without it I have devoted four chapters to it in my previous work, Psychology of Nations. The reader will see from these chapters that, despite their deceptive appearance, neither language, nor religion, nor the arts, in a word, nor any of the elements of civilization pass in an inviolable form from one people to another. The biological sciences have undergone great changes since embryology showed what a tremendous influence the past has on the evolution of living beings. The same change will occur in historical science when the idea of past influences becomes more widespread. This idea has not yet been sufficiently disseminated, and many statesmen are still imbued with the ideas of last-century theorists who thought that society could break with its past and could be remade in all directions if guided by the light of reason. A nation is an organism created by the past, and like any organism it cannot be changed except by a long hereditary accumulation. People are guided by tradition, especially when they are in a crowd, and only the names and outward forms are changed easily. There is nothing to complain about. There can be no national soul or civilization without traditions. That is why one of the main occupations of man since he has existed has been to create a network of tradition and to destroy it after the beneficial effect of tradition has dried up. Without tradition, there can be no civilization, without the destruction of tradition, there can be no progress. The difficulty is to find a balance between constancy and variability and the difficulty is great. If any people allow habits to become firmly entrenched for several generations, they can no longer change and, like China, become incapable of improvement. Violent revolutions can do nothing here, for the fragments of a broken chain either become melded together again, and the past again, without any change, acquires its power, or these fragments remain scattered, and then anarchy is soon followed by decay. Thus the ideal of every people consists in preserving the institutions of the past and in changing them gradually and insensibly little by little. But this ideal is very difficult to achieve. The ancient Romans and the modern English are the only ones who realize this ideal. 
it is the crowd that is the staunchest guardian of traditional ideas and that most stubbornly resists change especially those categories of the crowd that are called castes. I have already pointed out this conservative spirit of the crowd and said that the most violent outrages only lead to a change of words. Given the destruction of the churches at the end of the last century, the executions and expulsions of priests, and the general persecution to which the whole Catholic cult was subjected, one would think, of course, that the old religious ideas had lost their power for good. And yet, only a few years afterwards, the abolished cult was restored in consequence of the general demands. The traditions, superseded for a time, regained their reign. The report of a former member of the convention, Fercroy, quoted by Taine, speaks quite clearly of this attitude. The ubiquitous celebration of Sunday and the attendance of churches indicates that the mass of the French desire a return to former customs, and now is not the time to resist this national inclination. The great mass of people need religion, cults, and priests. The mistake of several modern philosophers, in which I have been involved, has been precisely in thinking that education, if it spreads sufficiently among the people, can destroy religious prejudices. These prejudices are a source of comfort to a great many unhappy people. We must, therefore, leave to the masses its priests, its altars, and cults. No example shows better than this what power tradition has over the soul of the crowd. It is not in temples that the most dangerous idols are to be sought, nor in palaces that the most despotic of tyrants dwell. Both can be destroyed in a moment. But the true, invisible rulers who reign in our souls elude all attempt at outrage and yield only to the slow action of the ages. Asterisk 3. Time. In social, as in biological problems, one of the most energetic factors is time. Time is the only true creator and the only great destroyer. Time has erected mountains of grains of sand and elevated to human dignity the obscure cell of geological epochs. The intervention of centuries is enough for any phenomenon to undergo complete change. It is rightly said that an ant could have smoothed Mont Blanc if only it had been given the time to do so. If any creature were given the magical power to change the course of time at will, this power would be tantamount to the power attributed by believers to God alone. We will confine ourselves here to considering the influence of time on the genesis of the opinions of the crowd. In this respect its action is very great, and it is subject to such great forces as races, which could not have formed without it. Time contributes to the emergence, development, and destruction of beliefs, time gives them strength and power, and time deprives them of both. Time prepares the opinions and beliefs of the crowd, or at least the ground on which they can develop. That is why some ideas can only be realized in certain epochs because they do not develop and arise suddenly or accidentally, and the roots of each of them can be found in the very distant past. If there is a flowering of these ideas, it means that time has prepared it. And the genesis of these ideas becomes clear only if we look to the past. Ideas are daughters of the past and mothers of the future and always slaves to time. So time is our true master, and we need only allow it to act to see the change in all things. At the moment, we are disturbed by the formidable claims of the crowd and the destruction and upheaval they seem to be preparing for us. But time will take care to restore the balance. No regime arises overnight, says Lavas. Political and social organizations are built up over centuries. Feudalism existed in a formless and chaotic form for centuries until it submitted to known rules. Absolute monarchy also existed for many centuries until the right governmental regime was found, and in all these transitional periods there was always great turmoil. Asterisk 4. Political and Social Institutions It is still quite common that institutions can serve to correct the faults of society, that the progress of nations is a consequence of improvements in institutions and governments, and that social change can be produced by decrees. The French Revolution had as its starting point precisely this idea, and modern social theories find a foothold in it. Yet long experience has not been able to seriously shake this dangerous chimera, and historians and philosophers have tried in vain to prove its groundlessness. 
They, however, would have had no difficulty in proving that all institutions are the product of ideas, feelings, and morals, and that these ideas, feelings, and morals cannot be so easily remade by a mere change in the codes. The people do not choose their own institutions, just as they do not choose their own eye and hair color. Institutions and governments are the product of race, and it is not they who create the age, but the age that creates them. Nations are not governed as their character requires. It takes centuries to form a political regime, and it takes centuries to change it. Institutions in themselves can be neither good nor bad, and those that are good for some people at a given moment may be quite unsuitable for them at another time. Therefore, it is not in the power of the people to change these institutions in reality, they can only change the names of institutions through violent revolutions, but their essence will not change. Names, however, do not matter, they are nothing more than labels, and the historian, who penetrates into the very essence of things, will not pay much attention to them. Thus, for example, the most democratic country in the world, England, is governed by a monarchical regime, while in the Spanish-American republics, despite their republican institutions, the heaviest despotism reigns. The destinies of nations are determined by their character, not by their governments. In my previous work I have endeavored to prove this by striking examples. This is recognized even in the United States by the most advanced of Republicans. The American Magazine Forum expressed the following categorical opinion on this point, which I borrow from the December 1894 Review of Reviews. Even the most ardent enemies of the aristocracy must not forget that England is the most democratic country in the world, where the rights of the individual are most respected and where the individual enjoys the greatest liberty. Thus the careful drafting of a constitution seems to be an unnecessary and useless exercise in rhetoric, since time and necessity will themselves take care to produce a suitable form of constitution, if we leave these two factors to act. This is what the Anglo-Saxons did, as we learn from the great English historian Macaulay, whose words on the subject should be learned by heart to all politicians of Latin countries, proving how much good laws which from the point of view of pure reason seemed a collection of absurdities and contradictions, did. Macaulay compares the various constitutions that perished during the unrest of the Latin peoples of Europe and America with the Constitution of England, and says that this latter was changed slowly, in parts, under the influence of immediate need, but never on the ground of speculative reasoning. Not caring for symmetry, says Macaulay, but thinking most of all of usefulness, not abolishing anomalies merely on the ground that they are anomalies, not introducing new things until they are uncomfortable, innovations being allowed only insofar as they are necessary to remove that feeling, not going beyond the particular case to be helped, are the rules which have generally guided our 250 parliaments from John's time to the Victorian age. It is necessary to study the laws and institutions of each nation separately in order to form a clear idea of the extent to which they serve as an expression of the needs of the race and, therefore, cannot be changed by violent means. One can philosophically argue about the advantages and disadvantages of centralization, but if we remember that the Great Revolution, which tried to overthrow all the institutions of the past, not only had to respect this centralization, but even increased it, we are forced to admit that this institution is a product of absolute necessity and that it is a condition for the existence of people, therefore we should regret the narrow-mindedness of some politicians who demand its elimination. If by chance they succeeded in destroying it, it would immediately set off a terrible civil war, which would again lead to a centralization that would be even worse than the last one. If we draw a parallel between the present deep religious and political divisions which divide the various parties in France and which constitute mainly a racial question, and the separatist tendencies which were revealed during the revolutionary era and which reasserted themselves towards the end of the Franco-Prussian War, we see that the different races which exist in France are far from having merged among themselves. Vigorous centralization and the establishment of artificial departments, which were to produce a merger of the former provinces, were without doubt the most useful things of the revolution. But if decentralization could be effected, of which inconsiderate people now talk so much, it would very soon lead to the bloodiest strife. 
not to acknowledge this would be to ignore the whole history of our country. From all this we must conclude that we cannot act on the soul of the mob by means of institutions. If we see that some countries, for example, United States, have attained a high degree of prosperity by having democratic institutions, while in others, such as the Spanish-American republics, the saddest anarchy reigns in spite of the same exact institutions, still here the institutions are in no way to blame for the greatness of some, nor for the decadence of others. Nations are governed by the properties of their character, and such institutions, which do not correspond in the most exact way to the character of the race, are nothing but borrowed garments, temporary disguises. Bloody wars and violent revolutions have arisen and will arise more than once in order to introduce institutions to which supernatural power to create human happiness is ascribed, like relics of saints. In a sense, of course, one could say that institutions act on the soul of the crowd because they give rise to such revolts, but in fact it is not institutions that act here at all, for whether they will be defeated or triumph, they still do not possess any qualities in themselves. Only illusions, and especially words, chimerical and powerful, act on the crowd, and we shall show shortly how great their marvelous influence on the crowd is. Asterisk 5. Education and education in the first row of ideas which have prevailed in any epoch and have power, in spite of their often illusory character and their fewness, we must place at present the following, education is able to change men greatly and must necessarily improve them and even create equality between them. By repetition this assurance has become one of the most unshakable tenets of democracy, and it is as difficult to touch it now as it was once difficult to touch the tenets of the church. But on this point, as on many others, democratic ideas have been at complete odds with the data of psychology and experience. Many famous philosophers, including Herbert Spencer, have easily proved that education makes a man neither more moral nor happier, and changes neither his instincts nor his hereditary passions, and sometimes even, if only badly directed, does more harm than good. Statisticians have confirmed this view by showing us that crime increases with the generalization of education, or at least with the generalization of a certain kind of education. In his recent work, Adolf Gio points out that there are now 3,000 educated criminals per 1,000 uneducated, and in the interval of 50 years the number of criminals has increased from 227 per 100,000 inhabitants to 552 and thus has increased by 143%. No one would deny, no doubt, that a properly directed education can produce very useful practical results, if not in the sense of improving morals then at least in the sense of developing professional abilities. Unfortunately, the Latin peoples, especially during the last 25 years, have founded their educational systems on completely false principles and, despite the words of the most famous men such as Brol, Fustel de Colanges, Taine and others, they continue to insist on their sad delusions. I have already pointed out in a previous work how our modern educational system makes enemies of society of those who have received this education, and how it prepares followers of the worst kinds of socialism. The main danger of this educational system, quite rightly called the Latin system, is that it relies on the basic psychological delusion that memorizing textbooks develops the mind. On the basis of this belief, one is forced to learn as much as possible, and from elementary school until his degree the young man does nothing but memorize books, without any exercise in his reasoning ability or initiative. All learning consists for him in answering by heart and obeying. To learn, wrote Jules Simon, a former minister of education, to know a grammar by heart, to repeat and imitate by heart, is a funny kind of education where every effort is an act of faith in the infallibility of the teacher and leads to our emasculation and helplessness. If such an education were only useless, we could limit ourselves to lamenting the unfortunate children who prefer to be taught the genealogy of the sons of Clothery, or the history of the struggles of Neustria and Austrosia, or the zoological classifications, instead of teaching them anything useful in an elementary school. But this system of education poses a far more serious danger, it instills in those who receive it an aversion to the conditions of their social position, 
so that the peasant no longer wishes to remain a peasant, and the very last of the bourgeois sees no other career for his son than that represented by positions paid for by the state. Instead of preparing people for life, the school prepares them only for public offices, where they can succeed without taking the slightest initiative or acting independently. At the bottom of the ladder, this educational system produces armies of proletarians discontented with their lot in life and ready for indignation, at the top, it produces a gullible and skeptical bourgeoisie believing in the providential power of the state, against which, however, it is constantly on the front line, always blaming the government for its own mistakes, while at the same time being itself resolutely incapable of undertaking anything without the intervention of the state. The state, which produces all these graduated gentlemen, can use only a very small number of them, leaving all the others without any business, and in this way it feeds some and creates enemies in others. A great mass of diplomates now besieges all official posts, and for every, even the humblest, official post, candidates are counted in thousands, while some negotiant, for instance, has great difficulty in finding an agent who can be his representative in the colonies. In the Department of the Seine alone, there are 20,000 teachers and teacheresses without any occupation, who, despising crafts and field work, turn to the state for the means of life. Since the number of those chosen is limited, the number of discontented inevitably increases, and these latter are ready to take part in all kinds of disturbances, whatever their aims and whatever their leaders. The acquisition of such knowledge, which then cannot be applied to business, serves as a sure means of stirring up discontent in man. This phenomenon is not peculiar to Latin countries, we can observe the same in China, a country also governed by a solid hierarchy of mandarins, where the title of mandarin is attained, as with us, by a contest, with the whole test consisting in reciting by heart a thick manual without error. An army of scholars with no occupation is now regarded in China as a true national disaster. The same has been observed in India since the English open schools there, not for education, as they do in England, but only to educate the natives. As a consequence, a special class of scholars, the Babu, was formed in India, who, without classes, became irreconcilable enemies of English rule. In all Babus, whether they had classes or not, the first result of the education they received was a decline in morals. This fact, of which I have spoken much in my book Less Civilizations de Linda, is stated by all the authors who have visited India. To go back now seems to be too late. Only experience, the last educator of nations, will take it upon itself to point out to us our mistakes, and only experience will be able to convince us of the need to replace our wretched manuals, our wretched contests with a professional education that will return our youth to the fields, workshops and colonial enterprises that they are avoiding by all means at present. This vocational education, which all enlightened minds are now so eager to attain, once existed in our country, and the peoples who now dominate the world by their will, initiative, and spirit of enterprise have succeeded in preserving it. The great thinker Taine has clearly proved in his remarkable work that the former education we had was almost the same as that which now exists in England and America, and, drawing a remarkable parallel between the Latin and Anglo-Saxon educational system, he has clearly indicated the consequences of both methods. It might, at most, be possible to reconcile ourselves to all the inconveniences of our classical education, though it would create the discontented and the dislocated, if the superficial acquisition of so much knowledge, memorizing so many manuals by heart, could actually increase the mental level. Alas, it did not. Reason, experience, initiative, and character are the conditions for success in life, which books are not. Books are dictionaries, very useful for reference, but it is useless to keep long passages in one's head. The extent to which vocational education can more classically assist the development of the mind is explained by Tan as follows. Ideas are formed only in their natural and normal environment. The development of the germ of these ideas is facilitated by the innumerable impressions which the young man receives daily in the workshop, in the mine, in the court, in the classroom, in the shipyard, in the hospital, in the sight of tools, materials and operations in the presence of customers, workers, 
labor, work, well or badly done, and profitable or profitable. All these small private perceptions of the eyes, the ear, the hands, and even the sense of smell, involuntarily retained in memory and secretly recycled, are organized in the mind of man to inspire sooner or later some new combination, simplification, economy, improvement or invention. The young Frenchman is deprived of all these precious perceptions, of contact with elements easily assimilated and necessary, and moreover deprived at the most fruitful age. For seven or eight years he is locked up in school, away from the direct and personal experience that could give him a precise and profound conception of things, of people and of the various ways of dealing with them. At least nine out of ten have lost their time and labor in the few years of their lives, and moreover in the years that can be considered the most effective, the most important and even the most decisive. Subtract, first of all, half or two-thirds of those who present themselves for examinations, that is, those who were rejected, then, from those who were admitted, who received degrees, certificates, diplomas, subtract also half or two-thirds I speak of the overworked. Too much was demanded of them, forcing them on such a day, sitting in a chair or in front of some painting, to pretend for two hours in the presence of a group of scholars to be the living stock of all human knowledge. Indeed, they were such a receptacle for two hours that day, but a month later they would no longer be able to take the examination again. The knowledge they had acquired, too numerous and too heavy, continually disappeared from their minds, and they acquired no new ones. Their mental power is shaken, its fertile juices have dried up, before us a man is already ready and often completely finished. Having settled down, married and submitted to the necessity of rotating in one and the same circle, he closes himself in the narrow limits of his service, which he performs in a correct way, but does not go further. The famous psychologist then points out to us the difference that exists between our system and that of the Anglo-Saxons. The latter do not have as many special schools as we do, they do not train with books, but with the subjects themselves. The engineer is trained there directly in a workshop, not in a school, and this gives everyone an opportunity to acquire the knowledge which suits his mental capacity, to remain a simple laborer, or to become a foreman if he is unable to go on, or to become an engineer if his ability permits it. Such a method is no doubt far more democratic and far more useful to society than one which makes the entire career of an 18 or 20 year old dependent on a trial lasting only a few hours. In a hospital, in the mines, in a factory, in an architect, in a lawyer, an apprentice who enters at a very young age goes through the whole course of study and practice, almost as we have a clerk in an office or a painter in a studio. Before entering the school, he may have already taken a short general course, which serves as a basis on which the new knowledge is layered. He also often has some technical courses at his fingertips which he can attend in his spare time in order to put in order the observations he has made from his daily experience. Under this regime, the practical abilities of the pupil increase and develop by themselves, just to the extent that corresponds to his natural gifts, and in the direction necessary for his future activity, for the special work to which he wants to adapt himself. Thus, in England and the United States, a young man very soon manages to make the most of his talents. At the age of 25, unless he lacks substance and intelligence, he can already be not only a useful doer, but even an entrepreneur, not only a machine, but an engine. In France, where the opposite system has prevailed, taking on a more and more Chinese character with each generation, the total amount of strength being lost is very great and the great philosopher comes to the following conclusion concerning the growing discrepancy between our Latin education and life. In all three stages of learning in childhood, adolescence, and adolescence theoretical and school training by means of books has become longer and more burdensome in view of examinations and degrees and diplomas and certificates. This lengthening and aggravation of school studies is caused by the application of an unnatural regime of postponing practical study, artificial exercises and mechanical stuffing of the head with unnecessary information, and overwork. Neither the real world which the young man has to enter, the surrounding society to which he must adapt himself, 
nor the confrontations of life to which he must be beforehand well prepared, fortified, and armed, otherwise he will be unable to resist and defend himself, are taken into account by this system of education. Our schools do not give their pupils this preparation, more important than any other, nor do they equip him with the necessary firmness of sense, will, and nerve. On the contrary, instead of preparing the pupil for the conditions of life to come, the school deprives him of the qualities necessary for it. Hence the fact that his entry into life, his first steps in the field of practical activity are often accompanied by a series of unpleasant defeats, causing him a feeling of grief and humiliation, which does not disappear for long and sometimes cripples him forever. This is a severe and dangerous ordeal, moral and mental equilibrium may suffer from it and risk never quite being restored. Disappointment comes too suddenly and can be too complete, the delusion was too great and the trouble will be too great. These were roughly the last pages written by Tan. They perfectly summarize the results of the great philosopher's long experience. I think they are completely incomprehensible, unfortunately, to our university professors who have not been abroad. Education is the only means we possess to act somewhat on the soul of the people, and it is sad to think that there is almost no one in France who can understand that our modern education constitutes a dangerous element of rapid decay, and instead of developing our youth, it perverts and humiliates them. It would be useful to compare these pages by Taine with the observations made on the educational system in America by Paul Bourget, and compiled in his excellent book Outremer, admitting, too, that our educational system creates only limited bourgeoisie without initiative and without will or anarchists two types equally dangerous a civilized man spinning fruitlessly amid powerless banality or carried away by a madness of destruction the author makes a comparison quite noteworthy. He compares our French lycées, these factories of degeneration, and the American schools, which excellently prepare man for life. Here you can clearly see the gulf that exists between truly democratic nations and those whose democratic ideas exist only in speech and not in thought. We have not distanced ourselves in any way from the psychology of the mob in the preceding lines. To understand the ideas and beliefs nesting in the crowd at the present moment and ready to manifest tomorrow in full development, one must know how the ground was prepared for it. The education given to the younger generation in a country allows us to foresee what fate awaits that country. The upbringing received by today's generation justifies the darkest predictions in this regard. Education and upbringing can, to a certain extent, improve or corrupt the soul of a crowd. It was necessary to point out the effect of the modern system on it and how the mass of indifferent and neutral individuals has gradually turned into a vast army of dissatisfied individuals ready to obey all the suggestions of utopians and rhetoricians. It is in the schools that the future fall of the Latin nations is prepared. Chapter 2 The Immediate Factors of the Opinions of the Crowd Asterisk 1 Images, Words, and Formulas, The Magical Power of Words and Formulas The powerful influence of words is due to the images they evoke, and is independent of their real meaning. Images change according to time and race. The dilapidation of words. The changing meaning of words according to race. Different meaning of the word democracy in Europe and America. Asterisk 2. Illusions. Their meaning. They underlie all civilizations. The social necessity of illusions. The crowd always prefers them to the truth. Asterisk 3. Experience. Only experience can solidify necessary truths in the soul of the crowd and destroy illusions that have become dangerous. What is the cost of the experience necessary to convince a crowd? Asterisk 4. Reason. The insignificance of its influence on a crowd. A crowd can be influenced by acting on its unconscious feelings. The role of logic in history. The Secret Causes of Unbelievable Events In the preceding chapter we have examined the remote and preparatory factors which develop in the crowd soul a peculiar susceptibility by virtue of which certain feelings and ideas arise in the crowd. Now we need to consider the factors that act on the crowd in a direct way. 
In the next chapter we will see how these factors must be handled in order for them to have their effect. In the first part of our work we examine the feelings, ideas, and reasoning of crowds, and from this we can draw a general conclusion about the ways in which the soul of a crowd is influenced. We already know what strikes the imagination of the crowd, the power and contagiousness of suggestions, especially those presented in the form of images, but since the origin of suggestions is very diverse, the factors that can act on the soul of the crowd may be very different, therefore it is necessary to study them separately, and such study will not be a useless work. The crowd is somewhat like the sphinx of an ancient tale, we must either learn to solve the riddles offered to us by its psychology, or we must resign ourselves to being swallowed by the crowd. 1. Images, words, and formulas in studying the imagination of crowds, we have seen that it is very easy to act on them, especially with images. Such images are not always at our disposal, but they can be evoked through the skillful application of words and formulas. Skillfully processed formulas obtain indeed the magical power which was once attributed to them by the adepts of magic. They can excite the most formidable storms in the soul of the crowd, but they can also calm them. It would be possible to erect a pyramid, much higher than the Pyramid of Cheops, from the bones of only those people who have fallen victims of the power of words and formulas. The power of words is in close connection with the images they evoke and does not depend at all on their real meaning. Very often words with the most indefinite meaning have the greatest influence on a crowd. Such are, for example, the terms democracy, socialism, equality, freedom, etc., which are so vague that even thick volumes fail to explain their meaning precisely. Meanwhile, in them undoubtedly lies a magical power, as if in fact in them is hidden the solution of all problems. They form the synthesis of all unconscious diverse aspirations and hopes for their realization. Neither reason nor conviction can fight against known words and known formulas. They are uttered before the crowd with reverence, and immediately the expression of faces becomes reverent and heads bow. Many look upon them as forces of nature or supernatural powers. They evoke grandiose and vague images in the soul, and the uncertainty surrounding them only increases their mysterious power. They are mysterious deities hidden behind the tabernacle, which believers approach with awe. The images evoked by the words, regardless of their meaning, change according to time and nations, though the formulas themselves remain unchanged. Some words are temporarily associated with the familiar images they evoke. The word then plays the role of a bell, causing them to appear. Not all words and formulas have the ability to cause images. It happens so that the words that used to evoke images were out and no longer evoke anything in the mind. They then become empty sounds, the only benefit of which is that they relieve those who use them of the obligation to think. With a small stock of such formulas and generalities, learned when we were young, we have all we need to get through life without tiring ourselves out with thinking. The words that make up a certain known language change very slowly over the centuries but the images that they evoke and the meaning that is given to them change without ceasing. That's why I said earlier that an exact translation of the expressions of a language, especially when it comes to a vanished people, is quite impossible. For instance, what do we do when we substitute a French term for a Latin, Greek, or Sanskrit, or try to understand a book written in our own language two or three centuries ago? We are simply replacing, with images and ideas formed in our minds under the influence of modern life, those concepts and images quite unlike ours, which originated under the influence of ancient life in the souls of races that were in completely different conditions of existence. When the people of the Revolution copied the ancient Greeks and Romans, did they not give the words of the ancients exactly the meaning they never had? What similarity could there be, for example, between the institutions of the ancient Greeks and those that bear similar names today? What was a republic in those days but an institution, aristocratic in essence, an assemblage of little despots ruling over a crowd of slaves in the most absolute subordination? These communal aristocracies, relying on slavery, could not exist one minute without it. And the word liberty, 
could it mean the same thing that it means now, in an age when the possibility of free thought was not even suspected and there was no greater and rarer crime than reasoning about the gods, the laws and customs of the state? The word fatherland, for example, in the mind of an Athenian or a Spartan, was only the cult of Athens or Sparta, and not of the whole of Greece, which consisted of cities competing with each other and waging constant war with each other. What meaning did this same word fatherland have for the ancient Gauls, who were divided into rival tribes, distinct in race, language and religion, and easily defeated by Caesar, because he constantly had allies among them? Only Rome gave the Gauls a fatherland, bringing them political and religious unity. Even without looking so far, we see that only two centuries ago the word fatherland was understood quite differently than it is now by French aristocrats like the great Condé, who allied themselves with foreigners against their monarch. And did not the same word have a different meaning for the émigrés who thought they were obeying the laws of honor by fighting against France? From their point of view they no doubt obeyed those laws, for the feudal law attaches the vassal to his lord and not to the land, and hence where that lord is, there is the true fatherland. There are many words whose meaning has changed in this way, and getting to their original meaning is not easy at all. It is rightly said that one must read a lot before one can understand what such words as king and royalty meant to our ancestors. What can we say about more complicated terms? Thus, the meaning of words is impermanent, temporary, and changes with the times and the nations. If we want to act on a crowd with these words, we must first know what they mean at a given moment, not what they once meant, or can mean, to individuals with a different spiritual organization. Thus, when, after various political negotiations and changes in religious beliefs, a deep antipathy to the images evoked by known words arises in the crowd, the first duty of a true statesman must be to change the words. In doing so, of course, he must not touch the essence of things, since these latter are too closely connected with the hereditary organization of the people to be changed. The judicious Tocqueville has long since drawn attention to the fact that the labors of the consulate and the empire consisted mainly in dressing up most of the institutions of the past in new words, that is, in replacing words that evoked unpleasant images in the imagination of the crowd with others whose newness prevented the appearance of those images. Thus, for example, the names of taxes were changed, although the taxes and fees remained essentially the same. The most important duty of statesmen must be, therefore, to rename and call by popular or neutral names those things, which the crowd can no longer tolerate under their former names. The power of words is so great that it is only necessary to think up refined names for some of the most disgusting things that the crowd immediately accepts them. Taine rightly observes that it was by calling for liberty and fraternity words very popular at the time that the Jacobins could install a despotism worthy of Dahomey, a judgment worthy of the Inquisition, and organize human hecatombs reminiscent of the hecatombs of ancient Mexico. The art of rulers, as well as of lawyers, is precisely that of knowing how to handle words. The main difficulty of this art is that in the same society, but in different social strata, the same words very often have quite different meanings. On the surface, these social strata use the same exact words, but the words never have the same meaning. In the preceding examples, we have pointed to time as the main factor in changing the meaning of words. If we include race, we see that in the same era, in peoples who are equally civilized but of different races, the same words often express very different ideas. It is difficult to understand all these differences without having made many journeys, so I will not insist on them. I will confine myself to pointing out that the words most used by the crowd have different meanings among different peoples. Among these are, for example, democracy and socialism, so frequently used nowadays. In reality, these words evoke completely opposite images in the souls of Romance and Anglo-Saxon peoples. With the Latins the word democracy means mainly the disappearance of the will and initiative of the individual before the will and initiative of the communities represented by the state. The state is more and more imposed to govern everything, to centralize, monopolize and fabricate everything. The state is constantly turned to by all parties without exception radicals, socialists or monarchists. 
with the Anglo-Saxons in America the same word democracy means, on the contrary, the widest possible development of the will and the individual and the greatest possible elimination of the state, which is not allowed to govern anything, even the business of public education, except the police, the army and diplomatic relations. Thus, the same word which in one nation means the elimination of the will and individual initiative, and the domination of the state, in another nation takes on an entirely different meaning and means the excessive development of individual will and initiative and the complete elimination of the state. In the first book of this work, Psychology of Nations, I especially pointed out the difference which exists between the democratic ideal of the Romance peoples and the Anglo-Saxons. Quite independently of me, Paul Bourget, on the basis of his travels, came to conclusions almost identical with mine in his last book, Outremer. Asterisk 2. Illusions. From the very dawn of civilization, the crowd has constantly fallen under the influence of illusions. The greatest number of temples, statues, and altars have been erected precisely to the creators of illusion. Once dominated by religious illusions, now philosophical and social illusions take the stage, but these formidable overlords have always been at the head of the civilizations that have successively developed on our planet. In the name of illusions, the temples of Chaldea and Egypt were built, medieval religious buildings, and in the name of the same illusions the revolution in Europe took place a century ago. All of our artistic, political or social concepts bear the powerful imprint of illusion. Man sometimes shatters these illusions at the cost of terrible upheavals, but he is always forced to retrieve them from the ruins. When listing the factors capable of making an impression on the crowd's soul, we might not mention intellect at all, if it were not necessary for us to point out the negative value of its influence. We have already pointed out that the crowd cannot be influenced by reasoning, because only crude associations of ideas are available to it. Therefore, the factors capable of impressing a crowd always appeal to its feelings, not to its intellect. The laws of logic have no effect on it. In order to convince a crowd, one must first become well acquainted with the feelings that inspire it, pretend to share them, then try to change them by arousing some images that captivate the crowd with initial associations. You also have to be able to go back in case of need, and most importantly, to be able to guess at every moment the feelings you evoke in the crowd. My first observations about the art of impressing a crowd, and how little logic prevails in this case, date back to the siege of Paris, to the day when I saw Marshal B. being led to the Louvre, the seat of government at the time, whom a furious mob accused of having photographed the plan of fortifications in order to sell them to the Prussians. One of the members of the government, the famous orator H. P., came out to persuade the crowd, who demanded the immediate execution of his prisoner. I expected the orator to prove to the crowd the absurdity of her accusations by saying that the marshal whom she accuses was himself one of the builders of these fortifications, and that the plans of these fortifications are sold at all the booksellers. To my greatest amazement, I was very young at the time, I heard a very different speech. The massacre will be carried out, the speaker shouted as he approached the prisoner, and the massacre will be the most merciless. Leave it to the national defense government to complete its investigation. In the meantime, we will lock up the prisoner. The crowd immediately calmed down, satisfied with this seeming fulfillment of their demands, and a quarter of an hour later the marshal could go home in peace. But he would inevitably have been torn to pieces if the speaker had begun to give the crowd, in a state of rage, the logical arguments that I had thought so convincing in my youth. The necessity of constantly changing one's speech according to the impression it makes at that moment condemns all prepared and memorized speeches to failure in advance. In such a speech, the speaker follows only the development of his own thought, not the development of the thoughts of his listeners, and for this reason alone his influence is quite negligible. Logical minds, accustomed to always deal with a whole chain of reasoning, resulting from one another, necessarily resort to the same method of persuasion when addressing to the crowd, and are always amazed at how little effect on her arguments. 
Try reasoning with primitive minds, with savages or children, for example, and you will be quite convinced then how little value this method of argumentation has. There is no need, however, to descend to primitive beings to be convinced of the utter inconsistency of their reasoning when they have to contend with feelings. Let us only recall how stubbornly religious superstitions, which contradict even the simplest logic, have been held for centuries. For more than 2,000 years the most brilliant geniuses have bowed to their power, and only in modern times has it become possible to challenge their validity. In the Middle Ages and the Renaissance there were not a few enlightened men, but there were none who, by reasoning, could be persuaded of the childish character of all these superstitions and excite in him the slightest doubt about the evils of the devil and the necessity of a bonfire for sorcerers. Is it to be deplored that the crowd is never governed by reason? we would not venture to assert it. It is unlikely that the voice of reason could have carried mankind along the path of civilization and communicated to it the fervor and courage which the chimeras evoked in it. No doubt these chimeras, the daughters of the unconscious, were necessary. Every race encapsulates in its spiritual organization those laws which govern its destiny, and it may be that it obeys these very laws driven by fatal instinct in all its motives, even apparently the most reckless. Sometimes it seems to us that nations are subject to secret forces, like those which make an acorn develop gradually into an oak tree and force a comet to move in its orbit. What little we can learn of these forces we must look for in the general course of the evolution of a people, and not in the the isolated facts of which this evolution is composed. If we consider only such isolated facts, it would seem that history is governed by the most improbable contingencies. Is it not an incredible fact, for example, that a few Arab gangs, coming out of the deserts, were able to defeat the greatest part of the old Greco-Roman world and to found an empire even greater than that of Alexander? Is it not also incredible that in the old hierarchical Europe some obscure artillery lieutenant could reign over a multitude of nations and kings? Let us, therefore, introduce reason to philosophers, but let us not require it to interfere too much in the business of governing men. Not with the help of reason, but more often besides it, have arisen feelings such as honor, selflessness, religious faith, love of glory and of fatherland, feelings which have been until now the main springs of all civilization. Chapter 3. Crowd Leaders and Their Modes of Persuasion. Asterisk 1. Crowd Leaders The instinctive need of all individuals in a crowd to obey the leader. The Psychology of Leaders Only leaders can create belief and give organization to the crowd. The Violent Despotism of Leaders Their Classification The Role Played by the Will 2. The Modus Operandi of the Chiefs Assertion, Repetition, and Contagion the relative role of all these factors. How contagion spreads from the lower classes to the higher classes. Popular opinion quickly becomes general opinion. Asterisk 3. Charm. Definition and classification of charm. Charm acquired and personal. Various examples. How charm disappears. The spiritual organization of the crowd is already known to us and we know also what engines may act upon its soul. It now remains for us to consider the uses of these engines, and to indicate who may use them. Asterisk 1. Crowd Horns As soon as a certain number of living creatures come together, whether it be a herd of animals or a crowd of people, they instinctively submit to the power of their leader. In a crowd of people the leader is often only the leader, but, Nevertheless, his role is significant. His will represents the nucleus around which opinions crystallize and unite. He constitutes the first element of organization of a heterogeneous crowd and prepares the organization of sex in it. Until this happens, he rules it, because the crowd is a servile herd that cannot do without a ruler. The leader was usually first among those who were led, he was also hypnotized by the idea of which he later became an apostle. This idea took possession of him to such an extent that everything around him disappeared, and every opposing opinion seemed to him already a delusion and prejudice. 
That is why Robespierre, hypnotized by the ideas of Rousseau, used the methods of the Inquisition to spread them. Leaders are not usually thinkers, they are men of action. They are not shrewd, because shrewdness usually leads to doubt and inaction. More often than not, the ringleaders are psychologically unstable, half-mad, on the brink of insanity. No matter how ridiculous the idea they defend or the goal they pursue, their convictions cannot be shaken by any reasoning. Contempt and persecution do not impress them, or only excite them further. Personal interest, family, everything is sacrificed. The instinct of self-preservation disappears to the point that the only reward they seek is martyrdom. The intensity of their own faith gives their words an enormous power of suggestion. The crowd is always ready to listen to a man gifted with a strong will and able to act on it in a suggestive way. People in the crowd lose their will and instinctively turn to the one who retains it. There has never been a shortage of leaders among the nations, but these leaders must always have very strong convictions, for only such convictions create apostles. Leaders are often cunning orators, pursuing only their own personal interests and acting by indulging the low instincts of the crowd. The influence they enjoy may be great, but it is always very ephemeral. The great fanatics who captivated the soul of the crowd, Peter the Hermit, Luther, Savonarola, the workers of the revolution, only then submitted it to their charm when they themselves fell under the charm of a known idea. Then they succeeded in creating in the soul of the crowd that formidable force, which is called faith and contributes to the transformation of man into an absolute slave of his dreams. The role of all great leaders is mainly to create faith, whether religious, political, social, or faith in a cause, person, or idea, which is why their influence has always been so great. Of all the powers that mankind possesses, the power of faith has always been the most powerful, and it is not in vain that the gospel says that faith can move mountains. To give man faith is to increase his power. The great events of history have been produced by unknown believers whose whole strength lay in their faith it was not scientists or philosophers who produced the great religions which ruled the world and vast kingdoms which extended from one hemisphere to the other. In all these cases, of course, the great leaders acted, and there are not many of them in history. They form the top of a pyramid, gradually descending from these powerful rulers over the minds of the crowd to that orator who in a smoky hotel slowly subdues his listeners to his influence, repeating to them ready-made formulas whose meaning he himself does not understand, but believes they are necessarily able to lead to the realization of all dreams and hopes. In all social spheres, from the highest to the lowest, unless one is in an isolated position, one easily falls under the influence of a leader. Most people, especially in the masses of the people, have little or no clear and more or less definite concept of anything outside their specialty. Such people are unable to govern themselves, and the leader serves as their leader. The power of the chiefs is very despotic, but it is this despotism that makes them obey. It is not difficult to see how easily they force the working classes, even the most violent ones, to obey themselves, even though they have no means to maintain their power. They prescribe the number of working hours, the amount of wages, organize strikes, and force them to begin and end at a certain hour. At the present time, the leaders of the mob are increasingly supplanting social power, which is losing its importance as a result of strife. The tyranny of the new overlords subdues the crowd and makes it obey them more than it has obeyed any government. If, by any chance, the leader disappears and is not immediately replaced by another, the crowd once again becomes a mere gathering without any connection or stability. During the last strike of the coachmen of the omnibuses in Paris it was enough to arrest the two leaders who led it for it to stop at once. It is not the desire for freedom but the need for obedience that prevails in the soul of the crowd, the crowd is so eager to obey that it instinctively submits to whoever declares himself its ruler. The class of leaders is conveniently divided into two definite categories. To one of them belong energetic people, with a strong, but appearing in them only for a short time, to the other, there are much rarer leaders with a strong, but at the same time firm, will. 
the first are bold, impertinent, and brave, they are well suited for sudden daring ventures, for drawing the masses away from danger and turning yesterday's recruits into heroes. Such were, for example, May and Marat in the days of the First Empire. Nowadays that was Garibaldi, with no special talents, but very energetic, who was able to conquer the whole kingdom of Naples with only a handful of men, while the kingdom had at its disposal a disciplined army to defend itself. But the energy of these leaders, though very powerful, does not last long and disappears along with the agent that caused it to appear. Very often heroes who have shown such energy, when they return to ordinary life, reveal the most amazing weakness and complete inability to direct their actions even under the most ordinary conditions, although they appear to be so good at directing other people. Such leaders can perform their function only if they are constantly guided and roused and if there is always a person or idea above them directing their behavior. The second category of leaders, those with an enduring will, is not as brilliant, but is much more important. To this category belong the true founders of religion and creators of great deeds, St. Paul, Muhammad, Christopher Columbus, Lesseps. Whether they are clever or limited still, the world will always belong to them. Their stubborn will is an infinitely rare and infinitely powerful quality that makes everything obey. What can be achieved through a strong will is often not fully known, yet nothing can oppose it, be it nature, the gods or man. The closest example of what can be accomplished by a strong will is the famous man who divided the two worlds and accomplished a task that many of the greatest sovereigns tried in vain for three thousand years. Later he failed in a similar undertaking, but then came old age, before which all things fade, even the will. The story of the difficulties that had to be overcome in digging the Suez Canal best shows in all its details how much a strong will alone can do. An eyewitness, Dr. Cassillet, sums up in a few riveting lines this great undertaking, the accomplishment of which was told by its immortal author himself. He told day after day all the episodes of the canal epic, says Cassillet. He told how he had to defeat the impossible and make it possible, to triumph over all obstacles coalitions, setbacks, misfortunes and failures of all kinds. Nothing, however, could plunge him into despondency, make him lose heart. He remembered how England had rebelled and relentlessly attacked him, what indecision Egypt and France had shown, how the French consul had more than any other interfered with the beginning of the work, and how he had to be counteracted by influencing the workers, exposing them to thirst, and denying them fresh water. He said that the Ministry of the Sea, the engineers, all serious, experienced, scientists, but naturally hostile to his idea and at the same time convinced of his death, predicted. This death at such a day and hour, as if it was a solar eclipse. A book in which the lives of all the great leaders of the mob would be told, of course, could not contain many names, but all these names were at the head of the most important events of our civilization and history. Asterisk 2. The modus operandi of leaders, affirmation, repetition, contagion. When it is necessary to entice a crowd for a moment, to make it commit some act, for example, to rob a palace, to die defending a fortress or a barricade, it is necessary to act by quick suggestions, and the best suggestion is still a personal example. However, the crowd, in order to obey the compulsion, must be prepared for it earlier by known circumstances, and the main thing is that the one who wants to entice them to follow him must have a special quality, known by the name of charm, of which we shall speak below. When it comes to making the soul of the crowd take hold of ideas and beliefs, such as modern social theories, other methods are employed, chiefly as follows, confirmation, repetition, contagion. The effect of these methods is slow but the results they achieve are very persistent. A simple assertion, not supported by any reasoning or evidence, is one of the surest means of making an idea penetrate the soul of the crowd. The more brief the statement, the more devoid of any proof, the more it influences the crowd. Sacred books and codes of all ages have always acted by means of a simple statement, men of state, called upon to defend a political cause, industrialists, who try to distribute their products by means of announcements, know well the power of an assertion. 
A statement only has an effect when it is repeated often and, if possible, in the same expressions. Napoleon seems to have said that the only noteworthy figure of rhetoric is repetition. Through repetition, an idea is planted so firmly in the mind that it is finally accepted as a proven truth. The effect of assertion on a crowd becomes clear when we see the powerful effect it has on the most enlightened minds. This effect is due to the fact that the idea that is often repeated eventually cuts into the deepest regions of the unconscious, where precisely the engines of our actions are produced. After a while we forget who the author of the statement repeated so many times was, and eventually we begin to believe it, hence the marvelous effect of all publications. After we've read a hundred or a thousand times that the best chocolate is X chocolate, we think we've heard it from all kinds of different angles, and we eventually become totally convinced of it. After reading thousands of times that Flower V has saved such and such famous people from the most persistent disease, we begin to feel the urge to resort to this remedy as soon as we fall ill with a similar disease. If we keep reading in the same newspaper that A is a perfect scoundrel and B an honest man, we end up being convinced of it, unless, of course, we read some other newspaper presenting an entirely different view. Only affirmation and repetition are able to compete with each other, since they have the same power in this case. Once a statement has been repeated a sufficient number of times and the repetition has been unanimous, as can be seen, say, in the case of some financial enterprises that are famous and rich enough to buy their support from public opinion, what is called a current forms and a powerful factor, contagion, enters the scene. In a crowd, ideas, feelings, emotions, beliefs everything gets the same powerful contagious power as some germs do. It is a natural phenomenon and can be observed even in animals when they are in a herd. Panic, for example, or any disorderly movement of a few rams quickly spreads to the whole herd. In a crowd, all emotions are just as quickly contagious, which explains the instantaneous spread of panic. Mental disorders, such as insanity, are also contagious. It is known how often cases of insanity are observed among psychiatrists, and recently it has even been noticed that some forms, such as agoraphobia, can even be transmitted from humans to animals. The emergence of contagion does not require the simultaneous presence of several individuals in the same place, it can also manifest itself at a distance, under the influence of certain events which orient the direction of thought in a certain sense and give it a special coloring appropriate to the crowd. This is especially noticeable in cases where minds have already been prepared by the distant factors I spoke of above. This is why the revolutionary movement of 1348, which began in Paris, immediately spread to most of Europe and shook several monarchies. Imitation, to which such a major role in social phenomena is attributed, is in fact only one of the manifestations of contagion. Elsewhere I have already spoken sufficiently about the influence of imitation, so here I shall confine myself to reproducing what I said about this subject fifteen years ago and developed subsequently by other authors in more recent writings. Man, like the animal, is inclined to imitation, it is a necessity for him, provided, of course, that it is not surrounded by difficulties. It is this need which accounts for the powerful influence of the so-called fashion. Who would dare not submit to its power, whether it concerns opinions, ideas, literary works or mere clothing? Crowds are not ruled by arguments, but only by patterns. In every era there are a small number of individuals who inspire the crowd with their actions, and the unconscious masses imitate them. But these individuals must nevertheless not be too far removed from the prevailing ideas in the crowd, otherwise it would be difficult to imitate, and then all their influence would be nullified. For this reason, people who stand much above their epoch have no influence on it at all. They are too distant from it. That is why Europeans, with all the advantages of their civilization, have so little influence on the peoples of the East, they are too different from those peoples. 
the double influence of the past and of mutual imitation in the end causes such similarities between people of the same country and of the same era that even those who should be least likely to be so influenced philosophers, scholars and writers are still so family-like in their thought and style that by these signs one recognizes at once the era to which they belong. A short conversation with someone is enough to get a complete idea of what he reads, what his usual occupations are, and in what milieu he lives. Contagion is so powerful that it can inspire not only known opinions but also known feelings in individuals. It is precisely through such contagion that famous works, such as Tannhauser, have been scorned in a certain era, which a few years later excited the enthusiasm of the same people who ridiculed it. Opinions and beliefs spread in the crowd precisely by contagion, not by reasoning, and the beliefs of crowds of all eras have arisen through the same exact mechanism, assertion, repetition, and contagion. Rena quite rightly compares the first founders of Christianity with the socialist workers who spread their ideas through the taverns. Voltaire, also speaking of the Christian religion, said that for more than a hundred years its followers were only the most contemptible mobs. By examples similar to those to which I have already pointed out here we can clearly see how the contagion, operating at first only in the popular strata, gradually spreads to the upper strata of society, we can see it in our modern socialist doctrines, which are now beginning to fascinate already those who are condemned to be the first victims of their triumph. The effect of contagion is so strong and powerful that all personal interest recedes before it. This is why any opinion, having become popular, eventually becomes so powerful that it penetrates the highest social strata and becomes dominant there, even though its absurdity is quite obvious. In this phenomenon lies a very curious reaction of the lower social strata to the higher ones, all the more curious because all the beliefs of the crowd always stem from some higher idea that has had no influence in the environment in which it originated. Usually the leaders who have fallen under the influence of this idea seize it, pervert it, create a sect, which in turn perverts and then spreads it in the depths of the masses, who continue to pervert it more and more. Having finally become a popular truth, the idea in some way returns to its original source and then acts on the higher strata of the nation. In the end we see that, after all, the mind rules the world. The philosophers who created some ideas have long since died and turned into ashes, but thanks to the mechanism I have described, their thought still triumphs in the end. 3. Ideas, spread by affirmation, repetition and contagion, owe their power mainly to the mysterious power they acquire charm. The ideas or people who have conquered the world have been dominated by this irresistible power called charm. We all know what it means, but the word is often used in such different ways that it is not easy to explain. Charm can be composed of opposing feelings, such as admiration and fear. Indeed, charm is often based on these very feelings, but sometimes it exists without them. The greatest charms, for example, are enjoyed by the dead, hence beings whom we are not afraid of, Alexander, Caesar, Muhammad, Buddha. On the other hand, there are objects and fictions that do not excite our admiration in the slightest, such as the monstrous deities of India's underground temples, but which nevertheless possess great charm. In reality, fascination is a kind of domination of an idea or a cause over the mind of the individual. This domination paralyzes all the critical faculties of the individual and fills his soul with wonder and reverence. The feeling evoked is inexplicable, as are all feelings, but it probably belongs to the same order as the fascination that takes possession of the magnetized subject. Charm constitutes the most powerful cause of all domination, gods, kings, and women could never rule without it. The various kinds of charm however, can be divided into two main categories, acquired charm and personal charm. Acquired charm is that which comes from name, wealth, and reputation, it may be entirely independent of personal charm. Personal charm is of a more individual nature and may exist simultaneously with reputation, fame and fortune, but can also do without them. Acquired or artificial charm is much more common. The mere fact that an individual occupies a certain social position, has a certain wealth and titles is often enough to give him charm, 
no matter how insignificant his personal importance. A military man in his uniform, a judge in his mantle, always enjoys charm. Pascal was quite right to point out the necessity of dressing judges in robes and wigs. Without this, they would lose three quarters of their authority. The most ferocious socialist is always somewhat embarrassed at the sight of a prince or a marquis. It is worth giving himself such a title, and the most shrewd merchant will easily let himself be swept off his feet. This influence of titles, orders, and uniforms on crowds is found in all countries, even in those where the sense of individual freedom is most developed. I will cite on this subject a passage from a new book by a traveler, telling the following of the charm enjoyed by certain personalities in England. Many times I have observed the peculiar state of intoxication which seizes even the most prudent Englishman at the sight and intercourse with some peer of England. They love him in advance, as long as his wealth is commensurate with his position, and in his presence they bear him with rapture. They blush with pleasure when he approaches them or speaks to them, a pent-up joy gives an unusual luster to their eyes. They have a lord in their blood, if I may say so, as we say of the Spaniard that he is dancing in his blood, of the German that he is music in his blood, and of the French that he is revolution in his blood their passion for horses and Shakespeare is less strong and they derive less pleasure from it. The Book of Peers has a great market and can be found in the remotest places and by all as much as the Bible. I refer here only to the charm that people have, but next to this we can also put the charm of opinions, literary and artistic works, etc. In the latter case, more often than not, the charm is the result of increased repetition. History, and especially the history of literature and art, is nothing more than the repetition of all the same judgments, which no one dares to challenge, and, in the end, everyone repeats them as they learn them in school. There are names and things no one dares touch. For the modern reader, for example, reading Homer is of course a tremendous and insurmountable bore, but who dares to admit it? The Parthenon in its present form is an unhappy ruin, devoid of all interest, but this ruin has charm precisely because it is presented to us not as it is, but accompanied by a whole retinue of historical memories. The main property of charm is precisely that it prevents objects from being seen in their present form and paralyzes all judgment. Crowds always, and individuals very often, need ready-made opinions on all subjects. The success of these opinions does not depend at all on the particle of truth or error which they contain but solely on the degree of their charm. I will now speak of personal charm. This kind of charm is quite different from artificial or acquired charm and depends neither on title nor on power, it is the property of only a few persons and gives them a kind of magnetic charm that works on those around them, even though they are socially equal and have no ordinary means of asserting their dominance. They inspire their ideas and feelings in those around them, and they obey them, just as beasts of prey obey their handler, although they could easily tear him apart. The great leaders of the crowd, Buddha, Muhammad, Joan of Arc, Napoleon possessed this form of charm in the highest degree and, thanks to it, subdued the crowd. Gods, heroes, and dogmas are indoctrinated but not challenged, they disappear as soon as they are debated. The great men, whose charm I have just spoken of, could not have become famous without that charm. Of course, Napoleon, at the zenith of his fame, enjoyed great charm because of his power, but still this charm existed in him even when he had no power and was completely unknown. By patronage, he was appointed to command an army in Italy and fell into the circle of very strict, old warrior generals, ready to give a rather dry welcome to a young colleague planted on his neck. But from the first minute, from the first date, without any phrases, threats or gestures, the future great man subdued them to himself. Tan borrows from the memoirs of his contemporaries the following interesting account of this date. The divisional generals, including Augereau, an old soldier, rude but heroic, very proud of his tall stature and his bravery, arrived at the headquarters quite prejudiced against the upstart sent from Paris. Augereau resented in advance, having already formed an opinion of him by description and prepared to disobey this minion of Paris. General Vendemir, street general, whom everyone looked on as a bear, B. 
because he always kept apart and was thoughtful, moreover, this small general had a reputation as a mathematician and a dreamer. They were led in. Bonaparte kept himself waiting. At last he emerged, girded with his sword, put on his hat, explained his intentions to the generals, gave his orders, and dismissed them. Augereau was speechless, and only when they were already out on the street, he regretted and burst out his usual curses, agreeing with Messina that this little general inspired fear in him, and he certainly cannot understand why at first sight he felt destroyed before his superiority. Napoleon's charm increased even more under the influence of his fame when he became a great man. Already then his charm had become almost tantamount to that of a deity. General Van Damme, a revolutionary soldier, even rougher and more energetic than Augereau, said of him to Marshal D'Ornano in 1815, when they were climbing the stairs together at the Tilleries Palace, My dear, this man has a charm over me of which I am not able to account, and yet to such an extent that I, who fear neither God nor devil, tremble like a child when I approach him, and he could make me go through the eye of a needle to throw me into the fire. Napoleon had exactly the same charm on all those who approached him. Fully conscious of his charm, Napoleon understood that he was only increasing it by treating, even worse than stable men, those important persons who surrounded him and among whom were the famous members of the convention who had once inspired fear in Europe. Accounts from that time contain many significant facts in this respect. One day in the Council of State Napoleon was very rude to Benyet, whom he treated as an ignoramus and a footman. Having achieved his desired action, Napoleon went up to him and said, Well, big fool, have you found your head at last? Benyo, tall as a timbre major, bent very low, and the little man raised his hand and took him by the ear, which was a sign of intoxicating mercy. Benyo writes, the usual gesture of a merciful gentleman. Such examples give a clear idea of the degree of baseness and vulgarity caused by the charm in the soul of some people, and explain why the great despot had such enormous contempt for the people around him, whom he really looked upon as nothing more than cannon fodder. Davu, speaking of his loyalty and devotion to Mayor Bonaparte, added, If the emperor had told us both, the interests of my politics require that I destroy Paris, and moreover so that no one can leave it and escape, Mayor, no doubt, would have kept the secret, I am sure of it, but nevertheless, could not refrain and would take his family from Paris and thus would have put the secret in danger. Well, I would have left my wife and children in Paris for fear that no one would guess the secret. It is this amazing ability of Napoleon to produce charm that must be borne in mind to explain his amazing return from the island of Elba and this victory over France by a solitary man, against whom all the organized forces of a great country, which seemed already tired of his tyranny, stood up. But as soon as he looked at the generals who had been sent to take possession of him, and swore to take possession of him, they all immediately submitted to his charms. Napoleon, writes the English general Walsley, lands in France almost alone, like a fugitive from the little island of Elba, and in a few weeks he manages without any bloodshed to overthrow the whole organization of power in France, with its rightful king at its head. Are there any instances where the personal superiority of man would have been more strikingly manifested? In the continuance of this last campaign of his, one can clearly see what power he had over his allies forcing them to follow his initiative, and how little it took for him to crush them definitively. His charm outlived him and continued to increase. It was this charm that got his obscure nephew into emperorship. Observing then how his legend is revived, we can see how powerful his great shadow still is. Treat people badly as you like, kill them by the millions, cause invasion after invasion, and all will be forgiven if you have a sufficient degree of charm and talent to maintain that charm. I have given here a quite exceptional example of charm, but it was necessary to point out just such a case so that the origin of the great religions, the great doctrines, and the great empires might become clear to us. The genesis of all this is unclear without taking into account the powerful power of charm. But charm is not based solely on personal superiority, on military glory, or on religious fear. It can have a much more humble origin and yet be quite significant. Our century provides us with many such examples.
One of the most striking is the story of the famous man, Lesseps, who changed the shape of the globe and the commercial relations of nations by separating two continents. He succeeded in his enterprise not only because of his tremendous will, but also because of the charm he had on everyone around him. To defeat the almost universal distrust, he had only to show his face. He spoke for a few minutes, and, thanks to his charm, his opponents quickly turned into his supporters. The English in particular rebelled against his project, but as soon as he showed his face in England, everyone was on his side. When he later passed through Southampton, bells rang in his honor, and now England was about to erect a statue of him. Having conquered all things things, men, marshes, rocks and sands, he no longer believed in obstacles and ventured to renew the Suez and Panama. He began with the same means, but old age came, besides, faith, which moves mountains, moves them only when they are not too high. The mountains, however, held in the disaster that arose from it destroyed the glittering halo of glory that surrounded this hero. His life best shows how charm arises and how it can disappear. Comparable in grandeur to the most celebrated heroes of history, he was relegated by the simple judges of his country to the ranks of the most despicable criminals. When he died, the crowd was totally indifferent, and only foreign sovereigns saw fit to honor the memory of one of the greatest men in history. A foreign newspaper, namely the Nui Frey Presa, made psychologically correct remarks about Lesseps' fate, which I reproduce here. After the condemnation of Ferdinand Lesseps, we have nothing to marvel at the sad end of Christopher Columbus. If Ferdinand Lesseps is considered a fraud, then every noble illusion must be considered a crime. The ancient world would have crowned Lesseps' memory with a halo of glory and exalted him to Olympus because he had changed the surface of the earth and accomplished a work that perfected it. By his sentence of Ferdinand Lesseps, the president of the court created immortality for himself, for nations will always ask the name of the man who was not afraid to humiliate his age by dressing an old man, whose life was the glory of his contemporaries, in a convict's robe. Let us no longer be told of the inexorability of justice or bureaucratic hatred of all great, courageous deeds reigns. Nations need such courageous men, believing in themselves and overcoming all obstacles without regard for their own person. A genius cannot be cautious, guided by caution, he could never expand the circle of human activity. Ferdinand Lesseps experienced both the intoxication of success and the bitterness of disappointment this is Suez and Panama. The soul resents this morality of success. When he succeeded in joining the two seas, sovereigns and nations honored him, but after his defeat, when he failed to master the rocks of the Cordilleras, he turned into a common rogue. Here we see the struggle of social classes, the displeasure of bureaucrats and officials who retaliate through the penal code against those who wish to rise above others. Modern legislators are confused by such great ideas of human genius, the public understands even less of them, and some attorney general has no difficulty in proving that Stanley is a murderer and less ups a fraud. All these various examples we have given concern only extreme forms of charm. To establish in all the details its psychology, we would have to place these forms at the end of a series descending from the founders of religions and states to some subject trying to dazzle his neighbor with the glitter of a new suit or orders. Between both ends of such a series one can place all forms of charm in the various elements of civilization, the sciences, the arts, literature, etc., then it will be seen that charm constitutes the basic element of all persuasion. Whether consciously or not, a being, idea, or thing which enjoys charm immediately, by contagion, causes imitation and indoctrinates a whole generation with a certain way of feeling and expressing its thoughts. Imitation is most often unconscious, and this is what makes it perfect. Modern artists who reproduce in their works the pale colors and frozen poses of some primitive painters have no idea, of course, where their inspiration comes from. They believe in their own sincerity, and meanwhile, if one famous artist had not resurrected this art form, we would continue to see in it only the naive aspects and a lower degree of art. Those artists who, following the example of another famous master, overflow their pictures with purple shadows, 
do not notice at all the predominance of purple paint in nature any more than it was noticed 50 years ago, but they were so much affected by the personal and special impressions of one artist that they submitted to this suggestion, especially since, despite such strangeness, the artist has managed to acquire a great charm. In all elements of civilization one can easily find many such examples. From all the preceding we see that many factors are involved in the genesis of charm, and one of the most important was always success. Any person who is successful, any idea that captures the mind, already on this very basis, becomes beyond the reach of any challenge. The proof that success is one of the main foundations of charm is the simultaneous disappearance of charm with the disappearance of success. A hero who is praised by the crowd only the day before may be ridiculed by it the next day if he fails. The reaction will be the stronger the greater the charm. The crowd then looks upon the fallen hero as its equal and takes revenge for having previously worshipped his superiority, which it does not now recognize. When Robespierre sent his colleagues and many of his contemporaries to their execution, he enjoyed great charm. But as soon as a few votes were displaced, he immediately lost his charm, and the crowd escorted him to the guillotine with a hail of the same curses it had showered on his former victims. Believers are always especially furious in smashing the gods they once worshipped. Under the influence of failure, the charm disappears suddenly. It may also decay through contestation, but it is slower. But it is this way of destroying the charm that is much more effective. A charm that is challenged ceases to be a charm. Gods and men who were able to maintain their charm for a long time did not allow themselves to be challenged. In order to arouse the admiration of the crowd, one must always keep it at a certain distance. In Chapter 4 The Limits of the Variability of the Opinions and Beliefs of the Crowd Asterisk 1 Constant Beliefs, the Immutability of Certain Common Beliefs they serve as guides for civilizations. The difficulty of eradicating them. In what respect intolerance constitutes a virtue. The absurdity of some belief philosophically cannot be detrimental to its diffusion. Asterisk 2. The inconstant opinions of the crowd, the extreme variability of opinions which do not arise from common beliefs. Apparent changes in ideas and beliefs. The actual limits of these changes are the disappearance of common beliefs and the extraordinary proliferation of the press account for the extraordinary fluidity of opinion in our time, the tendency of the crowd to indifferentism, the impotence of governments to direct the opinions of the crowd, the present fragmentation of opinions prevents their tyranny. Asterisk 1 post posit verifications there is a close parallelism between the anatomical and psychological traits of living beings. In the anatomical signs we encounter some elements that remain unchanged or change so slowly that it takes entire geological epochs to cause these changes. But next to the constant, unchanging features, there are others, very mobile, subject to change under the influence of the environment or with the help of art, cattlemen and gardeners, for example can change these features at will, and sometimes to the extent that they completely hide the basic features from the eyes of not very attentive observer. The same phenomenon can be observed in moral traits. Next to the unchangeable psychological elements of any race there are elements that are mobile and changing. That is why, studying the beliefs and opinions of any nation, we come across a very stable foundation in the depths on which opinions are layered as mobile as the sand that covers a rock. The opinions and beliefs of the crowd form, therefore, two classes, sharply different from each other. To the first we refer all the great permanent beliefs, held for many centuries, on which all civilization rests, such, for example, are the ideas of Christianity, feudalism, reformation, and, in our time, the principle of nationalism, democratic and social ideas, to the second are temporary and changeable opinions, arising for the most part from general notions, which emerge and disappear with each epoch, such as the theories governing the arts and literature in certain times, those which have given rise to romanticism, naturalism, mysticism, etc. These theories are for the most part as superficial as fashion, 
and are subject to the same changes as it is, resembling little waves that continually appear and disappear on the surface of some deep lake. The number of great common beliefs is very small. The emergence of these beliefs and their disappearance constitute for every historical race the culminating points of its history and form the true framework of all civilization. It is not difficult to indoctrinate a crowd with a transient opinion, but it is very difficult to establish a firm belief in its soul, and it is just as difficult to destroy the latter when it is already established. Changing such established beliefs is often achieved only through very violent revolutions and these are only able to accomplish this when the belief has almost completely lost its power over the soul. Revolution finally sweeps away what is already quite shaken, but holds on only through habit, therefore, the beginning of the revolution always marks the end of a belief. It is not difficult to recognize the day when a great belief is marked with the seal of death. It is when it is debated, because every common belief is only a fiction that can only exist if it is not investigated. But even if a belief is shaken, the institutions based on it can retain their power for a long time and only gradually lose it. When it finally collapses, all that it supported collapses with it. A nation can change its beliefs only if it completely changes all the elements of its civilization, and these changes will take place until some new common belief is established, until that happens, the nation will be forced into a state of anarchy. Common beliefs are necessary to support civilizations, for they give a certain direction to ideas and alone can inspire faith and create duty. Peoples have always been aware of the usefulness of acquiring common beliefs, knowing instinctively that the disappearance of these beliefs marks for them the hour of decline. The fanatical cult of Rome was for the Romans the very belief that made them rulers of the world, and when that belief disappeared, Rome fell into decay. The barbarians, who had destroyed Roman civilization, only then achieved some cohesion and were able to get out of the anarchy in which they had been until they assimilated some common beliefs. So, it was not without reason that the peoples defended their beliefs with such fierce intolerance. Such intolerance, which deserves to be condemned from a philosophical point of view, constitutes one of the most necessary virtues in the life of peoples. So many fires were built in the Middle Ages for the foundation or maintenance of common beliefs, and so many inventors or innovators perished. In defense of these beliefs the world has been shaken so many times, so many millions have fallen on the field of battle, and probably so many more will die in the future. It is very difficult to establish a common belief, but when it is finally established its power is for a long time irresistible, and no matter how false its philosophical foundations may be, yet even the most enlightened minds submit to it. Have not European peoples for nearly fifteen centuries considered as irrefutable truth such religious legends, which on closer examination appear to be as barbarous as the legends of Moloch? The appalling absurdity of such a legend has not been noticed for centuries, and even such mighty geniuses as Galileo, Newton, and Leibniz have not for one moment allowed the possibility of challenging it. Nothing proves better than this fact the hypnotizing influence of common beliefs, but at the same time nothing points so clearly to the humiliating limits set for the human mind. As soon as any new dogma is established in the soul of the crowd, it immediately becomes the inspirer of all its institutions, its art and its conduct. Its power over the souls is absolute. For a long time people only dream of its realization, legislators bother about its application in life, while philosophers, artists and writers are engaged in explaining it, reproducing it in various forms. Temporary ideas may of course arise from a central belief, but they always bear the imprint of the belief from which they arose, the Egyptian civilization, the medieval European civilization, the Muslim Arab civilization all these come from the handful of religious beliefs that have imprinted their smallest elements on the civilizations, so that the central beliefs can be recognized at a glance. Thus, thanks to common beliefs, the people of each epoch are surrounded by a network of traditions, opinions and habits, from the yoke of which they are unable to free themselves and which condition their mutual similarity. These beliefs govern men as well as the customs arising from them, 
governing all the smallest acts of our existence to such an extent that not even the most independent mind can be entirely free from their power. True tyranny can only be that which unconsciously acts on souls, for it cannot be fought. Tiberius, Genghis Khan, and Napoleon were no doubt dangerous tyrants, but Moses, Buddha, Muhammad, and Luther from the depths of their graves had even more power over souls. A conspiracy can overthrow a tyrant, but what can it do against some well-established belief? In the fierce struggle against Catholicism, even in spite of the seeming sympathy of the masses and all the means of extermination as merciless as those of the Inquisitions, the Great Revolution was still the victor. The only real tyrants mankind has known have always been the shadows of the dead or the illusions created by mankind itself. The absurdity of many common beliefs from a philosophical point of view has never prevented their triumph. Even more, this triumph is only possible if there is some mysterious nonsense in the beliefs, so the obvious absurdity of some modern beliefs can in no way prevent them from capturing the soul of the crowd. Asterisk 2. The unstable opinions of the crowd above the firmly established beliefs just discussed lies a superficial layer of opinions, ideas, and thoughts that continually arise and pass away. Some of them last only a day, but even the more or less important ones do not last longer than a generation. We have already said that the changes to which opinions are subjected are sometimes more superficial than substantial, and always bear the mark of the character of race. In considering, for instance, the political institutions of the country in which we live, we have pointed out that the most opposite-looking parties, monarchists, radicals, imperialists, socialists, etc., in essence have exactly the same ideal, which depends exclusively on the mental structure of our race, since in another race under the same name is meant the exact opposite ideal. No names assigned to opinions, nor their false application to life can change the essence of things. The bourgeois of the revolution, imbued with Latin literature, who set their eyes on the Roman Republic, borrowed from it its laws, its farts of the rods that concealed the axes, and its togas, trying to adopt its institutions and following its example in everything. But they did not become Romans from this, although they were influenced by a powerful historical compulsion. The role of the philosopher, therefore, is to seek out what has survived the old beliefs under a changed appearance, and to discern what in this moving stream of opinion must be attributed to the common beliefs and soul of the race. Without such a philosophical criterion, one would think that the crowd changes its religious and political beliefs very often and whenever it pleases. Indeed, all history, political, religious, artistic and literary, points to this. Take, for example, the very brief period of our history, from 1790 to 1820. A thirty-year span of time spanning only one generation. We see that the crowd was first monarchical, then extremely revolutionary, then it became imperialist, and finally it returned again to monarchism. In religion, at the same time, the crowd goes from Catholicism to atheism, then to deism, and finally back to the most exaggerated forms of Catholicism. But it is not only the crowd that does this, but those who lead it, we are surprised to see how these same members of the convention, sworn enemies of kings, who recognize neither gods nor monarchs, become the humblest servants of Napoleon and carry wax candles with piety in processions under Louis XVIII and in the seventy years that followed, how many changes occurred in the opinions of the crowd. Treacherous Albion becomes at the beginning of this century an ally of France under Napoleon's successor, and Russia, who was twice subjected to our invasion, and who so rejoiced at our last failure, has suddenly become recognized as our best friend. In literature, the arts, and philosophy, such changes are even more rapid. Romanticism, naturalism, mysticism, etc., are born and die one after the other, and the artist and the writer, who yesterday were still admired by us, today excite only deep contempt. If we analyze all these changes, which seem to us so profound, we will see that all that is contrary to the common beliefs and sentiments of the race has only an ephemeral existence, and that for a time the river that has swept away returns always again to its former direction. Opinions which are not connected with any common belief or sentiment of the race, 
and therefore have no solidity, are at the mercy of all chance, in other words, depend on the slightest change in the environment. Emerged under the influence of suggestion and contagion, these opinions are always temporary, they arise and disappear, sometimes with the same rapidity as sand dunes brought about by the wind on the seashore. These days, the number of moving crowd opinions is greater than ever, and this is due to the following three reasons. The first reason is the gradual weakening of former beliefs, which are more and more losing their power and can no longer act on the transient opinions of the crowd to give them a certain direction. The disappearance of common beliefs gives place to a mass of private opinions with no past or future. The second is the increasing power of the multitude, which is finding less and less counterbalance, so that the extraordinary mobility of ideas found in the multitude can manifest itself quite freely without encountering any hindrance. The third is the seal, which spreads the most contradictory opinions and, by suggestion of one kind, quickly replaces suggestion of another. No opinion can thus be firmly established and condemned to destruction before it has had time to spread so widely as to become general. All these reasons have given rise to an entirely new phenomenon in the history of the world and, moreover, one extremely characteristic of the modern age, the powerlessness of governments to control the opinions of the masses. Once upon a time, not so long ago, the action of governments, the influence of a few writers and a very small number of press organs were the true regulators of the opinions of the crowd. Nowadays the writers have lost all influence, and the journals serve only as a reflection of the opinions of the crowd. As for the men of state, instead of directing the opinions of the crowd, they try to follow them. They are afraid of this opinion, and this fear, sometimes even to the point of terror, deprives them of stability in their actions. Crowd opinion thus tends more and more to become the supreme regulator of politics. At present it already enjoys so much power that it can impose certain alliances on the state, as could be observed recently in the case of the Union with Russia, caused exclusively by the popular movement. A characteristic symptom of our day is also the consent of popes, kings, and emperors to be interviewed and to give their thoughts on a given subject to the judgment of the mob. It was once said that politics should not be a matter of feeling, but can this be said now, when politics is more and more guided by the impulses of a fickle crowd that does not recognize reason and submits only to feeling? As for the press, which once directed the opinions of the crowd, it too, like governments, has had to be cowed by the power of the crowd. To be sure, the press is still a considerable force but only because it reflects the opinions of the crowd and their incessant changes. Having become a mere reference agency, the press has refused to carry any ideas or doctrines to the crowd. It monitors all changes in public opinion, and the conditions of competition compel it to monitor it very carefully for fear of losing its readers. The old organs of the press, the serious and influential ones, such as the Constitutional, the Debats, the Siècle, to which the previous generation listened with the same reverence as to orators, have disappeared or have been converted into reference sheets, posting laughable chronicles, profane gossip and financial advertisements. Where can one find a newspaper in our country now so rich that its editors can afford to express their personal opinions? And what weight can these opinions have in the eyes of readers who want only to be informed and amused? and who constantly fear that speculation is behind every recommendation of a newspaper. Criticism does not even dare to recommend a book or a theatrical play, because it can only damage them, not help them at all. Magazines are so aware of the uselessness of criticism or of any personal opinion that they have little by little destroyed all the departments of literary criticism and limit themselves to printing only one book title, adding two or three lines of advertising and nothing more. In twenty years' time, it is likely that the same fate will befall theater criticism. Listening to the opinions of the masses is now the chief concern of the press and the governments. What? What effect this or that event, legislative draft, speech has had that is what they constantly need to know. But this is not easy, because nothing can be more changeable than the thoughts of the crowd, and it is often possible to observe how the crowd curses what they praised the day before. 
such a total lack of leadership of the opinions of the mob, as well as the destruction of common beliefs, has had the end result of a complete disintegration of all beliefs and an increasing indifference of the mob to everything that does not concern its immediate interests. Questions concerning such doctrines as socialism find convincing defenders only in the completely illiterate segments, such as the factory and mine workers. The petty bourgeois and workers, who have received some education, have either become infected with skepticism or have become unusually changeable in their way of thinking. The evolution that has taken place in the course of 25 years in this direction is truly astounding. In the preceding and even not very distant epic opinions still indicated some orientation in a certain direction, they derived from some basic common belief. The monarchist was fatefully supposed to have known very definite beliefs in both history and science, while the republican was supposed to have quite the opposite ideas. The monarchist, for example, was absolutely convinced that he did not descend from an ape, whereas the republican was convinced otherwise. The monarchist must have been horrified by the revolution, while the republican must have been respectful. Some names were uttered with reverence, others with a curse. Even at the Sorbonne a similarly naive view of history prevailed. Nowadays, through discussion and analysis, opinions lose their charm and their harshness is quickly smoothed out. Very few of these opinions still retain enough power to fascinate us, and modern man is more and more covered by indifference. Let us not, however, deplore this general disappearance of stable opinions. It cannot, of course, be denied that in the life of the people it serves as a symptom of decadence. There is no doubt that the clairvoyants, the apostles, the leaders, in a word, the convinced have a very different power from the deniers, the critics, and the indifferent. But we must not forget, with the existing power of the crowd, any opinion with a sufficient degree of charm to overwhelm it should immediately gain such tyrannical power that the era of free judgment would cease for a long time. The crowd represents a ruler, sometimes peaceful, as Heliogobal and Tiberius were peaceful, but nevertheless terrible in their moments of caprice. If any civilization falls under the power of the crowd, it becomes dependent on a mass of accidents and can no longer last long. If anything is able to postpone the hour of final destruction, it is precisely this ever-increasing indifference of the crowd to all common belief. Asterisk Section 3 Classification and Description of the Various Categories of Crowds Chapter 1 Classification of the Crowd A General Division of the Crowd Its Classification Asterisk 1 A Heterogeneous Crowd How It Is Formed the influence of race. The soul of the crowd is expressed the weaker the stronger the soul of the race. The soul of the race reflects the state of civilization, the soul of the crowd the state of barbarism. Asterisk 2. The homogeneous crowd, the division of the homogeneous crowd. Sex, castes, and classes. We have already studied the general features peculiar to the spiritualized crowd. Now we must consider the particular features which join these general features in assemblies of different categories when, under the influence of the corresponding exciters, these assemblies become a crowd. The starting point in classifying a crowd will serve us as a simple crowd. The lowest form of such a crowd is observed when it consists of individuals of different races and has no other common bond than the more or less revered will of one leader. The type of such a horde is the barbarians of very different origins who flooded the Roman Empire for many centuries. Above this horde, consisting of different races, there will be such a crowd, which, under the influence of known factors, has already acquired common features, and has finally formed a race. On occasion such a crowd, too, may exhibit special traits characteristic of crowds of all kinds, but still above them will prevail to a greater or lesser degree, the traits peculiar to race. Both categories of crowds, under the influence of the factors we spoke about above, can turn into an organized or spiritualized crowd. In this organized crowd we establish the following distinctions. Crowd 1. Anonymous, a street crowd, for example. Diverse 2.Non-anonymous, juries, parliamentary. 
meetings, etc. Crowd 1. Sex, political, religious, etc. Homogeneous 2. Castes, military, clergy, workers, etc. 3. Classes, bourgeoisie, peasantry, etc. Let us try to define in a few words the main distinguishing features of these different categories of crowd. Asterisk 1. Heterogeneous crowd. We have already spoken about the characteristic features of this crowd before. Such a crowd is composed of individuals of the most varied professions and mental development. We already know that the collective psychology of the people who form an active crowd differs considerably from their individual psychology, and mental development does not prevent it. We know that the mind plays no role in assemblies, and the engines are unconscious feelings. The main factor race allows us to establish even deeper differences between the various forms of such crowds. We have already had occasion to return to the question of the role played by race and to point out that it is the most powerful factor in determining the actions of people and, in addition, is expressed in the actions and characteristics of crowds. A crowd composed of individuals of a wide variety but of the same race, example English or Chinese, differs greatly from a crowd composed of individuals also of all kinds but belonging to different races, example Russians, Frenchmen, Spaniards. The profound differences created by the hereditary mental organization in the thoughts and feelings of people are immediately exposed as soon as circumstances, however rare, bring together in a crowd and in approximately equal proportions, individuals of different nationalities, these differences are revealed even in spite of the apparent commonality of interests which have forced them to gather together. Attempts by socialists to bring together in a general congress representatives of the working people of each country have usually resulted only in the most violent disagreements. The Latin crowd, no matter how revolutionary or conservative, will inevitably turn to the intervention of the state to realize its demands. This crowd always reveals a tendency toward centralization and Caesarism. The English or American crowd, on the other hand, does not recognize the state and will always turn to private initiative. The French crowd stands most for equality, the English for freedom. Such differences existing between the races lead to the fact that socialism and democracy represent almost as many different forms as there are nations. The soul of the race is quite subordinate to the soul of the crowd and has a powerful power to limit its fluctuations. It must be recognized as a basic law that the inferior properties of the crowd are expressed the weaker the more the soul of the race is developed in it. Crowd domination means barbarism or a return to barbarism. Only by acquiring a firmly organized soul can a race, little by little, be rid of the irrational power of the crowd over it and emerge from the state of barbarism. Leaving race aside, we can divide the heterogeneous crowd into two divisions, the anonymous crowd, the street crowd, and the non-anonymous crowd, to which all deliberative assemblies, such as the jury, must belong. The sense of responsibility, which does not exist in a crowd of the first kind, is developed in a crowd of the second kind and gives its actions a very often completely different direction. Asterisk 2. The homogeneous crowd. A homogeneous crowd consists of three categories, sex, castes, and classes. A sect represents the first degree of organization of a homogeneous crowd. It consists of individuals of different professions and upbringing, of different backgrounds, with beliefs serving as the only link between them. Such, for example, are the various religious as well as political sects. The caste represents the highest degree of organization available to the crowd. A sect, as we have seen, consists of individuals of different professions, upbringing and environment, bound only by common beliefs, while a caste consists only of individuals of the same profession, therefore, coming from approximately the same environment and having received the same upbringing. Such would be the military caste and the spiritual caste. A class is formed by individuals of different origin, gathered together not because of the commonality of beliefs, as we see in the members of any sect, not because of the commonality of occupations, as it is observed in caste, 
but because of certain interests, habits formed under the influence of the same way of life and upbringing. Such are, for example, the bourgeois class, the agricultural class, etc. In this work I will not enter into a detailed study of the homogeneous crowd, sex, castes, and classes, for I am deferring this to the next volume. I intend to conclude my study of the heterogeneous crowd by depicting several definite categories of this crowd, which I have chosen as types. Chapter 2. The Criminal Crowd. The So-Called Criminal Crowd. A crowd may be criminal from the point of view of the law, but will not be so from the psychological point of view. The Total Unconsciousness of the Acts of the Mob. Different Examples. The Psychology of the Septemberists. Their Reasoning, Sensibility, Ferocity, and Morality. The name criminal crowd is in no way appropriate to such a crowd, which, after a certain state of excitement, has become a mere unconscious automaton, obeying compulsions. But I still retain this erroneous name, because it is legitimized by the latest psychological research. Undoubtedly, some acts of the mob are criminal when considered by themselves, but then the act of a tiger devouring a Hindu must also be called criminal. Crowd crimes are always caused by some very powerful compulsion, and the individuals who have taken part in that crime are convinced that they have done their duty, which cannot be said of the common criminal. The history of mob crimes quite confirms all of the above. A typical example is the assassination of the governor of the Bastille de Lone. After the capture of this fortress, the governor was surrounded by a very excited mob, and blows began to be showered on him on all sides. Some suggested that he should be hanged, others suggested that his head should be cut off or tied to a horse's tail. As he fought back, he accidentally kicked one of those present. Immediately someone suggested that the one who had received the blow should slit the governor's throat, and this suggestion was immediately accepted by the crowd. The one who had to perform the executioner's role was a cook without a seat, who had gone with other onlookers to the Bastille to see what was being done there. Obedient to the general decision, he was convinced that he was performing a patriotic feat and even deserved a medal for having killed the monster. With the saber handed to him, he struck the governor on the bare neck, but the saber was badly sharpened. Then he quietly took out of his pocket a small knife with a black handle, and as he had learned how to cut meat as a cook, he safely completed the operation he was to do with this knife. In this case one can clearly trace the operation of the mechanism mentioned above, obedience to compulsion, all the more powerful because it is collective, and the assurance of the murderer that he is committing a commendable act, an assurance all the more powerful because he sees the unanimous approval of his fellow citizens. Of course, such an act would be criminal from the point of view of the law, but from the psychological point of view we would not call it so. The common features of the criminal crowd are the same as those of any other crowd, susceptibility to suggestion, credulity, inconstancy, priority of feelings, both good and bad. All these traits are to be found in the crowd that has left one of the worst memories in our history of the so-called Septemberists. They do, however, share many traits with the murderers of the Night of Bartholomew. The details I will give here are borrowed from Taine who drew them from the memoirs of his contemporaries. It is not known exactly who gave the order or inspired the idea of emptying the prisons by beating the prisoners. Whether it was Danton or someone else makes no difference. The only thing of interest to us in this case is the fact of the powerful indoctrination received by the mob charged with committing the murders. The murdering mob consisted of about 400 people and represented the most perfect type of heterogeneous crowd. Except for a small number of professional beggars, it consisted almost entirely of shopkeepers and artisans of all classes, shoemakers, locksmiths, barbers, bricklayers, officials, commissioners, etc. Under the influence of the same indoctrination to which the cook obeyed in the above case, all these people were absolutely convinced that they were performing a patriotic duty. They were doing double duty as judges and executioners and did not consider themselves criminals at all. The importance of their mission led them, first of all, to form a kind of tribunal, and in this the one-sidedness of the mob and its justice was immediately exposed. 
In view of the great number of the accused it was decided that the nobles, priests, officers, courtiers, in a word, people whose mere rank was already sufficient proof of their guilt in the eyes of a good patriot, would be killed en masse, without further deliberation or special judgment, as for others, they would be judged by their appearance and by their reputation. Thus, the mob satisfied the demands of its primitive conscience and could already legally proceed to murder, giving vent to its instincts of ferocity, the genesis of which I have indicated above and which are always developed to a very high degree in the mob. But these instincts in no way interfere with the alternating manifestation of completely opposite feelings in the crowd, such as sensitivity, which reaches as extreme as ferocity. These people possess the expansive sensitivity that characterizes the Parisian worker. One of the Faderats, for example, learned that prisoners in a state prison had been left without water for 26 hours. He became so enraged that he would have torn the negligent jailer to pieces had the prisoners not interceded for him. When the improvised tribunal acquitted a prisoner, the guards and murderers embraced him with rapturous applause and then proceeded to massacre again. During the murders themselves, the fun did not cease, they danced around the corpses, set up benches for the ladies who wanted to see the aristocrats being murdered. At the same time, the murderers never ceased to display a very peculiar sense of justice. One of the murderers told the tribunal that the ladies sitting far away could not see well, and that only some of those present had the pleasure of beating the aristocrats. The tribunal recognized the justice of this remark, and it was decided that the condemned should be slowly led between the trellises of the murderers, who would beat them with the blunt end of their sabers to prolong their torment. They hacked up the completely naked victims for half an hour and then, when everyone had had enough of watching, they finished off the unfortunates by opening their bellies. But in another respect the murderers showed such great scrupulosity and morality that one would hardly expect from them. They took, for example, neither money nor valuables found on their victims and brought them all to the committees intact. In all such actions one can observe the primary forms of reasoning characteristic of the mob's soul. Thus, after slaughtering between 12,000 and 15,000 of the nation's enemies, the mob immediately submitted to a new suggestion. Someone remarked that in other prisons, too, where there were old beggars, tramps, and young inmates, there were many mouths to be cut off, and that, besides, there must surely be enemies of the people among them like a certain Madame de Leru, the poisoner's widow. She must be furious that she is in prison. If she could, she would set Paris on fire, she certainly said it, she said it. Another broom stroke. Such arguments seemed so convincing to the crowd that all the prisoners were interrupted in a herd, and including about fifty children between the ages of twelve and seventeen, who, after all, might also in time turn into enemies of the nation, so it was better to get rid of them now. After a week of such labor, when everything was finished, the murderers could finally think of resting. Quite convinced that they had earned the gratitude of the fatherland, they presented themselves to the authorities demanding a reward, the most zealous even laid claim to a medal. The history of the Commune of 1871 contains many similar facts and we shall see more and more of the same as the influence of the mob grows and the authorities capitulate to it. Chapter 3 Jurors and Criminal Courts Jurors of Criminal Courts The General Nature of Juries Statistics indicate that their decisions are independent of their composition. How to Impress Jurors Weakness of Reasoning The Modes of Persuasion Resorted to by Famous Attorneys the nature of the offenses concerning which juries are lenient or severe. The benefit of the institution of juries, and the greatest danger which their replacement by judges would pose. Not being able to deal here with all categories of jurors, I shall focus only on the one I consider most important, the jury of the criminal court. These jurors are an excellent example of a heterogeneous, non-anonymous crowd. We find here a susceptibility to suggestion, a predominance of unconscious feelings together with a weak development of reasoning ability, and the influence of ringleaders, etc., etc. In studying this category of jurors, 
we can observe interesting patterns of error that can be made by people who are not privy to the psychology of the masses. Jurors first of all give us an excellent example of how little importance, in terms of the decisions made, is attached to the mental level of the individual individuals who make up the crowd. We have said before that intelligence plays no role in the decisions of a deliberative assembly concerning general and not exclusively technical matters. The judgments expressed concerning general matters by an assembly of bricklayers and grocers differ little from those of scientists and artists when they come together to confer on these matters. At different times, namely, before 1848, the administration made a very careful selection of persons called to serve as jurors, settling chiefly on men of learning, professors, officials, men of letters, etc. Now jurors are mostly recruited from small merchants, shopkeepers, landlords, laborers, and clerks. And to the great surprise of specialists, statistics have indicated that whatever the composition of the jury, its verdicts are identical. The judges themselves, however hostile they may be to the institution of juries, could not fail to recognize the justice of this fact. Here is how the former president of the criminal court, Berard de Glieger, puts it in his memoirs. At present, the selection of jurors is really in the hands of municipal councillors, who enroll some and exclude others at will, based on political and electoral considerations related to their position. The majority, chosen consists of merchants, not so large as those chosen in former times, and of servants in various departments. But all opinions and all professions merge in the face of the judges, some of them revealing the ardor of neophytes, the spirit of the jury, therefore, has not been altered and its verdicts have remained the same. From this quotation we retain only the conclusions, quite fair, but not the explanations, for they are not true. There is nothing to be surprised here, for the psychology of the crowd, and consequently of the jury, is for the most part unknown to either judges or attorneys. Proof of this may be seen, for example, in the following fact stated by the author of the above quotation. One of the most famous attorneys of the criminal court, Le Chau, systematically exercised his right to reject jurors and always excluded all educated persons from the jury list. But experience proved in the end the futility of such exceptions, and we see now that the Ministry of Justice and the lawyers, at least in Paris, have completely abandoned this system, and despite this, as de Glieger rightly observes, jury verdicts have not changed, they have not become either better or worse since then. Jurors, like the mob, are easily influenced by feelings and very little influenced by reason. They cannot resist, says one lawyer, the sight of a woman breastfeeding her infant, or the defilement of orphans before them. To win the judge's favor, it is enough for a woman to be pretty, says de Glieger. Ruthless to such crimes as might touch their personal safety, indeed most dangerous to society, juries are very lenient to crimes committed under the influence of passion. They are very seldom severe on a girl guilty of infanticide, or on an abandoned girl who poured sulfuric acid on her seducer. In all such cases the jury instinctively understands that these crimes are not very dangerous to society, and that in a country where there are no laws patronizing abandoned girls, the crime of one who avenges herself is even more useful than harmful, for it serves as a warning to the seducers. Let us note in passing that this distinction, which is instinctively made by the jury between crimes dangerous to society and those not, is not devoid of justice. The purpose of criminal laws must, of course, be to protect society from dangerous criminals, not to retaliate against them. But our penal codes and especially our judges are still imbued with the vindictive spirit of ancient primitive law, and the term vindicta is used almost daily. Proof of this inclination on the part of our judges is the refusal of the majority to apply the excellent Beranger law, which permits a convicted person to serve his sentence only when he has committed a recidivism. Meanwhile, every judge knows perfectly well, as statistics prove, that a first-time punishment inevitably leads to recidivism. But judges always feel that society is left unrevenged if they release a convicted person, and so they prefer to create dangerous recidivists rather than leave society without proper vengeance. Juries, like all crowds, are easily dazzled by charm, 
and although, as the Glieger quite rightly observes, they are very democratic in their composition, they are nevertheless always aristocratic in their predilections. Name, descent, great fortune, reputation, defense by a famous lawyer, and generally all that distinguishes and shines, constitute a very advantageous condition for the accused. Every good lawyer should take the greatest care to act on the feelings of the jury, as they do on the feelings of the crowd, he should not reason much, and if he wants to resort to this method, he should use only the most primitive forms of reasoning. One English lawyer, famous for his success in criminal court, pointed out how to proceed. He kept a close eye on the jury during his speech. This is the most favorable moment. Through flair and habit, the lawyer read on the faces of the jurors the impression made by each of his phrases, words, and drew his conclusions from there. First of all, he had to discern those who were already on his side beforehand. Having secured their cooperation in an instant, he would move on to those who seemed to him not to be in favor of the accused, and try to guess what it was that was restoring them against him. This is the most difficult part of the job, because there may be many reasons that give rise to a desire to condemn a person beyond any sense of justice. These few lines summarize the whole mechanism of oratory, and it becomes clear to us why speeches prepared in advance always work so poorly. One must change expressions minute by minute, constantly paying attention to the impression one is making. An orator does not need to draw all the jurors to his side he must draw only the ringleaders who give direction to the general consensus. As in any crowd, so here, there are only a small number of individuals who lead others. I have learned from experience, says the lawyer I am quoting, that at the time of the verdict, one or two energetic men are enough to lead the rest of the jury. It is these two or three leaders whom the lawyer must try to persuade by means of skillful persuasion. First of all, you must try to make them like you. If an individual in the crowd likes you, he is ready to be imbued with all your convictions, and he finds all your arguments, whatever they may be, excellent. Here is an anecdote I borrowed from an interesting book on Le Show. It is well known that during his defense speeches made in court, Le Show constantly keeps an eye out for two or three of the jurors who seem to him influential but intractable. He usually succeeded in softening these obstinate jurors, but one day in the province he came across one on whom no argument worked, even though Lachaud had been pouring it out in front of him for three quarters of an hour. He was the first juror to sit on the second bench, the seventh juror in a row. There was much to despair about. Suddenly, in the midst of his passionate convictions, Lachaud stops and, turning to the president of the court, says, Mr. President, can you please order the curtain down there, opposite, Mr. Seventh Juror is completely blinded by the sun. The Seventh Juror, blushing, smiled and thanked. From that moment on, he was already drawn to the side of the defense. Many writers, and even some of the very distinguished ones, have lately begun to strongly attack the institution of the jury, which, however, serves for us as the only protection against the errors and mistakes and very frequent ones at that, of such a caste, which is not subject to any control. Some of these writers would like to see juries chosen only from the educated classes. But we have already proved that the decisions of the jury, even under such conditions, will remain the same as they are now, under the present composition of the jury. Others, on the basis of errors in the verdicts of jurors, would like to abolish these latter altogether and replace them with judges. But those mistakes, of which the jury is now so accused, are first of all made by the judges themselves, because if any defendant appears before a jury, it means that he has already been found guilty by the judges themselves, the investigating judge, the prosecutor, etc. The magistracy is really the only agency whose actions are not subject to any control. Despite all the revolutions, democratic France does not possess. After all, the habeas corpus right of which England is so proud. We have banished all tyrants, but in every city we have planted a judge who, at his own discretion, disposes of the honor and liberty of his fellow citizens. The lowliest investigating judge, barely out of school, has the outrageous right to imprison at his discretion the most honorable citizens, and yet on mere personal suspicion, 
of which he is under no obligation to give any account. He can keep them in prison for six months, a year under the pretext of investigation and then release them without any reward or apology. The order to bring them to trial is quite analogous to the famous Lettre de Cachet, the only difference being that this last means, which was so rightly reproached by the former monarchy, could only be used by very important persons, while now this means is in the hands of a whole class of citizens, who can by no means be counted among the most enlightened and independent. Does it not follow that if the accused were tried by judges and not by a jury, he would lose his only chance of acquittal? In any case, the mistakes of the jury are only the consequence of the mistakes of the judges. These latter alone are responsible for monstrous miscarriages of justice, like the recent case of Dr. L., who was prosecuted by a rather limited investigating judge on the mere testimony of a half-wit who accused the doctor of having miscarried her for 30 F. The doctor would certainly have been sent to penal servitude, had it not been for the outrage of public opinion which prompted the head of state to grant him an immediate pardon. The honesty of the defendant, witnessed by all his fellow citizens, seemed to prove the grossness of the mistake, and the judges themselves even admitted this, but, following the spirit of caste, they did everything in their power to prevent the pardon. In all such cases the jury, who understand nothing of the technical details, naturally listens to what the prosecution says, and in the end is reassured by the fact that the case has been investigated by judges who are already skilled in all sorts of subtleties. In such cases, who is the real culprit for mistakes the judges or the jury? Let us carefully guard the institution of the jury, for it is probably the only category of the crowd that cannot be replaced by any individual personality. Only this institution is able to soften the severity of laws, which, already because they are the same for all, must be blind in principle and cannot take into account private cases. Impervious to compassion and recognizing only the text of the law, a judge with his professional severity will sentence to the same punishment a robber, a murderer, and a poor girl, abandoned to the mercy of her seducer, driven to infanticide by her need. The jury instinctively feels that the seduced girl is far less guilty than her seducer, who is not, however, subject to the penalty of the law, and so they leniently punish her. Knowing well the psychology of the castes, as well as the psychology of other categories of the crowd, I do not see any case in which I might not wish to deal better with juries than with judges, if I were to be wrongly accused of any crime. With the former I would still have some chance of acquittal, whereas with the latter I would not. Let us fear the power of the mob, but we should fear even more the power of certain castes. The former may be persuaded, but the latter remain intransigent. Chapter for the Electoral Crowd common features of the electoral crowd. How to persuade it. Qualities a candidate must possess. The necessity of charm. Why do workers and peasants so seldom elect candidates from their own midst? The powerful influence of words and formulas on the voter. The general appearance of electoral debates. How voter opinions are formed. The powerful influence of committees. They represent the most dangerous form of tyranny. Committees of the Revolution General balloting cannot be replaced, despite its little psychological value. Why would voting remain the same even if suffrage were granted only to a limited class of citizens? What is the expression of the ballot in all countries? An electoral crowd, that is, those assemblies convened to elect people to prominent positions, is a heterogeneous crowd but since its actions are directed to only one quite definite purpose choice between different candidates, only some of the characteristic features we have already described can be observed in it. The most outstanding features of this crowd will be weak ability to reason, absence of critical spirit, irritability, credulity and one-sidedness. In the decisions of this crowd one can easily trace the influence of leaders and the role of the factors we have listed above, assertion, repetition, charm, and contagion. Let us now trace the ways of influencing a selective crowd, because on this basis we can imagine its psychology more clearly. The first condition an electoral candidate must possess is charm. Personal charm can only be replaced by the charm of wealth. 
even talent and genius are not serious conditions for success. The most important thing is charm, that is, the ability to present oneself to the electorate without being challenged. If voters, the majority of whom are workers and peasants, so seldom choose representatives from their own milieu, it is only because the people who come from their own milieu have no charm. If, by chance, they elect someone from their own milieu, it is usually for incidental reasons, a desire to hinder some eminent person, a major master of workers, for example, with whom the voters themselves are in constant subordination. By doing so, voters gain for a time the illusion of power over someone to whom they have always been subordinate. Charm, however, is not always a guarantee of success. The voter also wants his vanity to be flattered and his lusts to be gratified. In order to influence him, it is necessary to shower him with the most ridiculous flattery and not being shy to give him the most fantastic promises. If it is a worker, we must flatter him by scolding his master, as for the opponent candidate, we must try to destroy him by spreading about him the opinion by means of statements, repetition and contagion that he is the last of the scoundrels and that everyone knows how many crimes he has committed. There is, of course, no need to look for anything even resembling evidence in this case. If the adversary knows little about the psychology of the crowd, he will begin to justify himself with arguments instead of responding to assertions with opposite assertions, and will of course thereby lose any chance of success. A candidate's written program should not be too categorical, since opponents may take advantage of it and present it to him later on, but his verbal program should be the most excessive. He may promise without fear the most important reforms. All these exaggerated promises make a strong impression at the moment, but they do not bind him to anything in the future. Indeed, the voter usually does not bother to find out later whether the candidate he has chosen has kept the promises which, in fact, caused his election. In all these cases we can observe the action of the very factors of persuasion about which we spoke earlier, we will meet again with these factors when judging the action of words and formulas, which have, as we know, magical power. The orator who knows how to use them will lead the crowd wherever he wants. There are expressions that always produce the same effect, no matter how battered they may be. Such a candidate, who would be able to find a new formula, though devoid of any definite meaning, but which meets the most varied aspirations of the crowd, can of course count on unconditional success. The bloody Spanish Revolution of 1873 was produced by means of several such words, which have complex meanings and which everyone can explain in his own way. One contemporary writer tells the origin of this revolution as follows. The radicals came to the conviction that a unitary republic nothing but a disguised monarchy, and the Cortes, to please them, proclaimed a federal republic unanimously, with none of the votaries able to say what they were essentially voting. But the formula announced delighted and delighted everyone. All thought they had established on earth a kingdom of virtue and happiness. One Republican, whom his enemy did not want to be called a Federalist, took offense, as if he had been mortally insulted. In the streets they greeted each other with salute at Republica Federal, and sang hymns in praise of the soldiers' lack of discipline and autonomy. What was this Federal Republic really? Some understood it as the emancipation of the provinces, institutions like those in the United States, or the decentralization of administration. Others thought of the destruction of all power, of the great social liquidation to come. The socialists in Barcelona and Andalusia preached the absolute domination of the communities and envisioned the creation of 10,000 independent municipalities in Spain, governed by their own laws, and at the same time abolishing both the army and the gendarmerie. Soon the revolt spread throughout the provinces of the south, from one town to another, from one village to another. As soon as any community made a pronunciamiento, the first thing it did was to destroy the telegraph and the railroad, to cut off all its communications with its neighbors and with Madrid. There was not a single smallest village that did not operate separately. Federalism gave way to the crudest cantonalism, accompanied by fires and murders and marked by bloody Saturnalia. As to the influence that reasoning might have on the minds of voters, 
it is enough to read the minutes of any electoral assembly to form a definite opinion on this point. In such an assembly there are assertions, scoldings, and sometimes blows, but never any reasoning, and if for a time silence is restored, it is only when someone present with a grumpy disposition declares that he wishes to propose a candidate one of those difficult questions which always thrill the audience. But the joy of the opponents is usually short-lived, for soon their opponents drown out with their roar the one who first casts his vote. The type of all public meetings of this kind can be considered those whose minutes I select here from hundreds of other similar minutes printed almost daily in various newspapers. The organizer asked those present to choose a president, and this was enough for a thunderstorm to break out. The anarchists rushed forward to take the bureau by storm, while the socialists tried to repel them, shoving and swearing at each other as venal spies, etc., and at last one of them left with a black eye. Finally, somehow, the bureau was able to be composed amidst the general noise, and Companion X remains on the rostrum. He begins to develop a real indictment against the socialists, who interrupt him with shouts of Cretan, bandit, canal, etc. epithets to which Companion X responds by outlining a theory portraying the socialists as idiots or buffoons. The Alamein party organized a large preparatory meeting for the workers' holiday of the 1st of May last night in the trade hall of the Rue du Faubourg du Tamil. The slogan was, Silence and Tranquility. Company G called the socialists cretins and deceivers. Immediately the speakers and listeners began to scold each other, and it came to a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Chairs, benches, tables, etc. appeared on the stage. It should not be thought, however, that this mode of discussion was peculiar only to a certain class of voters and would have been dependent on their social position. In any anonymous assembly, whatever it may be, even if it consists exclusively of scholars, the debate always takes the same form. I have already said that people in crowds tend to smooth out mental differences, and we find evidence of this at every turn. Here, for example, is an extract from the minutes of one meeting composed entirely of students, borrowed by me from the newspaper Temps of February 13, 1895. The noise increased as time went on, and I don't think there was a single speaker who could have said two sentences without being interrupted. Every minute there was shouting from one place, from another, or from all places at once, there was applause, whistling, furious arguments among the various listeners, waving canes menacingly, pounding the floor gently, shouting, out. To the rostrum. M. S. began to fling the most unflattering epithets at the association, calling it vile, monstrous, venal and vindictive, etc., declaring that he was striving for its destruction. The question is, under such conditions, how does the voter form his opinion? But such a question can only arise for us when we are under a strange delusion about the freedom of such an assembly. The crowd, after all, has only indoctrinated opinions and never makes them by reasoning. In the cases that concern us, the opinions and the will of the voters are in the hands of electoral committees, where the ringleaders are most often wine merchants, who have influence over the workers because they give them credit. Do you know what an election committee is? asks one of the most courageous defenders of modern democracy, Mr. Seegerer. It is simply the key to all our institutions, the main part of our political machine. France is now run by committees. Committees, whatever their name, clubs, syndicates, etc., constitute, perhaps, the most important element of the danger of the impending power of the mob. They constitute the most impersonal and therefore the most oppressive form of tyranny. The leaders of the committees, having the right to speak and act on behalf of an assembly, are relieved of all responsibility and can afford to do anything. None of the most ferocious tyrants could ever have dreamed of such injunctions as were issued, for example, by the revolutionary committees. They exterminated the convent and curtailed it, and Robespierre remained absolute ruler as long as he could speak on their behalf. But the day he separated himself from them, he died. The kingdom of the mob is that of committees, i.e., leaders, and one cannot imagine a worse despotism. It is not difficult to influence committees, just that the candidate must be accepted and have sufficient resources. 
by the confession of the donors themselves, three million was enough to arrange a multiple election for General Boulanger. This is the psychology of the electoral crowd, it does not differ from the psychology of the crowd of other categories and is in no way better or worse than it. But from all the above I still do not conclude against the universal suffrage. If the fate of this institution depended on me, I would leave it as it exists now, guided by practical considerations arising directly from the study of crowd psychology. No doubt the inconveniences of universal suffrage are conspicuous enough that it cannot be denied. Nor can it be denied that civilization has been the work of only a small minority gifted with the highest mental faculties and occupying the top of the pyramid, gradually expanding downward as the mental level of the various strata of nations declines. Of course, the greatness of civilizations cannot depend on the voices of inferior elements who take only numbers, no doubt, the voices of the multitude are often very dangerous, and we have paid the price for this more than once with invasions. It is very likely that we will pay even more dearly in the future in view of the approaching power of the mob. But all these objections, absolutely true in theoretical terms, lose all their force in our eyes in practice when we remember the unshakable power of ideas transformed into dogmas. The dogma of the supreme power of the multitude is not subject to protection philosophically, in the same way that medieval religious dogmas were, but it nevertheless possesses absolute power at the present time, this dogma is therefore as inviolable as our religious ideas were once inviolable. Imagine a modern free thinker transported by magical force into the Middle Ages. Do you think, perhaps, that having been convinced of the supreme power of the religious ideas that prevailed then, he would have tried to fight them? Or, if he were in the hands of a judge who wanted to burn him on the charge of making a pact with the devil or of attending a coven, would he have challenged the existence of the devil or the coven? But to challenge the beliefs of the multitude is like arguing with a hurricane. The dogma of universal suffrage has as much power now as religious dogmas once did. Orators and writers speak of it with such respect and such subservience as not even Louis XIV had. That is why we must treat this dogma as we treat all religious dogmas, which are only affected by time. It would, however, be useless to try to shake this dogma, for it does rest on some arguments which speak in its favor. In times of equality, Tocqueville rightly says, men have no confidence in each other on account of their similarity. But it is precisely this similarity which gives them confidence, almost without limit, in public opinion, because they suppose that, in view of the general uniformity of mental development, the truth must be where the majority is. To suppose, therefore, that a restriction of votes on any grounds whatsoever should lead to an improvement in the votes of the crowd? I do not allow this for the reasons I have previously stated concerning the low mental level of all assemblies, whatever their composition. In a crowd people are always compared, and when it comes to general questions, the votes of forty academicians will be no better than those of forty watermen. I do not think that the votes which have so often been blamed on universal suffrage, example, the restoration of the empire, would have been of a different character if the voters had been chosen exclusively from among scholars and the educated. If an individual has learned Greek, mathematics, has become an architect, a veterinarian, a physician, or a lawyer, this does not mean that he has acquired a special knowledge of social matters. After all, all our economists are mostly educated people, in most cases professors and academicians, but is there a single general question, protectionism, bimetallism, etc., about which they would agree? And this is because all their science is only a very mitigated form of general ignorance. Before social problems, on the other hand, where so many unknowns enter, all ignorance compares. Thus, even if the electorate were made up entirely of people stuffed with science, still their vote would be no better and no worse than today's voter turnout. They will be just as guided by their feelings and the spirit of their party. Our predicament would not diminish one bit, but we would also have to experience the heavy tyranny of the castes. 
the vote of the mob would be the same everywhere and in the end would always be the expression of the aspirations and unconscious needs of the race, whether this vote was limited or general, and whether it was practiced in a republican or monarchical country, in France, Belgium, Greece, Portugal, or Spain. The arithmetical average of all elections, in every country, is a picture of the soul of the race, and that soul remains almost the same from generation to generation. All the foregoing leads us once more to the conclusion that race is of great importance, and that institutions and governments play only a minor part in the life of nations. These latter are chiefly governed by the soul of the race, i.e., by the hereditary remnants, the sum of which actually constitutes the soul of the race. Race and the purpose of the essential necessities of daily life these are the mysterious rulers that govern the destinies of a nation. Chapter 5 Parliament Councils the parliamentary crowd exhibits most of the traits common to a heterogeneous, non-anonymous crowd. Unilateralism of opinion. Susceptibility to suggestion and its limits. The role of leaders. Reasons for their charm. They are the real masters of the assembly, whose vote thus appears to be the vote of a small minority. The power of the ringleaders is absolute. Elements of their oratory. Word and imagery. An orator who has no charm is unable to make his arguments be accepted. Exaggeration of feelings, both good and bad. Automatism, expressed at certain moments. Meetings of the convention. Occasions when the assembly loses the characteristics of a crowd. The influence of specialists in technical matters. The advantages and dangers of a parliamentary regime in all countries. It is adapted to modern needs, but entails financial expenditure and a progressive restriction of liberty. Conclusion Parliamentary assemblies are a heterogeneous crowd, non-anonymous. Though their composition varies from age to age and from nation to nation, they still show similar features, with the influence of race only softening or increasing those features. Parliamentary assemblies in very different countries, in Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, France, America, have very great analogies in their debates and votes, and cause governments the same difficulties. The parliamentary mode, however, is the ideal of all modern civilized nations, although it is based on the psychologically wrong idea that many people gathered together are more likely to come to an independent and wise decision than a small number of them. In parliamentary assemblies we find features common to all crowds, one-sidedness of ideas, irritability, susceptibility to suggestion, exaggeration of feelings, the predominant influence of the leaders. But already because of its special composition the parliamentary crowd has some peculiarities, on which we will dwell here. The one-sidedness of opinions is the most important feature of this crowd. In all parties, and especially in Latin peoples, we find an unvarying tendency to solve the most complicated social problems by means of the simplest abstract principles and general laws, applicable to all cases. The principles naturally vary according to each party, but already as a consequence of being in the crowd, individuals always show a tendency to exaggerate the merits of these principles and try to push them to the extreme. This is why parliaments are always the representatives of the most extreme opinions. The most perfect example of the one-sidedness of such assemblies is represented by the Jacobins of the Great Revolution. Imbued with dogmas and logic, with a head full of vague generalities, the Jacobins sought to carry out their staunch principles without caring about events, and it is safe to say that they went through the whole revolution without noticing it. Armed with very simple dogmas that served as their guides, they imagined that they could remake society in all its parts and return refined civilization to an earlier phase of social evolution. The means they used to realize their dream were also characterized by absolute one-sidedness. They confined themselves to forcibly destroying everything that stood in their way. But all the others, the Girondists, the Montagnards, the Thermidorians, etc. etc. acted in the same way. A parliamentary crowd is very easily indoctrinated and, as in all crowds, indoctrination comes from leaders who have charm. But in parliamentary assemblies the susceptibility to suggestion has sharply defined limits, 
and it does not hurt to point to them. On all questions of local or provincial interest, members of parliamentary assemblies have opinions that are so stable and unchanging that no argumentation would be able to shake them. Even the talent of Demosthenes could not force a deputy to change his vote on such questions as protectionism, etc., which represent the demands of influential voters. The preceding indoctrination, produced in this spirit on the deputies by their constituents, is so strong that it prevents all other indoctrination and contributes to maintaining the absolute firmness of opinion. Probably to these opinions, pre-established at election time, belongs the following reflection of an old English parliamentarian, During the fifty years that I have been sitting in Westminster I have heard many speeches. Very few of them have caused me to change my opinions, but none have changed my vote. In matters of a general nature, such as the overthrow of the ministry, the institution of taxes, etc., there is no firmness of opinion, and therefore the suggestions of the chiefs can operate in the same way as in an ordinary crowd. Each party has its own leaders, who sometimes have exactly the same influence, which is why the deputy is sometimes subjected to opposite suggestions and is naturally indecisive. This explains the situation, when sometimes the deputy in a quarter of an hour changes his mind and votes in the opposite way, and adds an article to the law he has just voted, which completely destroys its importance. Thus, for example, having just taken away the right of the factory owners to choose and dismiss their workers, the deputy, by voting an amendment to this law, almost completely invalidates it. It is on this basis that the Chamber of Deputies, in every legislative period, finds, beside quite definite opinions, also very uncertain ones. But since the questions of a general character are always more numerous, the indecision inevitably prevails in the chamber, which is moreover supported by the fear of the electorate, whose implicit indoctrination always seeks to form a counterbalance to the indoctrination of the leaders. In such debates, however, which are very numerous, and on which the members of the assembly have no previously established opinions, the chiefs who impose their opinions on the crowd always win. The need for such leaders is obvious, because under the name of group leaders they are found in assemblies of all countries and are the real masters of these assemblies. People in a crowd cannot do without a leader, which is why voting in an assembly usually serves as an expression of the opinion of only a very small minority. Leaders act mainly not by their reasoning, but by their charm, and the best proof of this is that if due to any accident they lose their charm, their influence disappears with it. The charm of leaders is individual and not dependent on name or fame. Here is what Jules Simon says of the great men of 1848 among whom he sat. Two months before he was made omnipotent, Louis Napoleon was nothing. Victor Hugo ascended the rostrum. He had no success. He was listened to, as one listens to Felix Pia, but he received less applause. I don't like his ideas, Vola Bell told me, speaking of Felix Pyatt, but he is one of the greatest writers and the greatest orator of France. Edgar Canet, this rare and powerful mind, counted for nothing. He enjoyed popularity before the opening of the assembly, but had none at all in the assembly. Polemical assemblies represent precisely the kind of place on earth where the brilliance of genius is least felt. It is there that eloquence, adapted to time and place, and services rendered not to the fatherland, but to the parties, matter. It took a powerful incentive of urgent, irreducible danger to give Lamartine in 1848 and Thiers in 1871 their due homage, but as soon as it passed, both fear and gratitude immediately disappeared. I have reproduced this quotation for the sake of the facts it contains, but not for the sake of explanations of only very mediocre psychological interest. The crowd would immediately lose its character as a crowd if it took into account the services rendered by the leaders to the fatherland or to the parties. The crowd, obedient to the leader, is subject only to his charm, and no sense of interest or gratitude is added to it. Therefore, the leader, who has enough charm, has almost absolute power. It is known, for example, what enormous influence a famous deputy enjoyed for many years, thanks to his charm who was defeated in the last elections as a result of certain financial events. 
before, and his sign alone ministries were overthrown, and one writer has defined his activity as follows. To Mr. X, we owe mainly the fact that we paid three times more for Tonkin than we should have, that we did not gain a firm position in Madagascar, that we were cheated out of our dominion in the Lower Niger, and that we lost the dominant position we previously held in Egypt. Mr. X's theories have caused us more territorial losses than all the desolations of Napoleon I. We must not, however, accuse the aforementioned ringleader too much. Of course, he costs us a great deal, but still his influence was mainly based on the fact that he followed public opinion, which held different views in colonial matters than they do now. The leader very seldom goes ahead of public opinion, he usually follows it and assimilates all its fallacies. The methods of persuasion used by the ringleaders, apart from their charm, are the same as those used by any other crowd. In order to use them skillfully, the ringleader must, even if unconsciously, understand the psychology of the crowd and know how to speak to the crowd. In particular, he must be aware of the charm of well-known words, formulas, and images. He must have a very special eloquence, which consists mainly of energetic, though completely unsubstantiated, statements and vivid images framed by very superficial reasoning. This kind of eloquence is found in all assemblies, even in the English Parliament, in spite of all its poise. We have constantly to read of debates in the House of Commons, writes the English philosopher Maine, consisting almost exclusively of the exchange of generalities of no particular importance, and of very sharp expressions. But this kind of general formulae has a striking effect on the imagination of pure democracy. It is always easy to make a crowd accept arguments of a general nature if they are presented to it in expressions that work on its imagination, even though these arguments have not been subjected to any prior verification and are hardly even available to it. The significance of such strong expressions, to which the above quotation points, is by no means exaggerated. We have already pointed out several times the special power of words and formulas. One must choose words that can evoke very vivid images. The following phrase, which we borrowed from a speech of one of the leaders of our meetings, is an excellent example of such eloquence. On the day when the same ship carries the corrupt politician and the anarchist murderer to the fever shores of exile, they may enter into conversation with each other and appear to each other as two additional sides of the same social order of things. The image evoked by this speech is clear enough, and of course the speaker's opponents must have sensed what he was threatening them with. They should have seen both the fever shores and the ship carrying them away, for, after all, they too could be counted among the rather poorly delineated category of politicians to whom the speaker was alluding. In doing so, of course, they must have felt the same vague sense of dread as the members of the convention felt when they listened to vague speeches by Robespierre that more or less threatened them with the knife of the guillotine. It was under the influence of this sense of fear that the members of the convention always yielded to Robespierre. It was in the chief's interest to allow themselves the most incredible exaggerations. The speaker I have just quoted could assert, without much protest, that bankers and priests kept bomb throwers on their payroll, and that the administrators of large financial companies deserve the same punishment as the anarchists. Such claims always have an effect on a crowd, and even more so the more vehement and the more threatening they are. Nothing intimidates listeners like this kind of eloquence, they do not protest for fear of being seen as traitors or accomplices. This special kind of eloquence can be observed in all assemblies, and it has always been intensified at critical moments. From this point of view, reading the speeches of the great orators of the revolution is of no small interest. These orators felt obliged to interrupt their speeches constantly to denounce crime and praise virtue, and to utter curses against tyrants and immediately to swear that they would live free or die. The audience rose, applauded the speakers and then, satisfied, sat back down again. The leader may be an intelligent and educated man at times, but in general these qualities are more detrimental to him than beneficial. Intelligence makes a man more indulgent, revealing to him the complexity of things and enabling him to find out and understand for himself, and it also considerably weakens the tension and strength of conviction necessary to be a preacher and an apostle. 
The great leaders of all times, and especially the leaders of the revolutions, were extremely limited, and even the most limited of them predominantly enjoyed the greatest influence. The speeches of the most famous of them, Robespierre, are often striking in their incongruity. Reading these speeches, we are unable to explain to ourselves the enormous role of the mighty dictator. The commonplaces, the verbosity of didactic eloquence, and the Latin culture, placed at the service of a child's soul rather than that of a vulgar man, verging both in defense and in offense on the manner of schoolboys shouting, Potica here. No idea, no witty thought or antics, but constant boredom amidst the storm. And ending this reading makes you involuntarily want to exclaim, Ugh! As the polite Camille Demolin used to do. It is frightening even to think sometimes of the power which some very firm conviction gives to a man of extreme narrowness of mind, but possessing charm. But in order to ignore all obstacles and to be able to want, it is necessary to combine all these conditions within oneself. The crowd instinctively recognizes in such energetic persuaders the lords they constantly need. In a parliamentary assembly, the success of a speech depends almost exclusively on the degree of the speaker's charm, not on the arguments he presents. And this is confirmed by the fact that if the speaker loses his charm for any reason, he loses his influence at the same time, i.e. he no longer has the power to control the vote at will. As for the unknown orator who makes a speech, even if it is very provable, but which contains nothing but this thorough evidence, the best he can hope for is to be listened to. The deputy and shrewd psychologist de Cuba characterized the image of a deputy lacking in charm in this way. Having claimed a place on the rostrum, the deputy takes out his papers, methodically unfolds them, and proceeds to his speech with confidence. He caresses himself with the thought that he will succeed in instilling his own convictions into the soul of his listeners. He has carefully weighed his arguments and, stocked with a mass of figures and evidence, is confident of success in advance, for, in his opinion, all resistance must disappear before the obviousness. He begins his speech convinced that he is right, counting on the attention of his colleagues, who, of course, want nothing more than to bow to the truth. He speaks, somewhat annoyed by the commencement of noise, and is immediately struck by the movement that arises in the room. What does it mean if silence does not prevail? Why is there such general inattention? What are these people thinking, talking to one another? What compelling reason was there for that deputy to leave his seat? The speaker begins to feel uneasy, wrinkles his eyebrows, and stops. Encouraged by the president, he begins again, raising his voice. He is listened to even less. He strains his voice even more, worries, the noise intensifies. He stops hearing himself, pauses once more, then, frightened that his silence will cause an unpleasant cry of close the debate, he begins to speak again. The noise becomes unbearable. When parliamentary assemblies reach a certain degree of excitement, they become like an ordinary motley crowd, and their feelings are always extreme. They can display the greatest heroism and at the same time commit the worst violence. The individual in such an assemblage ceases to be himself to such an extent that he will become a thief in activities that are directly detrimental to his personal interests. The history of the revolution shows to what extent assemblies can become unconscious and obey compulsions most contrary to their interests. The great sacrifice to the nobility was the renunciation of its privileges, meanwhile, it did not hesitate to make this sacrifice on the famous night of the Constituent Assembly. The renunciation of their personal inviolability created for the members of the convention a constant threat of death. Meanwhile they resolved to do this and were not afraid to mutually exterminate one another, knowing full well, however, that tomorrow they themselves might go to the same scaffold to which they sent their colleagues today. But they had already reached the point of complete automatism, the mechanism of which I have described earlier, and therefore no considerations could prevent them from obeying the suggestions that hypnotized them. The following phrase, from the memoirs of a member of the convention, Bilio Varenis, is very typical in this respect, all too often we ourselves were not willing, two days or one day earlier, to take the decisions which are now being reproached, he says, but it was the crisis which produced those decisions. 
nothing could be fairer. This manifestation of unconsciousness can be seen in all the tumultuous sessions of the convention. They approve and prescribe, says Taine, what they themselves abhor, not only folly and folly, but also crime, the murder of innocents, the murder of their own friends. Unanimously, and with thunderous applause, the left, united with the right, sends Danton, its natural head, the great organizer and leader of the revolution, to the scaffold. Unanimously, and also to the noise of applause, the right, united with the left, steals the worst decrees of the revolutionary government. Unanimously, and with enthusiastic cries of enthusiasm and declarations of fervent sympathy for Collet d'Herbois, Couton, Robespierre, the convent, by means of arbitrary and multiple elections, holds in place a human killing government that is hated by some for its killings and by others for its desire to exterminate them. The Plains and the Mount, majority and minority, ended up agreeing together to promote their own suicide. On the 22nd of the Prairie, the convent in its entirety put its neck on the line, and on the 8th Thermidor, immediately after Robespierre's speech, it put it on the line again. This picture may perhaps seem too gloomy, but it is nevertheless true. Parliamentary assemblies, sufficiently agitated and hypnotized, show exactly the same features, they become like a fickle herd, obeying all impulses. The following description of the Assembly of 1848, made by Spooler, a parliamentarian whose democratic convictions are undoubted, is borrowed by me from the Revue Literaire as very typical. It depicts all the exaggerated feelings peculiar to the crowd, and the excessive volatility which allows the crowd in a few moments to go through the whole scale of the most contradictory feelings. Discord, suspicion, envy, and alternately blind trust and boundless hope brought the Republican Party to its downfall. Its naivety and simple-heartedness equaled only its general suspicion. No sense of legality, no concept of discipline, only fears and illusions that know no boundaries in this respect the peasant and the child have much in common. Their serenity is rivaled only by their impatience, and their fierceness is equal to their meekness. This is a property of not yet fully educated temperament and the result of lack of education. Nothing surprises them, but everything confuses them. Trembling, fearful and at the same time fearless and heroic, they throw themselves into the fire and retreat before the shadow. They are unaware of the implications and relationships of things. As quick to despond as to excitement, prone to panic, they always grasp either too high or too low and never stick to the proper measure and degree. More fluid than water, they reflect in themselves all colors and take all forms. What basis for government could they form? Fortunately, special conditions are necessary for all these features to become a permanent phenomenon in parliamentary assemblies. These assemblies become a crowd only at certain moments. In the great majority of cases, the people who compose them retain their individuality, and that is why assemblies can make excellent technical laws. It is true that these laws have previously been made by some specialist in the silence of an office, so they are essentially the work of a single individual rather than of an entire assembly. And such laws, of course, are always the best and only deteriorate when a series of unfortunate amendments turn them into a collective affair. Crowd activity is always and everywhere inferior to that of the isolated individual. Only specialists save assemblies from making too disorderly and impractical decisions, and in such cases the specialist is always the temporary ringleader. The assembly does not act on him, but he acts on it. Notwithstanding the difficulties inherent in their activity, parliamentary assemblies are the best that nations have hitherto been able to find for self government and, more importantly, to insulate themselves as far as possible from the yoke of personal tyranny. Certainly, Parliament is the ideal of government, at least for philosophers, thinkers, writers, artists, and scientists in short, for those who form the pinnacle of civilization. In essence, however, parliamentary assemblies pose a serious danger in only two ways, with respect to the violent waste of finances and with respect to the progressive restriction of individual freedom. The first danger is the inevitable consequence of the demands and imprudence of the electoral crowd. 
let a member of the assembly propose a measure which satisfies supposedly democratic ideas, example, providing pensions for workers, increasing the salaries of railway guards, teachers, etc., other members, feeling fear of the electorate, will not dare reject the proposed measures, for they are afraid to show contempt for the interests of the aforementioned persons, although they are aware that these measures must have a heavy impact on the budget and require new taxes. Fluctuations, therefore, are not possible. The consequences of the increase are remote and do not directly concern the members of the assemblies, but the consequences of a negative vote may be felt on the day on which one must go before the electorate. In addition to this first reason for an increase in expenses, there is another, no less imperative reason, the obligation to agree to all expenses which are of purely local interest. A deputy cannot oppose it because the expenses are again the expression of the elector's demands and, moreover, he can only expect to meet the demands of his constituency if he yields to the same demands of his colleagues. In the April 6, 1895 issue of The Economist there is a curious review of the costs of purely electoral expenses for the construction of railroads in a single year. To connect Longai, a town of 3,000 inhabitants, situated on a mountain, with Pui, the construction of the railroad is quoted as costing 15 million, to connect Beaumont, 3,500 inhabitants, with Castel Saritsen, 7 million are quoted, to connect the village of UST, 523 inhabitants, with Senx, 1,200 inhabitants, 7 million, to connect Prad to Olette, 747 inhabitants, 6 million, and so on. For the year 1895 alone, 90 million were voted for the construction of railroads of no general interest. Other expenditures, also vouched for in the electoral interest, are no less considerable. The Workmen's Pensions Act will cost at least 165 million a year, according to the calculations of the Minister of Finance, according to the academician Leroy Bollier, 800 million. Clearly, the steady progression of such costs must inevitably lead to bankruptcy. Many of the European countries Portugal, Greece, Spain, Turkey have already done so, others, Italy, for instance, will soon find themselves in this position. But there is nothing to be alarmed about, for the public has accepted, without very strong protests, a reduction of four-fifths of the coupon payments of those states. Such witty bankruptcies allow for an immediate halt to the disturbed balance of budgets. Wars, socialism, and economic struggles prepare us for more disasters, and in the era of general decay in which we have entered, we must submit to the need to live from day to day and not care about a future that eludes us. The second of these dangers presented by parliamentary assemblies, the forced restriction of individual freedom, although not so conspicuous, is nevertheless very real. It is the result of the innumerable and always restrictive laws vocalized by parliaments, which consider themselves obliged to do so and overlook the consequences because of their unilateralism. Obviously, this danger is indeed inescapable, if even England, representing, of course, the most perfect type of parliamentary regime, one in which the representative is more independent of his electorate than anywhere else, could not get rid of this danger. Herbert Spencer, in an earlier work, pointed out that an increase in apparent freedom must be accompanied by a decrease in true freedom. Returning to this in his new book, The Individual and the State, Spencer expresses himself as follows about the English Parliament. From this time the legislation has followed the path I have indicated. Dictatorial measures, rapidly increasing, have constantly endeavored to limit individual liberty, and in two ways. Many decrees have been issued annually, imposing restrictions on citizens where their actions were previously perfectly free, and compelling them to perform such acts which they may or may not have previously performed at will. At the same time, public burdens, more and more heavy, especially those of a local character, have further restricted the liberty of citizens, reducing that part of their profits which they can spend as they please, and increasing that part which is taken from them for the needs of public figures. This progressive restriction of liberty is expressed in all countries in the following particular form, to which, however, Herbert Spencer does not point. The introduction of a series of innumerable measures, 
ordinarily of a restrictive character, necessarily increases the number of officials obliged to enforce them, and increases their power and influence, these officials, therefore, progressively seek to become the real masters of civilized countries. Their power is all the more great because the constant changes of government do not affect their position at all since the administrative caste is the only one that escapes these changes and possesses irresponsibility, impersonality, and continuity. Of all kinds of despotism, however, it is the one presented in this threefold form that is the most severe. The constant invention of such restrictive laws and regulations, which surround with the most Byzantine formalities all the smallest acts of life, fatalistically leads to the narrowing more and more of the sphere in which citizens can move freely. Victims of the illusion which makes them think that by multiplying the laws they will better secure equality and freedom, the nations daily impose upon themselves the heaviest fetters. But it does not pass for them in vain. Accustomed to endure every yoke, nations seek it out themselves and reach the point of losing all independence and energy. They then become empty shadows, passive automatons, without will, without resistance, and without power. This is when man is forced to look for the springs he lacks on the side. Because of the increasing indifference and powerlessness of citizens, the role of governments must necessarily increase even more. Governments must of necessity possess a spirit of initiative, enterprise, and leadership, for all this is lacking in private individuals, they must undertake everything, direct everything, patronize everything. The state eventually becomes an all-powerful providence. Experience teaches us, however, that the power of such gods is never too strong or too firm. This progressive restriction of all liberty in some peoples notwithstanding the outward liberties which produce only the illusion of freedom seems to result not only from some regime, but also from the old age of those peoples, it represents one of the symptoms preceding the phase of decline, which no civilization has so far been able to avoid. Judging from the precepts of the past and the symptoms appearing on all sides, most of our modern civilizations have already reached this phase of extreme old age, which precedes decline. Such phases seem to be of equal fatal importance to all peoples, for they recur frequently in history. All these phases of the general evolution of civilization are not difficult to state briefly, and we shall end our work with such a statement. Perhaps this cursory review will throw some light on the causes of the present power of the multitude. If we trace in general terms the genesis of the greatness and decline of the civilizations that preceded our civilization, what shall we first see? At the dawn of these civilizations we see a handful of people of diverse origins, brought together by the accidents of migration, invasion, and conquest. The common bond between all these people, who differed from one another in language and religion, with different blood in their veins, was the semi-recognized authority of one leader. In such mixed crowds of people the psychological traits of crowds are highly developed, temporary cohesion of particles, heroism, weaknesses, impulsiveness, and violent feelings. There is nothing lasting in such a crowd, they are barbarians. Then time does its work. The sameness of the environment, the repetition of interbreeding, the needs of common life slowly take effect, and a cluster of heterogeneous units begins to merge and form a race, that is, an aggregate possessing common traits and feelings, which are more and more fixed by heredity. The crowd becomes a people, and this people can already emerge from the state of barbarism. However, it will emerge from it only when, after much effort, constant struggle, and countless endeavors, it acquires an ideal. The nature of this ideal is of little importance, it may be the cult of Rome, of Athens, or the worship of Allah, whatever, but this ideal will be sufficient to create unity of feeling and thought in all the individuals of a race on its educational path. Then a new civilization with all its institutions, beliefs, and arts can be born. Driven by its dream, the race will successively acquire all that gives splendor, power, and majesty. It will undoubtedly be a crowd at certain hours, but then, behind the changeable and shifting features peculiar to any crowd, there will always be a solid substratum the soul of the race, which narrowly limits the fluctuations of the people and controls the occasion. 
Having accomplished its creative work, time inevitably moves on to the work of destruction, which neither gods nor men escape. Having attained a certain degree of power and complexity, civilization ceases to grow and is condemned to decline. Soon the hour of old age must strike for it. Its arrival is inevitably marked by a weakening of the ideal that sustains the soul of the race. As the ideal pales, the buildings of the political, social, and religious institutions that rest on that ideal begin to sway. As the ideal progressively disappears, the race loses more and more of what constituted its strength, unity, and coherence. The personality and mind of the individual may, however, develop, but at the same time the collective selfishness of the race is replaced by an overdevelopment of individual selfishness, accompanied by a weakening of strength of character and a diminution of capacity for action. What formerly constituted a people, a known unit, a common mass, turns into a mere agglomeration of individuals without any coherence, only temporarily and artificially held together by traditions and institutions. This is when people, disconnected by their personal interests and aspirations and unable to govern themselves, demand that their smallest actions be directed, and the state begins to exert its consuming influence. With the final loss of the ideal, the race finally loses its soul, it turns into a handful of isolated individuals and becomes what it was at the beginning, a crowd. Then, once again, all the characteristic mutable traits of a crowd appear in it, with no endurance or future. Civilization loses its strength and finds itself at the mercy of all contingencies. The mob reigns and the barbarians emerge. Civilization may still seem shiny, because the outer facade of its building, created by the long past, is still intact, but in reality, the building is already undermined, nothing supports it, and it collapses with the first thunderstorm. The transition from barbarism to civilization in pursuit of the dream, then the gradual weakening and death as soon as the dream is lost that is the life cycle of every people.